Section 16 of The Plain Speaker Opinions on Books, Men, and Things by William Hazlitt. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Plain Speaker Opinions on Books, Men, and Things by William Hazlitt. Section 16 On Dr. Spurzheim's Theory, Part 1. It appears to me that the truth of physiognomy, if we allow it, overturns the science of craniology. For instance, the system of doctors Gall and Spurzheim supposes that every bump or protuberance on the skull is necessarily produced by an extraordinary protrusion of the brain or increase of the organ of perception immediately underneath it. Now behind a great part of the face we have no brain, and can have no such organs existing and accounting for the external phenomena. And yet here are projections or ramifications of bones, muscles, etc., which are allowed by these reasoners and most other persons to indicate character and intellect just as surely as the new discovered organs of craniology if then these projections or modifications of the countenance have such force and meaning where there is no brain underneath to account for them is it not clear that in other cases the theory which assumes that such projections can only be caused by an extraordinary pressure of the brain and of the appropriate local organ within is in itself an obvious fallacy and contradiction the long prudent chin the scornful nose naso adunco, the good-natured mouth are proverbial in physiognomy but are totally excluded from the organic system i mentioned this objection once to dr spurzheim personally but he only replied we have treated of physiognomy in our larger work i was not satisfied with this answer i am utterly ignorant of the anatomical and physiological part of this question and only propose to point out a few errors or defects in his system which appear on the author's own showing in the manner of marginal notes on the work i would observe by the by that the style and manner of the writer are not such as to induce the reader to place a very implicit reliance on his authority and in a subject which is so much an occult science a terra incognita in the world of observation depending on the traveller's report authority is a good deal the craniologist may make fools of his disciples at pleasure unless he is an honest man they have no check upon him the face is as a book where men may read strange matters it is open to every one the language of expression is as it were a kind of mother tongue in which every one acquires more or less tact so that his own practical judgment forms a test to confirm or contradict the interpretation which is given of it but the skull on which doctors gall and spurzheim have laid their hands for the discovery of so many important and undeniable truths nobody else knows anything about except as they are pleased to tell us it is concealed from ordinary observation by a covering of hair and we must go by hearsay we may indeed examine one or two individual instances and grope out our way to truth in the dark but there can be no habitual conclusion formed no broad light of experience thrown upon the subject the unbeliever in the fashionable system may well exclaim oh let me perish in the face of day the only opportunity for fairly studying this question was at the period when people wore artificial hair for then any well-disposed person had only to pull off his wig and show you his mind Footnote. There is a fellow in Hogarth's election dinner, holding his wig in one hand and wiping his bare scalp with the other. What a peep for a craniologist! Let him look well to it, and see that his system is borne out by the gesture, character, and actions of the portrait. A celebrated Scotch barrister being introduced to Dr. Spurzheim without his wig, said, It is dangerous to appear before you, doctor, at this disadvantage. To which the doctor replied, Oh, you have nothing to fear. Your head, at least, interrupted the other you will not find the organ of credulity there End of footnote. but the hair is a sort of natural mask to the head the craniologist indeed draws the curtain and shows the picture but if there is the least want of good faith in him the science is all abroad again unfortunately for the credit due to his system dr spurzheim or his predecessor dr gall who got up the facts has very much the air of a german quack doctor he is so to speak it the baron munchausen of marvellous metaphysics his object is to astonish the reader into belief as jugglers make clowns gape and swallow whatever they please he fabricates wonders with easy assurance and deals in men whose heads do grow beneath their shoulders and the anthropophagi that each other eat he readily admits whatever suits his purpose and magisterially doubts whatever makes against it he has a cant of credulity mixed up with the cant of skepticism things not easily reconciled except by a very deliberate effort indeed there is something gross and fulsome in all this that has tended to bring discredit on a system which after all has probably some foundation in nature 
but which is here overloaded with exaggerated and dogmatical assertions warranted for facts we doubt the whole when we know a part to be false and withhold our assent from a creed the great apostle of which wants modesty candor and self-knowledge another thing to be considered and in truth the great stumbling block in the way of nearly the whole of this system is this that the principle of thought and feeling in man is one whereas the present doctrine supposes it to be many the mind is one or it is infinite if there is not some single superintending faculty or conscious power to which all subordinate organic impressions are referred as to a centre and which decides and reacts upon them all then there is no end of particular organs and there must be not only an organ for poetry but an organ for poetry of every sort and size and so of all the rest this will be seen more at large when we come to details but at present i wish to lay it down as a cornerstone or fundamental principle in the argument of the way in which dr spurzheim clears the ground before him and disarms the incredulity of the reader by a string of undeniable or equivocal propositions blended together the following may serve as a specimen the doctrine that everything is provided with its own properties was from time to time checked by metaphysicians and scholastic divines but by degrees it gained ground and the maxim that matter is inert was entirely refuted natural philosophers discovered corporeal properties the laws of attraction and repulsion of chemical affinity of fermentation and even of organization they considered the phenomena of vegetables as the production of material qualities as properties of matter glisson attributed to matter a particular activity and to the animal fibre a specific irritability de Gorte acknowledged in vegetable life something more than pure mechanism winter and zups proved that the phenomena of vegetable life ought to be ascribed only to irritability of this several phenomena of flowers and leaves indicate a great degree the hop and french bean twine round rods which are planted near them the tendrils of vines curl round poles or the branches of neighbouring trees the ivy climbs the oak and adheres to its sides etc now it would be absurd to pretend that the organization of animals is entirely destitute of properties therefore frederick hoffman took it for the basis of his system that the human body like all other bodies is endowed with material properties here be truths but dashed and brewed with lies are doubtful points yet they pass altogether without discrimination or selection there is a simplicity in many of the propositions amounting to a sort of bonhomie there is an overmeasure of candour and plainness a man who gravely informs you as an important philosophical discovery that the tendrils of vines curl round poles and that the human body is endowed with material properties may escape without the imputation of intending to delude the unwary but these kind of innocent pretenses are like shoeing horns to draw on the hardest consequences by the serious offer of this meat for babes you are prepared to swallow a horse drench of parboiled paradoxes you are thrown off your guard into a state of good-natured surprise by the utter want of all meaning and our craniologist catches his wandering disciples in a trap of truisms instances might be multiplied from this part of the work where the writer is occupied in getting up the plot and lulling asleep any suspicion or feeling of petulance in the mind of the public just after he says in former times there were philosophers who thought that the soul forms its own body but if this be the case an ill-formed body never could be endowed with a good soul all the natural influence of generation nutrition climate education etc would therefore be inexplicable hence it is much more reasonable to think that the soul in this life is only confined in the body and makes use of its respective instruments which entirely depend on the laws of the organization in blindness the soul is not mutilated but it cannot perceive light without eyes etc with other matters of like pith and moment the author's style is interlarded with too many henses and therefores neither do his inferences hang well together they are ill-cemented he announces instead of demonstrating and jumps at a conclusion in a heavy awkward way he constantly assumes the point in dispute or makes a difficulty on one side of a question a decisive proof of the opposite view of it what credit can be attached to him in matters of fact or theory where he must have it almost all his own way when he presumes so much on the cullability of his readers in common argument if these things are done in the green tree what shall be done in the dry once more no one will endeavour to prove that the five senses are the production of our will their laws are determined by nature therefore as soon as an animal meets with the food destined for it its smell and taste declare in favour of it thus it is not astonishing that a kid taken from the uterus of its mother preferred broom-tops to other vegetables which were presented to it 
and Richrond is wrong in saying, If such a fact have any reality, we should be forced to admit that an animal may possess a foreknowledge of what is proper for it, and that independently of any impressions which may be afterwards received by the senses, it is capable, from the moment of birth, of choosing, that is, of comparing and judging of what is presented to it. The hog likewise eats the acorn the first time he finds it. Animals, however, have on that account no need of any previous exercise, of any innate idea, of any comparison or reflection. The relations between the external world and the five senses are determined by creation. We cannot see as red that which is yellow, nor as great that which is little. How should animals have any idea of what they have not felt? This is what might be termed the inclusive style in argument. It is impossible to distinguish the premises from the conclusion. We have facts for arguments and arguments for facts. He plays off a phantasmagoria of illustrations as proofs, like Sir Epicure Mammon in The Alchemist. It is like being in a roundabout at a fair, or skating, or flying. It is not easy to make out even the terms of the question, so completely are they overlaid and involved one in the other, and that, as it should seem, purposely, or from a habit of confounding the plainest things. To proceed, however, to something more material. In treating of innate faculties, Dr. Spurgeheim runs the following career, which will throw considerable light on the vagueness and contradictoriness of his general mode of reasoning. Now it is beyond doubt that all the instinctive aptitudes and inclinations of animals are innate. Is it not evident that the faculties by which the spider makes its web, the honeybee its cell, the beaver its hut, the bird its nest, etc., are inherent in the nature of these animals? When the young duck or tortoise runs towards the water as soon as hatched, when the bird brushes the worm with its bill, when the monkey, before he eats the maybug, bites off its head, etc., all these and similar dispositions are conducive to the preservation of the animals, but they are not at all acquired. If by acquired he meant that these last acts do not arise out of certain impressions made on the senses by different objects, such as the agreeable or disagreeable smell of food, etc., this is by no means either clear or acknowledged on all hands. According to the same law, he adds, what law? The hamster gathers corn and grain, the dog hides his superfluous food. This, at any rate, seems a rational act. The falcon kills the hare by driving his beak into its neck, etc. In the same way, all instinctive manifestations of men must be innate. The newborn child sucks their fingers and seeks the breast, as the puppy and cough seek the dog. The circumstance here indiscreetly mentioned of the child sucking the fingers as well as the nipple certainly does away the idea of final causes. It shows that the child, from a particular state of irritation of its mouth, fastens on any object calculated to allay that irritation, whether conducive to its sustenance or not. It is difficult sometimes to get children to take the breast. Dr. Spurgeheim takes up a common prejudice, without any qualification or inquiry, while it suits his purpose, and lays it down without ceremony when it no longer serves the turn. He proceeds. I have mentioned above that voluntary motion and the five external senses, common to man and animals, are innate. Moreover, if man and animals feel certain propensities and sentiments with clear and distinct consciousness, we must consider these faculties as innate. The clear and distinct consciousness has nothing to do with the matter. Thus, if in animals we find examples of mutual inclination between the sexes, of maternal care for the young, of attachments, of mutual assistance, of sociableness, of union for life, of peaceableness, of desire to fight, of propensity to destroy, of circumspection, of slyness, of love of flattery, of obstinacy, etc., all these faculties must be considered as innate. A finer assumption of the question than this, or a more complete jumble of instincts and acquired propensities together, never was made. The author has here got hold of a figure called encroachment, and advances accordingly. Let all these faculties be ennobled in man. Let animal instinct of propagation be changed into moral love, the inclination of animals for their young into the virtue of maternal care for children, animal attachment into friendship, animal susceptibility of flattery into love of glory and ambition, the nightingale's melody into harmony, the bird's nest and the beaver's hut into palaces and temples, etc. These faculties are still of the same nature, and all these phenomena are produced by faculties common to man and animals. They are only ennobled in man by the influence of superior qualities, which give another direction to the inferior ones. This last passage appears to destroy his whole argument, for the doctor contends that every particular propensity or modification of the mind must be innate, 
and have its separate organ but if there are faculties common to man and animals which are ennobled or debased by their connection with other faculties then we must admit a general principle of thought and action varying according to circumstances and the organic system becomes nearly an impertinence the following short section entitled innateness of the human faculties will serve to place in a tolerably striking point of view the turn of this writer to an unmeaning quackish sort of commonplace reasoning finally man is endowed with faculties which are peculiar to him now it is to be investigated whether the faculties which distinguish man from animals and which constitute his human character are innate it must be answered that all the faculties of man are given by creation and that human nature is as determinate as that of every other being thus though we see that man compares his sensations and ideas inquires into the causes of phenomena draws consequences and discovers laws and general principles that he measures distances and times and crosses the sea from one end to another that he acknowledges culpability and worthiness that he bears a monitor in his own breast and raises his mind to the idea and adoration of god yet all these faculties result neither from accidental influence from without nor from his own will how indeed could the creator abandon man in the greatest and most important occupations and give him up to chance no no indeed but there is a difference between chance and a number of bumps on the head one would think that all this being common to the same being proceeded from a general faculty manifesting itself in different ways and not from a parcel of petty faculties huddled together nobody knows how and acting without concert or coherence does man cross the seas measure the heavens construct telescopes etc from a general capacity of invention in the mind or does the navigator lie perdu shut up like a jack-in-the-box in one corner of the brain the mechanic in another the astronomer in another and so forth that is the simple question dr spurzheim adds shortly after we everywhere find the same species whether a man stain his skin or powder his hair whether he dance to the sound of a drum or to the music of a concert whether he adore the stars the sun the moon or the god of christians the special faculties are everywhere the same he ought to have said the general faculties are the same not the special but if there is not a specific faculty and organ for every act of the mind and object in nature then dr spurzheim must admit the existence of a general faculty modified by circumstances and we must be slow in accounting for different phenomena from particular independent organs without the most obvious proofs or urgent necessity his organs are too few or too many malbranche says our author deduces the different manner of thinking and feeling in men and women from the different delicacy of the cerebral fibres according to our doctrine certain parts of the brain are more developed in men others in women and in that way is the difference of the manifestations of their faculties perfectly explicable for my part i prefer malbranche's solution to the more modern one it seems to me that the strength or weakness the pliancy or firmness of the characters of men or women is to be accounted for from something in the general texture of their minds just as their corporeal strength or weakness activity or grace is to be accounted for from something in the general texture of their bodies and not from the arbitrary preponderance of this or that particular limb or muscle i think the analogy is conclusive against our author if there is no difference of quality i e of delicacy firmness etc in the parts of the brain more developed in men the difference of quantity alone cannot account for the difference of character and on the other hand if we allow such a difference of quality in the cerebral fibres or of hardness and softness flexibility or sluggishness in the whole brain we shall have no occasion for particular bumps or organs of the brain to account for the difference in the minds of men and women generally doctors gall and spurzheim seem desirous to set aside all differences of texture irritability tenacity etc in the composition of the brain as if these were occult qualities and to reduce everything to positive and ostensible quantity not considering that quantity alone accounts for no difference of character or operation the increasing the size of the organ of music for instance will not qualify that organ to perform the functions of the organ of color there must be a natural aptitude in kind before we talk about the degree or excess of the faculty resulting from the peculiar conformation of a given part the piling up larger parcels of the same materials of the brain will not produce a new faculty we must include the nature of the different materials and it is not too much to assume that whenever the faculty is available to a number of purposes the difference in the nature of the thinking substance cannot be merely local or organic for instance say that the organ of memory is distinguished by greater tenaciousness of particles 
or by something correspondent to this, that in like manner the organ of fancy is distinguished by greater irritability of structure, is it not better to suppose that the first character pervades the brain of a man remarkable for strong memory, and the last that of another person excelling in fancy, generally and primarily, instead of supposing that the whole retentiveness of the brain is in the first instance lodged in one particular compartment of it, and the whole volatility or liveliness, in the second instance, imprisoned in another hole, or corner, with quite as little reason? It may be said that the organ in question is not an organ of memory in general, but of the memory of some particular thing. Then this will require that there should be an organ of memory of every other particular thing, an organ of invention, and an organ of judgment of the same, which is too much to believe, and besides can be of no use. For unless in addition to these separate organs, over which is written, no connection with the next door, we have some general organ or faculty, receiving information, comparing ideas, and arranging our volitions, there can be no one homogeneous act or exercise of the understanding, no one art attained, or study engaged in. There will either be a number of detached objects and sensations without a mind to superintend them, or else a number of minds for every distinct object, without any common link of intelligence among themselves. In the first case, each organ would be that of a mere brute instinct, that could never arrive at the dignity of any one art or science, as painting or music. In the second case, no art or science, such as poetry, ever could exist that implied a comparison between any two ideas, or the impressions of different organs, as of sight and sound. Dr. Spurgeheim observes, The child advances to boyhood, adolescence, and manhood. Then all these faculties manifest the greatest energy. By degrees they begin to decrease, and in the decrepitude of old age, the sensations are blunted, the sentiments weak, and the intellectual faculties almost or entirely suppressed. Hence, as the manifestations of the faculties of the mind and understanding are proportionate to the organization, it is evident that they depend on it. I do not see the exact inference meant to be drawn here. All the conditions above enumerated affect the whole brain generally. There is not an organ of youth, of manhood, of decrepitude, etc. A brain too small, however, is always accompanied with imbecility. Willis described the brain of one who was an idiot from birth. It was not more than half the size of an ordinary brain. At this rate, if there are idiots by birth, there must be also such a thing as general capacity. I have seen two twin boys so like each other that it was almost impossible to distinguish them. Their inclinations and talents presented also a striking and astonishing similitude. Two others, twin sisters, are very different. In the one, the muscular system is the most developed, in the other, the nervous. The former is of little understanding, whereas the second is endowed with strong intellectual faculties. This is coming to Malbranche's way of putting the question. In the same page we find the following morceau. Gobius relates that a girl whose father had killed men in order to eat them, and who was separated from her father in her infancy and carefully educated, committed the same crime. Gobius drew from this fact the consequence that the faculties are propagated with the organization. Good Gobius Gobbo! Without believing his fact, we need not dispute his consequence. Malbranche explains the difference of the faculties of both sexes, the various kinds and particular tastes of different nations and individuals, by the firmness and softness, dryness and moisture of the cerebral fibers, and he remarks that our time cannot be better employed than investigating the material causes of human phenomena. The Cartesians, by their doctrine of the tracks which they admit in the brain, acknowledge the influence of the brain on the intellectual faculties. Dr. Spurgeheim altogether explodes the doctrine of a difference in constitutional temperaments, the sanguine, the phlegmatic, and so on, because this difference, being general, is not consistent with his special organs. He also denies unequivocally the doctrine of the association of ideas, which Descartes' tracks in the brain were meant to explain. One would think this alone decisive against his book. Indeed, the capacity of association, possessed in a greater or less degree, seems to be the great discriminating feature between man and man. But what organ of association there can be between different local organs it is difficult to conjecture. And Dr. Spurgeheim was right in boldly denying a truth which he could not reconcile with his mechanical and incongruous theory. There are persons who maintain that in the highest degree of magnetic influence the manifestations of the soul are independent of the organization. What? Have we animal magnetism in the dance too? Would our great physiologist awe us into belief by bringing into the field quackery greater than his own? Then it is time to be on our guard. We find sanguine and bilious individuals who are intellectual or stupid, meek or impetuous, 
we may observe phlegmatics of a bold, quarrelsome, and imperious character. In short, the doctrine of the temperaments, as applied to the indication of determinate faculties, is not more sure or better founded than divination by the hands, feet, skin, hair, ears, and similar physiognomical signs. That is, red-haired people, for instance, have not a certain general character. After that I will not believe a word the learned author says upon his bare authority. End of section 16section seventeen of the plain speaker opinions on books men and things by william hazlitt this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. the plain speaker opinions on books men and things by william hazlitt section seventeen on dr spurzheim's theory part two dr spurzheim with great formality devotes a number of sections to prove that the several senses alone without any other faculty or principle of thought and feeling, do not account for the moral and intellectual faculties. There needs no ghost to tell us that. In his mode of entering upon this part of his subject, the doctor seems to have been aware of the old maxim, divide et impera, distinguish and confound. We have still to examine whether sight produces any moral sentiment or intellectual faculty. It is a common opinion that the art of painting is the result of sight, and it is true that eyes are necessary to perceive colors, as the ears are to perceive sounds and tones. But the art of painting does not consist in the perception of colors any more than music in the perception of sounds. Sight, therefore, and the faculty of painting are not at all in proportion. The sight of many animals is more perfect than that of men, but they do not know what painting is. And in mankind the talent of painting cannot be measured by the acuteness of sight. Great painters never attribute their talent to their eyes. They say, it is not the eye, but the understanding which perceives the harmony of colors. This is well put and quite true. That is, it is the mind alone that perceives the relation and connection between all our senses. Thus the impression of the line bounding one side of the face does not perceive or compare itself with the impression of the line forming the other side of the face. But it is the mind or understanding, by means indeed of the eye, that perceives and compares the two impressions together. But neither will an organ of painting answer this purpose unless this separate organ includes a separate mind with a complete workshop and set of offices to execute all the departments of judgment taste invention etc i e to compare analyze and combine its own particular sensations but neither will this answer the end for either all of these must be included under one and exhibit themselves in the same proportions wherever the organ exists which is not the fact or if they are distinct and independent of one another then they cannot be expressed by any one organ Dr. Spurzheim has, in a subsequent part of his work, provided for this objection, and divided the organ of sight into five or six subdivisions, such as the organ of form, the organ of color, the organ of weight, the organ of space, and God knows how many more. This is evading and at the same time increasing the difficulty. Thus, the best draftsmen are not observed to be always the best colorists, Raphael and Titian, for example. There must therefore be a new division of the organ of sight into at least the two divisions of form and color. Now it is not to be supposed that these organs are thus separated merely for separation's sake, but that there is something in the quality or texture of the substance of the brain in each organ, peculiarly fitted for each different sort of impression, and by an excess of quantity producing an excess of faculty. The size alone of the organ cannot account for the difference of the faculty, without this other condition of quality annexed. Suppose the distinguishing quality of the organ of form to be a certain tenaciousness, that of the organ of color to be a certain liquid softness in the finer particles of the brain. Now a greater quantity of the medullary substance of a given texture and degree of softness will produce the organ of color, but then will not a greater degree of this peculiar softness or texture, whatever it is, with the same quantity of substance, produce an extraordinary degree of faculty equally? That is, we make the fineness or quality of the nerves, brain, mind, atone for the want of quantity, or get the faculty universally without the organ, QED. Dr. Spurzheim does not make an organ of melody and an organ of harmony. Yet he ought, if every distinct operation of the mind or senses requires a distinct local organ, and if his whole system is not merely arbitrary. Further, one part of painting is expression, namely the power of connecting certain feelings of pleasure and pain with certain lines and movements of face. That is, there ought to be an organ of expression or an organ, in the first place, of pleasure and pain, which Dr. Spurzheim denies, these being general and not specific manifestations of the mind. 
and in the second place an organ for associating the impressions of one organ with those of all the rest of which the doctor also denies the existence or even possibility his is quite a new constitution of the human mind finally every one feels that he thinks by means of the brain when it was urged before that every one thinks that he feels by means of the heart dr spurgeim scouted this sort of proof as vulgar and ridiculous it being then against himself tiedemann relates the example of one moser who was insane on one side of his head and who observed his madness with the other side gall attended a minister who had a similar disease for three years he heard constantly on his left reproaches and injuries he turned his head on this side and looked at the persons what persons with his right side he commonly judged the madness of his left side but sometimes in a fit of fever he could not rectify his peculiar state long after being cured if he happened to be angry or if he had drunk more than he was accustomed to do he observed in his left side a tendency to his former alienation this is an amusing book after all one might collect from it materials for a new edition of the wonderful magazine how familiarly the writer insinuates the most incredible stories and takes for granted the minutest circumstances this style though it may incline the credulous to gape and swallow everything must make the judicious grieve and the wary doubt it is however necessary to remark that all observations of this kind can only be made upon beings of the same species and it is useless to compare the same faculty with the respective organ in different species of animals the irritability is very different in different kinds of animals and why not in the same kind the state of disease proves also the plurality of the organs for how is it possible to combine partial insanities with the unity of the brain a chemist was a madman in everything but chemistry an embroiderer in her fits and in the midst of the greatest absurdities calculated perfectly how much stuff was necessary to such or such a piece of work does our author mean that there is an organ of chemistry and an organ for embroidery king ferdinand would be a good subject to ascertain this last observation upon if i could catch him i should be disposed to try i would not let him go like the cortes the external apparatus of the nerves of the five senses are said to be different because they receive different impressions but how is it possible that different impressions should be transmitted to the brain by the same nerves how can the impressions of light be propagated by the auditory nerve we only know that they are not but how we might ask can the different impressions of sight as red yellow blue be transmitted by the same nerve Platner made the following objection a musician plays with his fingers on all instruments why should not the soul manifest all its operations by means of one and the same organ this observation is rather for than against the plurality of the organs first there are ten fingers which play moreover the instruments present different chords or holes we admit only one organ for music and all kinds of music are produced by this organ hence this assertion of platner does not invalidate our theory but it does though unless you could show that a musician can play only as many tunes as he has fingers on the same kind of instrument dr spurzheim contends elsewhere that one organ can perform only one function and brings as a proof of the plurality of the organs the alternate action and rest of the body and mind but if the same organ cannot undergo a different state how can it rest there must then be an organ of action and an organ of rest an organ to do something and an organ to do nothing very fine and clear all this the following passages seem to bear closest upon the general question and i shall apply myself to answer them as well as i can the intellectual faculties have been placed in the brain but it was impossible to point out any organ because organs have been sought for faculties which have no organ namely for common and general faculties general or common phenomena never have any particular organ secretion for instance is a common name and secretion in general has no particular organ but the particular secretions as of saliva bile tears etc are attached to particular organs sensation is an expression which indicates the common function of the five external senses therefore this common faculty has no particular organ but every determinate sensation as of sight hearing smelling taste or feeling is attached to some particular organ in the first place then dr spurzheim himself assigns particular organs for common and general faculties such as self-love veneration hope covetousness language comparison causality wit imitation etc he also talks of the organs of abstraction individuality invention etc it would be hard to deny that these mean more than one thing 
and refer to more than to one class of sensations. In fact, the author all through his volume regularly confounds general principles with particular acts and mechanic exercises of the mind. Secondly, he either does not or will not apprehend the precise meaning of the terms common or general faculties as applied to the mind. Sensation is a common function of the five external senses, that is, it belongs severally to the exercise of the five external senses. But understanding is a common faculty of the mind, not because it belongs to any number of ideas in succession, but because it takes cognizance of a number of them together. Understanding is perceiving the relations between objects and impressions, which the senses and particular or individual organs can never do. It is this superintending or conscious faculty or principle which is aware both of the color, form, and sound of an object, which connects its present appearance with its past history, which arranges and combines the multifarious impressions of nature into one whole, which balances the various motives of action, and renders man what he is, a rational and moral agent. But for this faculty we find no regular place or station assigned amongst that heap of organic tumuli, which could produce nothing but mistakes and confusion. The seat of this faculty is one, or its impressions are communicated to the same intelligent mind, which contemplates and reacts upon them all with more or less wisdom and comprehensive power. Thus the poet is not a being made up of a string of organs, an eye, an ear, a heart, a tongue, but is one and the same intellectual essence, looking out from its own nature on all the different impressions it receives, and to a certain degree moulding them into itself. It is I who remember certain objects, who judge of them, who invent from them, who connect certain sounds that I hear, as of a thrush singing, with certain sights that I see, as the wood whence the notes issue. There is some bond, some conscious connection brought about between these impressions and acts of the mind. That is, there is a principle of joint and common understanding in the mind, quite different from the ignorance in which the ear is left of what passes before the eye, etc., and which overruling and primary faculty of the soul, blending with all our thoughts and feelings, Dr. Spurzheim does not once try to explain, but does all he can to overturn. Understanding, he continues, being an expression which designates a general faculty, has no particular organ, whatever a determinate species of understanding is attached to a particular organ. If so, how does it contrive to compare notes with the impressions of other particular organs? For example, how does the organ of wit combine with the organ of form or of individuality to give a grotesque description of a particular person, without some common and intermediate faculty to which these several impressions are consciously referred? Will anyone tell me that one of these detached and very particular organs perceives the stained color of an old cloak? How could it apprehend anything of the age of the cloak? That another has a glimpse of its antiquated form? that a third supplies a witty illusion or apt illustration of what it knows nothing about, and that this patchwork process is clubbed by a number of organic impressions that have no law of subordination, nor any common principle of reference between them, to make a lively caricature? Finally, it is the same with all common faculties of the understanding, of which philosophers and physiologists speak, namely with perception, memory, or recollection, judgment, and imagination. These expressions are common, and the respective faculties have no organs, but every peculiar perception, memory, judgment, and imagination, as of space, form, color, tune, and number, have their particular organs. If the common faculties of understanding were attached to particular organs, the person who possesses the organ of any common faculty ought to be endowed with all particular kinds of faculties. If there were an organ of perception, of memory, of judgment, or of imagination, any one who has the organ of perception, of memory, of judgment, or of imagination, ought to possess all kinds of perception, of memory, of judgment, or of imagination. Now this is against all experience. No more than a person possessed of the general organ of sight must be acquainted equally with all objects of sight, whether they have ever fallen in his way, or whether he has studied them or not. But it is according to all experience that some persons are distinguished more by memory, others more by judgment, others more by imagination, generally speaking. That is, upon whatever subject they exercise their attention, they show the same turn of mind or predominating faculty. Some people do everything from impulse. It is their character under all impressions and in all studies and pursuits. Is there then an organ of impulse? An organ of tune is intelligible, because it denotes a general faculty exercised upon a particular class of impressions, viz. sounds. But what is an organ of wit? It means nothing, for it denotes a faculty without any specific objects, and yet an organ means a faculty limited to specific objects. Wit is the faculty of combining suddenly and glancing over the whole range of art and nature, but an organ is shut up in a particular cell of sensation, and sees nothing beyond itself. One has a great memory of one kind, 
proceeds our author, and a very little memory of other things. Yes, partly from habit, but chiefly, I grant, from original character, not because certain things strike upon a certain part of the brain, but touch a certain quality or disposition of the mind. Thus some remember trifles, others things of importance, some retain forms, others feelings, some have a memory of words, others of things, some remember what regards their own interests, others what is interesting in itself, according to the bias and scope of their sensibility. All these results depend evidently not on a particular local impression, but on a variety of general causes combined in one common effect. Again, a poet possesses one kind of imagination in a high degree, but has he therefore every kind of imagination, as that of inventing machines, of composing music, etc.? Or it may be retorted, has he therefore every kind of poetical imagination? Does the same person write epigrams and epics, comedies and tragedies? Is there not light and serious poetry? Is not Mr. T. Moore just as likely to become Newton as to become Milton? Or as the wren the eagle? Yet Dr. Spurgeheim has but one organ for poetry. As he says, we allow but one organ for tune. But is there not tune in poetry? Has not the poet an ear as well as the musician? How then does the author reconcile these common or analogous qualities, and the complex impressions from all the senses implied in poetry, for instance, with his detached, circumscribed local organs? His system is merely nominal, and a very clumsy specimen of nomenclature into the bargain. Poetry relates to all sorts of impressions, from all sorts of objects, moral and physical. Music relates to one sort of impressions only, and so far there is an excuse for assigning it to a particular organ, but it also implies common and general faculties, such as retention, judgment, invention, etc., which essentially reside in the understanding or thinking principle at large. But suppose them to be cooped and cabined up in the particular organ, do they not exist in different degrees? And is this difference expressed merely by the size of the organ? It cannot be. The circumstance of size can only determine that such a one is a great musician, not what sort of a musician he is. Therefore, this characteristic difference is not expressed by quantity, and therefore none of the differences of themselves, or faculties of judgment, invention, refinement, etc., which form the great musician, can be expressed by quantity. And if none of these component parts of musical genius are so expressed, why then, it follows as the night the day, that there can be no organ of music. There may be an organ peculiarly adapted for retaining musical impressions, but this, without including the intellectual operations which is impossible, would only answer the purposes of a peculiarly fine and sensitive ear. Natural philosophers were wrong in looking for organs of common faculties. That's true. A speculative philosopher may be satisfied with vague and common expressions, which do not denote the particular and determinate qualities of the different beings. But these general or common considerations are not sufficient for a naturalist who endeavors to know the functions and faculties of every organic part in particular. Throughout all natural history, the expressions are the less significant the more general or common they are, and a distinct knowledge of any being requires a study of its particularities. Take away the human mind and its common functions, operations, and principles, and Dr. Spurgeheim's craniology gives a very satisfactory and categorical view of human nature. In material science, the common properties may be the least significant, but in the mind of man, the common principle, whatever it be, that feels, thinks, and acts, is the chief thing. I do not believe, then, in the doctor's organs, either generally or particularly. I have only his word for them, and reason and common sense are against them. There may be an exception now and then, but there is everywhere a total want of classification and analytic power. The author, instead of giving the rationale of any one thing, runs on with endless illustrations and assumptions of the same kind. The organs are sometimes general and sometimes particular, sometimes compound and sometimes simple. You know not what to make of them. They turn over like tumbler pigeons. I should be inclined to admit the organ of amativeness as a physical reinforcement of a mental passion, but hardly that of philoprogenitiveness. At least, it is badly explained here. I will give an instance or two. A male servant, Dr. Spurgeheim observes, seldom takes care of children so well as a woman. Women, then, are fond of children generally, not of their own merely. Is not this an extension of the organic principle beyond its natural and positive limits? Again, little girls are fond of dolls, etc. Is there, then, an express organ for this, since dolls are not literally children? Oh, no, it is only a modification of the organ of philoprogenitiveness. Well, then, why should not this organ itself or particular propensity be a modification of philanthropy, or of an amiable disposition, good nature, and generosity in general? 
there seems no assignable reason why most, if not all of these special organs, should be considered as anything more than so many manifestations or cases of general dispositions, capacities, etc., arising from general irritability, tenderness, firmness, quickness, comprehension, etc., of the mind or brain, just as the particular varieties and obliquities of organic faculties and affections are attributed by Spurgeim and Gall to a common law or principle combined with others, or with peculiar circumstances the account of the organ of inhabitiveness is a masterpiece of confusion it is an organ seated on the top of the head and impelling you to live in high places and then again in low places on land and water to be here and there and everywhere which is the same and different and is in short an organ not for any particular thing but for all sorts of contradictions first it is the same as the organ of pride and accounts for the chamois climbing rocks and the eagle the sky for children mounting on chairs and kings on thrones etc but then some animals prefer low marshy grounds and some birds build in the hollows and not on the tops of trees then it looks like a dispensation of providence to people different regions of the earth and one would think in this view that local prejudices would be resolved into a species of habitual attachment but no that would not be a nostrum it is therefore said nature which intended that all regions and countries should be inhabited assigned to all animals their dwellings and gave to every kind of animal its respective propensity to some particular region that is not to the place where it had been born and bred but where it was to be born and bred people who prefer this mode of philosophy are welcome to it no wonder our author finds it difficult to point out the seat of this organ yet he assures us that it must be deep-seated in the brain the organ of adhesiveness is evidently the same as the general faculty of attachment the organ of combativeness i conceive to be nothing but strength of bone and muscle and some projection arising from and indicating these the organs of destructiveness and constructiveness are the same but so as with a difference that is they express strong will with greater or less impatience of temper and comprehensiveness of mind the conqueror who overturns one state builds up and aggrandizes another i can conceive persons who are gifted with the organ of veneration to have expanded brains as well as swelling ideas the head of christ says our physiologist is always represented as very elevated yet he was remarkable for meekness as well as piety spurgeim says of the organ of covetiveness that it gives a desire for all that pleases again dr gall observed that persons of a firm and constant character have the top of their brain much developed and this is called the organ of determinativeness now if so are we to believe that the difference in resolute and irresolute persons is confined to this organ and that the nerves fibres etc of the rest of the brain are not lax or firm in proportion as the person is of a generally weak or determined character the whole question nearly turns upon this say that there is a particular prominence in this part owing to a greater strength and size of the levers of the will at this place this would prove nothing but the particular manifestation or development of a general power just as the prominence of the muscles of the calf of the leg denotes general muscular strength but the craniologist says that the strength of the whole body lies in the calf of the leg and has its seat or organ there not so in the name of common sense when dr spurgeim gets down to the visible region of the face the eyes forehead etc he makes sad work of it an infinite number of distinctions are crowded one upon the back of the other and to no purpose will anybody believe that there are five or six different organs for the impressions of one sense sight viz color form size and so on do we see the form with one organ and the color of the same object with another there may be different organs to receive different material or concrete impressions but surely only the mind can abstract the different impressions of the same sense from each other the organ of space appears to me to answer to the look of wild staring curiosity all that is accounted for in this way either from general conformation or from physiognomical expression is a heap of crude capricious unauthenticated trash i select one paragraph out of this puzzling chaos as a sample of what the reader must expect from the whole what then is the special faculty of the organ of individuality and its sphere of activity persons endowed with this faculty in a high degree are attentive to all that happens around them to every object to every phenomenon to every fact hence also to motions this faculty neither learns the qualities of objects nor the details of facts it knows only their existence the qualities of the objects and the particularities of the facts are known by the assistance of other organs besides this faculty has knowledge of all internal faculties and acts upon them it wishes to know all by experience consequently it puts every organ into action it wishes to hear see smell taste and touch to know all arts and sciences it is fond of instruction collects facts 
and leads to practical knowledge. In the next page he affirms that crystallography is the result of the organ of form, and that we do not get the ideas of roughness and smoothness from the touch, but I will end here, and turn to the amusing account of Dousterswivel in The Antiquary. Footnote. It appears, I understand, from an ingenious paper published by Dr. Combe of Edinburgh, that three heads have caused considerable uneasiness and consternation to a society of phrenologists in that city, viz. those of Sir Walter Scott, of the Duke of Wellington, and of Marshal Bucher. The first, contrary to the expectation of these learned persons, wants the organ of imagination, the second the organ of combination, and the last possesses the organ of fancy. This, I confess, as to the two first, appears to me a needless alarm. It would incline me, more than anything I have yet heard, to an opinion that there is something like an art of divination in the science. I had long ago formed and been hardy enough to express a conviction that Sir Walter's forte is a sort of traditional literature. Whatever he accumulates or scatters through his pages, he leaves as he finds it, with very few marks of the mastermind upon it. And as to the second person mentioned, he has just those powers of combination which belong to a man who leads a bulldog in a string, and lets the animal loose upon his prey at the proper moment. With regard to Prince Blücher, if he had not fancy in himself, he was the cause of it in others, for he turned the heads of many people who fancied his campaigns were the precursors of the millennium. I have at different times seen these three puzzling heads, and I should say that the poet looks like a gentleman farmer, the prince like a corporal on guard, or the lieutenant of a press gang, the duke like nothing or nobody. You look at the head of the first with admiration of its capacity and solid contents, at the last with wonder at what it can contain, any more than a drumhead, at the man of fancy, or of the fancy, with disgust at the grossness and brutality which he did not affect to conceal. These, however, are slight physiognomical observations taken at random, but I should be happy to find my squandering glances in any degree confirmed by the profounder science and more accurate investigations of northern genius. Dr. Combe afterwards published a volume on the subject called A System of Phrenology, it has been often reprinted. End of footnote. End of section 17. Section 18 of The Plain Speaker. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox. Dot org. Recording by Nicole Lee. The Plain Speaker. Opinions on Books, Men, and Things by William Hazlitt. Section 18 on Egotism. Part 1. It is mentioned in the life of Salvatore Rosa that on the occasion of an altarpiece of his being exhibited at Rome, in the triumph of the moment he compared himself to Michael Angelo, and spoke against Raphael, calling him hard, dry, etc. Both these were fatal symptoms for the ultimate success of the work. The picture was in fact afterwards severely censured, so as to cause him much uneasiness, and he passed a great part of his life in quarrelling with the world, for admiring his landscapes, which were truly excellent, and for not admiring his historical pieces, which were full of defects. Salvatore wanted self-knowledge, and that respect for others which is both a cause and consequence of it. Like many more, he mistook the violent and irritable workings of self-will in a wrong direction, for the impulse of genius, and his insensibility to the vast superiority of others, for a proof of his equality with them. In the first place, nothing augurs worse for any one's pretensions to the highest rank of excellence than his making free with those of others. He who boldly and unreservedly places himself on a level with the mighty dead shows a want of sentiment, the only thing that can ensure immortality to his own works. When we forestall the judgment of posterity, it is because we are not confident of it. A mind that brings all others into a line with its own naked, 
or assumed merits, that sees all objects in the foreground, as it were, that does not regard the lofty monuments of genius through the atmosphere of fame, is coarse, crude, and repulsive, as a picture without aerial perspective. Time, like distance, spreads a haze and a glory round all things. Not to perceive this is to want a sense, is to be without imagination. Yet there are those who strut in their own self-opinion and deck themselves out in the plumes of fancied self-importance, as if they were crowned with laurel by Apollo's own hand. There was nothing in common between Salvator and Michelangelo. If there had, the consciousness of the power with which he had to contend would have overawed and struck him dumb, so that the very familiarity of his approaches proved, as much as anything else, the immense distance placed between them. Painters alone seem to have a trick of putting themselves on an equal footing with the greatest of their predecessors, of advancing on the strength of their vanity and presumption to the highest seats in the temple of fame, of talking of themselves and Raphael and Michelangelo in the same breath. What should we think of a poet who should publish to the world or give a broad hint in private that he conceived himself fully on a par with Homer or Milton or Shakespeare? It would be too much for a friend to say so of him. But artists suffer their friends to puff them in the true King Cambyses vein without blushing. Is it that they are often men without a liberal education, who have no notion of anything that does not come under their immediate observation, and who accordingly prefer the living to the dead, and themselves to all the rest of the world? Or that there is something in the nature of the profession itself, fixing the view on a particular point of time, and not linking the present, either with the past or future? Again, Salvatore's disregard for Raphael, instead of inspiring him with anything like vain and self-conceit, ought to have taught him the greatest diffidence in himself. Instead of anticipating a triumph over Raphael from this circumstance, he might have foreseen in it the sure source of his mortification and defeat. The public looked to find in his pictures what he did not see in Raphael, and were necessarily disappointed. He could hardly be expected to produce that which, when produced and set before him, he did not feel or understand. The genius for a particular thing does not imply taste in general, or for other things, but it assuredly presupposes a taste or feeling for that particular thing. Salvatore was so much offended with the dryness, hardness, etc., of Raphael, only because he was not struck, that is, did not sympathise, with the divine mind within. If he had, he would have bowed, as at a shrine, in spite of the homeliness or finicalness of the covering. Let no man build himself a spurious self-esteem on his contempt or indifference for acknowledged excellence. He will in the end pay dear for a momentary delusion, for the world will sooner or later discover those deficiencies in him which render him insensible to all merits but his own. Of all modes of acquiring distinction and, as it were, getting the start of the majestic world, the most absurd, as well as disgusting, is that of setting aside the claims of others in the lump, and holding out our own particular excellence, or pursuit, as the only one worth attending to. We thus set ourselves up as the standard of perfection, and treat everything else that diverges from that standard, as beneath our notice. At this rate, a contempt for anything, and a superiority to it, are synonymous. It is a cheap and a short way of showing that we possess all excellence within ourselves, to deny the use or merit of all those qualifications that do not belong to us. According to such a mode of computation, it would appear that our value is to be estimated not by the number of acquirements that we do possess, but of those in which we are deficient, and to which we are insensible, so that we can at any time supply the place of wisdom and skill 
by a due proportion of ignorance, affectation, and conceit. If so, the dullest fellow, with impudence enough to despise what he does not understand, will always be the brightest genius and the greatest man. If stupidity is to be a substitute for taste, knowledge, and genius, any one may dogmatise and play the critic on this ground. We may easily make a monopoly of talent, if the torpedo touch of our callous and wilful indifference is to neutralise all other pretensions. We have only to deny the advantages of others to make them our own. Illiberality will carve out the way to pre-eminence much better than toil or study or quickness of parts. And by narrowing our views and divesting ourselves at last of common feeling and humanity, we may arrogate every valuable accomplishment to ourselves and exalt ourselves vastly above our fellow mortals. That is, in other words, we have only to shut our eyes in order to blot the sun out of heaven and to annihilate whatever gives light or heat to the world if it does not emanate from one single source by spreading the cloud of our own envy, spleen, malice, want of comprehension and prejudice over it. Yet how many are there who act upon this theory in good earnest, grow more bigoted to it every day, and not only become the dupes of it themselves, but by dint of gravity, by bullying and browbeating, succeed in making converts of others? A man is a political economist. Good. But this is no reason he should think there is nothing else in the world, or that everything else is good for nothing. Let us suppose that this is the most important subject, and that being his favourite study, he is the best judge of that point. Still, it is not the only one. Why then treat every other question or pursuit with disdain as insignificant and mean? Or endeavour to put others, who have devoted their whole time to it, out of conceit, with that on which they depend for their amusement, or perhaps subsistence? I see neither the wit, wisdom, nor good nature of this mode of proceeding. Let him fill his library with books on this one particular subject, yet other persons are not bound to follow his example and exclude every other topic from theirs. Let him write, let him talk, let him think on nothing else, but let him not impose the same pedantic humour as a duty or a mark of taste on others. Let him ride the high horse, and drag his heavy load of mechanical knowledge along the iron railway of the master science, but let him not move out of it to taunt or jostle those who are jogging quietly along upon their several hobbies, who owe him no allegiance, and care not one jot for his opinion. Yet we could forgive such a person if he made it his boast, that he had read Don Quixote twice through in the original Spanish, and preferred Lycidas to all Milton's smaller poems. What would Mr. Mill say? to any one who should profess a contempt for political economy. He would answer very bluntly and very properly, Then you know nothing about it. It is a pity that so sensible a man, and close a reasoner, should think of putting down other lighter and more elegant pursuits, by professing a contempt or indifference for them, which springs from entirely the same source, and is of just the same value. But so it is, that there seems to be a tacit presumption of folly, in whatever gives pleasure, while an air of gravity and wisdom hovers round the painful and pedantic. A man comes into a room, and on his first entering, declares without preface or ceremony his contempt for poetry. Are we therefore to conclude him a greater genius than Homer? No, but by this cavalier opinion, he assumes a certain natural ascendancy over those who admire poetry. To look down upon anything seemingly implies a greater elevation and enlargement of view than to look up to it. The present Lord Chancellor took upon him to declare in open court that he would not go across the street to hear Madame Catalani sing. What did this prove? His want of an ear for music, not his capacity for anything higher. So far as it went, it only showed him to be inferior to thousands of persons who would go with eager expectation to hear her, and come away with astonishment and rapture. A man might as well tell you he is deaf, and expect you to look at him with more respect. The want of any external sense or organ 
is an acknowledged defect and infirmity. The want of an internal sense or faculty is equally so, though our self-love contrives to give a different turn to it. We mortify others by throwing cold water on that in which they have an advantage over us, or stagger their opinion of an excellence which is not of self-evident or absolute utility, and lessen its supposed value by limiting the universality of a taste for it. Lord Eldon's protest on this occasion was the more extraordinary, as he is not only a good-natured, but a successful man. These little spiteful allusions are most apt to proceed from disappointed vanity, and an apprehension that justice is not done to ourselves. By being at the top of a profession, we have leisure to look beyond it. Those who really excel, and are allowed to excel in anything, have no excuse for trying to gain a reputation by undermining the pretensions of others. They stand on their own ground, and do not need the aid of invidious comparisons. Besides, the consciousness of excellence produces a fondness for a faith in it. I should half suspect that any one could not be a great lawyer who denied that Madame Catalani was a great singer. The Chancellor must dislike her decisive tone, the rapidity of her movements. The late Chancellor, Lord Erskine, was a man of, at least, a different stamp. In the exuberance and buoyancy of his animal spirits, he scattered the graces and ornaments of life over the dust and cobwebs of the law. What is there that is now left of him? What is there to redeem his foibles, or to recall the flush of early enthusiasm in his favour, or kindle one spark of sympathy in the breast, but his romantic admiration of Mrs. Siddons? There are those who, if you praise Walton's complete angler, sneer at it as a childish or old womanish performance. Some laugh at the amusement of fishing as silly, others carp at it as cruel, and Dr. Johnson said that a fishing rod was a stick with a hook at one end and a fool at the other. I would rather take the word of one who had stood for days up to his knees in water and in the coldest weather, intent on this employ, who returned to it again with unabated relish, and who spent his whole life in the same manner without being weary of it at last. There is something in this more than Dr. Johnson's definition accounts for. A fool takes no interest in anything, or if he does, it is better to be a fool than a wise man, whose only pleasure is to disparage the pursuits and occupations of others, and out of ignorance or prejudice to condemn them, merely because they are not his. Whatever interests is interesting. I know of no way of estimating the real value of objects in all their bearings and consequences, but I can tell at once their intellectual value by the degree of passion or sentiment the very idea and mention of them excites in the mind. To judge of things by reason, or the calculations of positive utility, is a slow, cold, uncertain and barren process. Their power of appealing to and affecting the imagination as subjects of thought and feeling, is best measured by the habitual impression they leave upon the mind, and it is with this only we have to do in expressing our delight or admiration of them, or in setting a just mental value upon them. They ought to excite all the emotion which they do excite, for this is the instinctive and unerring result of the constant experience we have had of their power of affecting us, and of the associations that cling unconsciously to them. Fancy, feeling, may be very inadequate tests of truth, but truth itself operates chiefly on the human mind through them. It is in vain to tell me that what excites the heartfelt sigh of youth, the tears of delight in age, and fills up the busy interval between with pleasing and lofty thoughts, is frivolous, or a waste of time, or of no use. You only by that give me a mean opinion of your ideas of utility. 
the labour of years the triumph of aspiring genius and consummate skill is not to be put down by a cynical frown by a supercilious smile by an ignorant sarcasm things barely of use are subjects of professional skill and scientific inquiry they must also be beautiful and pleasing to attract common attention and be naturally and universally interesting a pair of shoes is good to wear a pair of sandals is a more picturesque object and a statue or a poem are certainly good to think and talk about which are part of the business of life to think and speak of them with contempt is therefore a wilful and studied solecism. Pictures are good things to go and see. This is what people do. They do not expect to eat or make a dinner of them, but we sometimes want to fill up the time before dinner. The progress of civilization and refinement is from instrumental to final causes, from supplying the wants of the body to providing luxuries for the mind, to stop at the mechanical and refuse to proceed to the fine arts, or churlishly to reject all ornamental studies and elegant accomplishments as mean and trivial, because they only afford employment to the imagination, create food for thought, furnish the mind, sustain the soul in health and enjoyment, is a rude and barbarous theory, at propter vitam vivendi perdere causa. Before we absolutely condemn anything, we ought to be able to show something better, not merely in itself, but in the same class. To know the best in each class infers a higher degree of taste. To reject the class is only a negation of taste, for different classes do not interfere with one another, nor can any one's ipse dixit be taken on so wide a question as abstract excellence. Nothing is truly and altogether despicable, that excites angry contempt or warm oppositions, since this always implies that someone else is of a different opinion and takes an equal interest in it. End of section 18section 19 of The Plain Speaker. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nicole Lee. The Plain Speaker. Opinions on Books, Men and Things by William Hazlitt. Section 19. On Egotism. Part 2. When I speak of what is interesting, however, I mean not only to a particular profession, but in general to others. Indeed, it is the very popularity and obvious interest attached to certain studies and pursuits that excites the envy and hostile regard of graver and more recondite professions. Man is perhaps not naturally an egotist, or at least he is satisfied with his own particular line of excellence and the value that he supposes inseparable from it till he comes into the world and finds it of so little account in the eyes of the vulgar, and he then turns round and vents his chagrin and disappointment on those more attractive but, as he conceives, superficial studies, which cost less labour and patience to understand them, and are of so much less use to society. The injustice done to ourselves makes us unjust to others, the man of science and the hard student, from this cause, as well as from a certain unbending hardness of mind, come at last to regard whatever is generally pleasing and striking as worthless and light, and to proportion their contempt to the admiration of others, while the artist, the poet, and the votary of pleasure and popularity treat the more solid and useful branches of human knowledge as disagreeable and dull. This is often carried to too great a length. 
it is enough that wisdom is justified of her children the philosopher ought to smile instead of being angry at the folly of mankind if such it is and those who find both pleasure and profit in adorning and polishing the airy capitals of science and of art ought not to grudge those who toil underground at the foundation the praise that is due to their patience and self-denial there is a variety of tastes and capacities that requires all the variety of men's talents to administer to it the less excellent must be provided for as well as the more excellent those who are only capable of amusement ought to be amused if all men were forced to be great philosophers and lasting benefactors of their species how few of us could ever do anything at all but nature acts more impartially though not improvidently wherever she bestows a turn for anything on the individual she implants a corresponding taste for it in others we have only to throw our bread upon the waters and after many days we shall find it again let us do our best and we need not be ashamed of the smallness of our talent or afraid of the calumnies and contempt of envious maligners when goldsmith was talking one day to sir joshua of writing a fable in which little fishes were to be introduced dr johnson rolled about uneasily in his seat and began to laugh on which goldsmith said rather angrily why do you laugh if you were to write a fable for little fishes you would make them speak like great whales the reproof was just johnson was in truth conscious of goldsmith's superior inventiveness and of the lighter graces of his pen but he wished to reduce everything to his own pompous and oracular style there are not only books for children but books for all ages and for both sexes after we grow up to years of discretion we do not all become equally wise at once our own tastes change the tastes of other individuals are still more different it was said the other day that thomson's seasons would be read while there was a boarding-school girl in the world if a thousand volumes were written against hervey's meditations the meditations would be read when the criticisms were forgotten to the illiterate and vain affectation and verbiage will always pass for fine writing while the world stands no woman ever liked burke or disliked goldsmith it is idle to set up an universal standard there is a large class who in spite of themselves prefer westall or angelica kaufman to raphael nor is it fit they should do otherwise we may come to something like a fixed and exclusive standard of taste if we confine ourselves to what will please the best judges meaning thereby persons of the most refined and cultivated minds and by persons of the most refined and cultivated minds generally meaning ourselves to return to the original question i can conceive of nothing so little or so ridiculous as pride it is a mixture of insensibility and ill-nature in which it is hard to say which has the largest share if a man knows or excels in or has ever studied any two things i will venture to affirm he will be proud of neither it is perhaps excusable for a person who is ignorant of all but one thing to think that the sole excellence and to be full of himself as the possessor the way to cure him of this folly is to give him something else to be proud of vanity is a building that falls to the ground as you widen its foundation or strengthen the props that should support it the greater a man is the less he necessarily thinks of himself for his knowledge enlarges with his attainments in himself he feels that he is nothing a point a speck in the universe except as his mind reflects that universe and as he enters into the infinite variety of truth beauty and power contained in it let any one be brought up among books and taught to think words the only things and he may conceive highly of himself from the proficiency he has made in language and in letters let him then be compelled to attempt some other pursuit painting for instance and be made to feel the difficulties the refinements of which it is capable and the number of things of which he was utterly ignorant before and there will be an end of his pedantry and his pride together nothing but the want of comprehension of view or generosity of spirit can make any one fix on his own particular acquirement as the limit of all excellence 
no one is generally speaking great in more than one thing if he extends his pursuits he dissipates his strength yet in that one thing how small is the interval between him and the next in merit and reputation to himself but he thinks nothing of or scorns or loathes the name of his rival so that all that the other possesses in common goes for nothing and the fraction of a difference between them constitutes in his opinion the sum and substance of all that is excellent in the universe let a man be wise and then let us ask will his wisdom make him proud let him excel all others in the graces of the mind has he also those of the body he has the advantage of fortune but has he also that of birth or if he has both has he health strength beauty in a supreme degree or have not others the same or does he think all these nothing because he does not possess them the proud man fancies that there is no one worth regarding but himself he might as well fancy there is no other being but himself the one is not a greater stretch of madness than the other to make pride justifiable there ought to be but one proud man in the world for if any one individual has a right to be so nobody else has so far from thinking ourselves superior to all the rest of the species we cannot be sure that we are above the meanest and most despised individual of it for he may have some virtue some excellence some source of happiness or usefulness within himself which may redeem all other disadvantages or even if he is without any such hidden worth this is not a subject of exultation but of regret to any one tinctured with the smallest humanity and he who is totally devoid of the latter cannot have much reason to be proud of anything else arkwright who invented the spinning jenny for many years kept a paltry barber's shop in a provincial town yet at that time that wonderful machinery was working in his brain which has added more to the wealth and resources of this country than all the pride of ancestry or insolence of upstart nobility for the last hundred years we should be cautious whom we despise if we do not know them we can have no right to pronounce a hasty sentence if we do they may espy some few defects in us no man is a hero to his valet de chambre what is it then that makes the difference the dress and pride but he is the most of a hero who is least distinguished by the one and most free from the other if we enter into conversation upon equal terms with the lowest of the people unrestrained by circumstance unawed by interest we shall find in ourselves but little superiority over them if we know what they do not they know what we do not in general those who do things for others know more about them than those for whom they are done a groom knows more about horses than his master he rides them too but the one rides behind the other before hence the number of forms and ceremonies that have been invented to keep the magic circle of fancied self-importance inviolate the late king sought but one interview with dr johnson his present majesty is never tired of the company of mr croker the collision of truth or genius naturally gives a shock to the pride of exalted rank the great and mighty usually seek out the dregs of mankind buffoons and flatterers for their pampered self-love to repose on pride soon tires of everything but its shadow servility but how poor a triumph is that which exists only by excluding all rivalry however remote he who invites competition the only test of merit who challenges fair comparisons and weighs different claims is alone possessed of manly ambition but will not long continue vain or proud pride is a cell of ignorance travelling a bed if we look at all out of ourselves we must see how far short we are of what we would be thought the man of genius is poor the rich man is not a lord the lord wants to be a king the king is uneasy to be a tyrant or a god yet he alone who could claim this last character upon earth gave his life a ransom for others the dwarf in the romance who saw the shadows of the fairest and the mightiest 
among the sons of men pass before him, that he might assume the shape he liked best, had only his choice of wealth, or beauty, or valour, or power. But could he have clutched them all, and melted them into one essence of pride, the triumph would not have been lasting. Could vanity take all pomp and power to itself? Could it, like the rainbow, span the earth, and seem to prop the heavens? After all, it would be but the wonder of the ignorant, the pageant of a moment. The fool who dreams that he is great should first forget that he is a man, and before he thinks of being proud, should pray to be mad. The only great man in modern times, that is, the only man who rose in deeds and fame, to the level of antiquity, who might turn his gaze upon himself, and wonder at his height, for on him all eyes were fixed, as his majestic stature towered above thrones and monuments of renown, died the other day in exile, and in lingering agony, and we still see fellows strutting about the streets, and fancying they are something. Personal vanity is incompatible with the great and the ideal. He who has not seen, or thought, or read of something finer than himself, has seen or read or thought little, and he who has will not be always looking in the glass of his own vanity. Hence poets, artists, and men of genius in general are seldom coxcombs, but often slovens, for they find something out of themselves better worth studying than their own persons. They have an imaginary standard in their minds, with which ordinary features, even their own, will not bear a comparison, and they turn their thoughts another way. If a man had a face like one of Raphael's or Titian's heads, he might be proud of it, but not else, and even then he would be stared at as a nondescript by the universal English nation. Few persons who have seen the Antinous or the Theseus will be much charmed with their own beauty or symmetry. Nor will those who understand the costume of the antique, or Van Dyck's dresses, spend much time in decking themselves out in all the deformity of the prevailing fashion. A coxcomb is his own lay figure, for want of any better models to employ his time and imagination upon. There is an inverted sort of pride, the reverse of that egotism that has been above described, and which, because it cannot be everything, is dissatisfied with everything. A person who is liable to this infirmity thinks nothing done while anything remains to be done. The sanguine egotist prides himself on what he can do or possesses. The morbid egotist despises himself for what he wants, and is ever going out of his way to attempt hopeless and impossible tasks. The effect in either case is not at all owing to reason, but to temperament. The one is as easily depressed by what mortifies his latent ambition, as the other is elated by what flatters his immediate vanity. There are persons whom no success, no advantages, no applause can satisfy, for they dwell only on failure and defeat. They constantly forget the things that are behind, and press forward, to the things that are before. The greatest and most decided acquisitions would not indemnify them for the smallest deficiency. They go beyond the old motto, out Caesar, out nihil. They not only want to be at the head of whatever they undertake, but if they succeed in that, they immediately want to be at the head of something else, no matter how gross or trivial. The charm that rivets their affections is not the importance or reputation annexed to the new pursuit, but its novelty or difficulty. That must be a wonderful accomplishment indeed which baffles their skill. Nothing is with them of any value, but as it gives scope to their restless activity of mind, their craving after an uneasy and importunate state of excitement. To them the pursuit is everything, the possession nothing. I have known persons of this stamp who, with every reason to be satisfied with their success in life, and with the opinion entertained of them by others, despised themselves because they could not do something which they were not bound to do, and which, if they could have done it, would not have added one jot to their respectability, either in their own eyes or those of any one else, 
the very insignificance of the attainment irritating their impatience, for it is the humour of such dispositions to argue, if they cannot succeed in what is trifling and contemptible, how should they succeed in anything else? If they could make the circuit of the arts and sciences, and master them all, they would take to some mechanical exercise, and if they failed, be as discontented as ever. All that they can do vanishes out of sight, the moment it is within their grasp, and nothing is but what is not. A poet of this description is ambitious of the thews and muscles of a prize-fighter, and thinks himself nothing without them. A prose-writer would be a fine tennis-player, and is thrown into despair because he is not one, without considering that it requires a whole life devoted to the game to excel in it, and that, even if he could dispense with this apprenticeship, he would still be just as much bound to excel in rope-dancing, or horsemanship, or playing at cup and ball like the Indian jugglers, all which is impossible. This feeling is a strange mixture of modesty and pride. We think nothing of what we are, because we cannot be everything with a wish. Goldsmith was even jealous of beauty in the other sex, and the same character is attributed to Wharton by Pope. Though listening senates hung on all he spoke, the club must hail him master of the joke. Players are for going into the church. Officers in the army turn players. For myself, do what I might. I should think myself a poor creature, unless I could beat a boy of ten years old at chuck-farthing, or an elderly gentlewoman at piquet. The extreme of fastidious discontent and repining is as bad as that of overweening presumption. We ought to be satisfied if we have succeeded in any one thing, or with having done our best. Anything more is for health and amusement, and should be resorted to as a source of pleasure, not of fretful impatience and endless pity, self-imposed mortification. Perhaps the jealous, uneasy temperament is most favourable to continued exertion and improvement, if it does not lead us to fritter away attention on too many pursuits. By looking out of ourselves, we gain knowledge. By being little satisfied with what we have done, we are less apt to sink into indolence and security. To conclude with a piece of egotism, I never begin one of these essays, with a consciousness of having written a line before, and having got to the end of the volume, we hope never to look into it again. End of section 19section 20 of the plain speaker this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by nicole lee the plain speaker Opinions on Books, Men, and Things by William Hazlitt Section 20 Hot and Cold Hot, cold, moist, and dry, four champions first, strive here for mastery. Milton The Protestants are much cleaner than the Catholics, said a shopkeeper of Vevey to me. They are so, I replied, but why should they? A prejudice appeared to him a matter of fact, and he did not think it necessary to assign reasons for a matter of fact. That is not my way. He had not bottomed his proposition on proofs, nor rightly defined it. Nearly the same remark as to the extreme cleanliness of the people in this part of the country, had occurred to me as soon as I got to Brigg, where, however, the inhabitants are Catholics. So the original statement requires some qualification as to the mode of enunciation. I had no sooner arrived in this village, which is situated just under the Simplon, and where you are surrounded with glaciers and goiters, than the genius of the place struck me, on looking out at the pump under my window the next morning, where the neat-handed phyllises were washing their greens in the water, that not a caterpillar could crawl on them, and scouring their pails and tubs, 
that not a stain should be left in them. The raw, clammy feeling of the air was in unison with the scene. I had not seen such a thing in Italy. They have there no delight in splashing and dabbling in fresh streams and fountains. They have a dread of ablutions and abstertions, almost amounting to hydrophobia. Heat has an antipathy in nature to cold. The sanguine Italian is chilled and shudders at the touch of cold water, while the Helvetian boor, whose humours creep through his veins, like the dank mists along the sides of his frozen mountains, is native and endued unto that element. Here everything is purified and filtered. There it is baked and burnt up and sticks together in a most amicable union of filth and laziness. There is a little mystery and a little contradiction in the case. Let us try, if we cannot get rid of both, by means of caution and daring together. It is not that the difference of latitude between one side of the Alps and the other can signify much, but the phlegmatic blood of their German ancestors is poured down the valleys of the Swiss like water and iced in its progress whereas that of the Italians, besides its vigorous origin, is enriched and ripened by basking in more genial plains. A single Milanese market girl, to go no further south, appeared to me to have more blood in her body, more fire in her eye, as if the sun had made a burning lens of it, more spirit, and probably more mischief about her, than all the nice, tidy, good-looking, hard-working girls I have seen in Switzerland. To turn this physiognomical observation to a metaphysical account, I should say, then, that northern people are clean and southern people are dirty, as a general rule, because where the principle of life is more cold, weak, and impoverished, there is a greater shyness and aversion to come in contact with external matter, with which it does not so easily amalgamate, a greater fastidiousness and delicacy in choosing its sensations, a greater desire to know surrounding objects and to keep them clear of each other, than where this principle being more warm and active, it may be supposed to absorb outward impressions in itself, to melt them into its own essence, to impart its own vital impulses to them, and in fine, instead of shrinking from everything, to be shocked at nothing. The southern temperament is, so to speak, more sociable with matter, more gross, impure, indifferent, from relying on its own strength, while that opposed to it, from being less able to react on external applications, is obliged to be more cautious and particular as to the kind of excitement to which it renders itself liable. Hence the timidity, reserve, and occasional hypocrisy of northern manners, the boldness, freedom, levity, and frequent licentiousness of southern ones. It would be too much to say that if there is anything of which a genuine Italian has a horror, it is of cleanliness, or that if there is anything which seems ridiculous to a thoroughbred Italian woman, it is modesty. But certainly the degree to which nicety is carried by some people is a bore to an Italian imagination, as the excess of delicacy which is pretended or practised by some women is quite incomprehensible to the females of the South. It is wrong, however, to make the greater confidence or forwardness of manners an absolute test of morals. The love of virtue is a different thing from the fear or even hatred of vice. The squeamishness and prudery in the one case have a more plausible appearance. But it does not follow that there may not be more native goodness and even habitual refinement in the other though accompanied 
with stronger nerves and a less morbid imagination. But to return to the first question, I can readily understand how a Swiss peasant should stand a whole morning at a pump, washing cabbages, cauliflowers, salads, and getting rid half a dozen times over of the sand, dirt, and insects they contain, because I myself should not only be gravelled by meeting with the one at table, but should be in horrors at the other. A Frenchman, or an Italian, would be thrown into convulsions of laughter at this superfluous delicacy, and would think his repast enriched, or none the worse, for such additions. The reluctance to prey on life, or on what once had it, seems to arise from a sense of incongruity, from the repugnance between life and death, from the cold, clammy feeling which belongs to the one, and which is enhanced by the contrast to its former warm, lively state, and by the circumstance of its being taken into the mouth and devoured as food. Hence the desire to get rid of the idea of the living animal, even in ordinary cases, by all the disguises of cookery, of boiled and roast, and by the artifice of changing the name of the animal into something different when it becomes food. Hence sportsmen are not devourers of game, and hence the aversion to kill the animals we eat. There is a contradiction between the animate and the inanimate, which is felt as matter of peculiar annoyance by the more cold and congealed temperament, which cannot so well pass from one to the other. But this objection is easily swallowed by the inhabitant of gayer and more luxurious regions, who is so full of life himself that he can at once impart it to all that comes in his way, or never troubles himself about the difference. So the Neapolitan bandit takes the life of his victim with little remorse, because he has enough and to spare in himself. His pulse still beats, warm and vigorous, while the blood of a more humane native of the frozen north would run cold with horror at the sight of the stiffened course, and this makes him pause before he stops in another, the gushing source, of which he has such feeble supplies in himself. The wild Arab of the desert can hardly entertain the idea of death, neither dreading it for himself, nor regretting it for others. The Italians, Spaniards, and people of the South swarm alive, without being sick or sorry, at the circumstance. They hunt their accustomed prey in each other's tangled locks, openly in the streets and on the highways, without manifesting shame or repugnance. Combs are an invention of our northern climes. Now, I can comprehend this when I look at the dirty, dingy, greasy, sunburnt complexion of an Italian peasant or beggar, whose body seems alive all over, with a sort of tingling, oily sensation, so that from any given particle of his shining skin to the beast whose name signifies love, the transition is but small. This populousness is not unaccountable where all teems with life, where all is glowing and in motion, and every pore thrills with an exuberance of feeling. Not so in the dearth of life and spirit, in the drossy, dry material texture, the clear complexions and fair hair of the Saxon races, where the puncture of an insect sting is a solution of their personal identity, and the idea of life attached to and courting an intimacy with them in spite of themselves, naturally produces all the revulsions of the most violent antipathy, and nearly drives them out of their wits. How well the smooth ivory comb and auburn hair agree, while the Greek dandy, on entering a room, applies his hand to brush a cloud of busy stragglers from his hair, like powder, and gives himself no more concern about them than about the motes dancing in the sunbeams. 
The dirt of the Italians is, as it were, baked into them, and so ingrained, as to become a part of themselves, and occasion no discontinuity of their being. I can forgive the dirt and sweat of a gypsy, under a hedge, when I consider that the earth is his mother, the sun is his father. He hunts vermin for food. He is himself hunted like vermin for prey. His existence is not one of choice, but of necessity. The hungry Arab devours the raw shoulder of a horse. This again I can conceive. His feverish blood seethes it, and the virulence of his own breath carries off the disagreeableness of the smell. I do not see that the horse should be reckoned among unclean animals, according to any notions I have of the matter. The dividing of the hoof or the contrary, I should think, has not anything to do with the question. I can understand the distinction between beasts of prey and the herbivorous and domestic animals, but the horse is tame. The natural distinction between clean and unclean animals, which has been sometimes made into a religious one, I take to depend on two circumstances, viz. the claws and bristly hide, which generally, though not always, go together. One would not wish to be torn in pieces, instead of making a comfortable meal, to be supped upon, where we thought of supping. With respect to the wolf, the tiger, and other animals of the same species, it seems a question which of us should devour the other. This balks our appetite by distracting our attention, and we have so little relish for being eaten ourselves, or for the fangs and teeth of these shocking animals, that it gives us a distaste for their whole bodies. The horror we conceive at preying upon them arises in part from the fear we had of being preyed upon by them. No such apprehension crosses the mind with respect to the deer, the sheep, the hare. Here all is conscience and tender heart. These gentle creatures, whom we compliment as useful, offer no resistance to the knife, and there is therefore nothing shocking or repulsive in the idea of devoting them to it. There is no confusion of ideas, but a beautiful simplicity and uniformity in our relation to each other, we as the slayers, they as the slain. A perfect understanding subsists on the subject. The hair of animals of prey is also strong and bristly, and forms an obstacle to our epicurean designs. The calf or fawn is sleek and smooth. The bristles on a dog's or a cat's back are like the quills upon the fretful porcupine, a very impracticable repast to the imagination that stick in the throat and turn the stomach. Who has not read and been edified by the account of the supper in Gilles Blas? Besides, there is also in all probability the practical consideration urged by Voltaire's traveller, who being asked which he preferred, black mutton or white, replied, either, provided it was tender. The greater rankness in the flesh is, however, accompanied by a corresponding irritability of surface, a tenaciousness, a pruriency, a soreness to attack, and not that fine, round, pampered passiveness to impressions, which cuts up into handsome joints and entire pieces without any fidgety process, and with an obvious view to solid wholesome nourishment. Swine's flesh, the abomination of the Jewish law, certainly comes under the objection here stated, and the bear, with its shaggy fur, is only smuggled into the Christian larder as half-brother to the wild boar, and because from its lazy lumpish character and appearance it seems matter of indifference whether it eats or is eaten. The horse, with sleek round haunches, is fair game, except from custom, and I think I could survive having swallowed part of an ass's foal without being utterly loathsome to myself. Mites in a rotten cheese are endurable, from being so small and dry that they are scarce distinguishable from the atoms of the cheese itself, so jossy and divisible are they. 
but the Lord deliver me from their more thriving next-door neighbours. Animals that are made use of as food should either be so small as to be imperceptible, or else we should dig into the quarry of life, hew away the masses, and not leave the forms standing to reproach us with our gluttony and cruelty. I hate to see a rabbit trussed, or a hare brought to table in the form which it occupied while living. They seem to me apparitions of the burrowers in the earth, or the rovers in the wood, sent to scare away appetite. One reason why toads and serpents are disgusting is from the way in which they run against or suddenly cling to the skin. The encountering them causes a solution of continuity, and we shudder to feel a life which is not ours in contact with us. It is this disjointed or imperfect sympathy which, in the recoil, produces the greatest antipathy. Stern asks why a sword, which takes away life, may be named without offence, though other things, which contribute to perpetuate it, cannot, because the idea in the one case is merely painful, and there is no mixture of the agreeable to lead the imagination on to a point from which it must make a precipitate retreat. The morally indecent arises from the doubtful conflict between temptation and duty. The physically revolting is the product of alternate attraction and repulsion, of partial adhesion, or of something that is foreign to us, sticking closer to our persons than we could wish. The nastiest tastes and smells are not the most pungent and painful, but a compound of sweet and bitter, of the agreeable and disagreeable, where the sense, having been relaxed and rendered effeminate, as it were, by the first, is unable to contend with the last, faints and sinks under it, and has no way of relieving itself, but by violently throwing off the load that oppresses it, hence loathing and sickness. But those hardly ever arise without something contradictory or impure in the objects, or unless the mind, having been invited and prepared to be gratified at first, this expectation is turned to disappointment and disgust. Mere pains, mere pleasures, do not have this effect, save from an excess of the first causing insensibility, and then a faintness ensues, or of the last, causing what is called a surfeit. Seasickness has some analogy to this. It comes on with that unsettled motion of the ship, which takes away the ordinary footing or firm hold we have of things, and by relaxing our perceptions, unbraces the whole nervous system. The giddiness and swimming of the head on looking down a precipice, when we are ready with every breath of imagination to topple down into the abyss, has its source in the same uncertain and rapid whirl of the fancy through possible extremes. Thus we find that for cases of fainting, seasickness, etc., a glass of brandy is recommended as a sovereign thing on earth, because by grappling with the coats of the stomach and bringing our sensations to a focus, it does away that nauseous fluctuation and suspense of feeling which is the root of the mischief. I do not know whether I make myself intelligible, for the utmost I can pretend is to suggest some very subtle and remote analogies. But if I have at all succeeded in opening up the train of argument I intend, it will at least be possible to conceive how the sanguine Italian is less nice in his intercourse with material objects, less startled at incongruities, less liable to take offence, than the more literal and conscientious German, because the more headstrong current of his own sensations fills up the gaps and makes the odds all even. He does not care to have his cabbages and salads washed ten times over, or his beds cleared of vermin. He can lend or borrow satisfaction from all objects indifferently. The air over his head is full of life, of the hum of insects. The grass under his feet rings and is loud with the cry of the grasshopper. Innumerable green lizards dart from the rocks and sport before him. 
What signifies it if any living creature approaches nearer his own person, where all is one vital glow? The Indian even twines the forked serpent round his hand unharmed, copper-coloured like it, his veins as heated, and the Brahmin cherishes life and disregards his own person as an act of his religion, the religion of fire and of the sun. Yet how shall we reconcile to this theory the constant ablutions, five times a day, of the eastern nations, and the squalid customs of some northern people, the dirtiness of the Russians, and of the Scotch? Superstition may perhaps account for the one, and poverty, and barbarism for the other. Laziness has a great deal to do in the question, and this again is owing to a state of feeling sufficient to itself, and rich in enjoyment without the help of action. Clotilde, the finest and darkest of the Gensano girls, fixes herself at her door about noon, when her day's work is done. Her smile reflects back the brightness of the sun. She darts upon a little girl, with a child in her arms, nearly overturns both, devours it with kisses, and then resumes her position at the door, with her hands behind her back, and her shoes down at heel. This slatternliness and negligence is the more remarkable in so fine a girl, and one whose ordinary costume is a gorgeous picture, but it is a part of the character. Her dress would never have been so rich if she could take more pains about it. They have no nervous or fidgety feeling whether a thing is coming off or not. All their sensations, as it were, sit loose upon them. Their clothes are no part of themselves. They even fling their limbs about as if they scarcely belong to them. The heat in summer requires the utmost freedom and airiness, which becomes a habit, and they have nothing tight-bound or straight-laced about their minds or bodies. The same girl in winter, for a dull cold winter does inhabit here also, would have a scaldaletto, an earthen pan with coals in it, dangling at her wrists for four months together, without any sense of encumbrance or distraction, or any other feeling but of the heat it communicated to her hands. She does not mind its chilling the rest of her body, or disfiguring her hands, making her fingers look like long purples. These children of nature take the good the gods provide them, and trouble themselves little, about consequences or appearances. Their self-will is much stronger than their vanity. They have as little curiosity about others as concern for their good opinion. Two Italian peasants talking by the roadside will not so much as turn their heads to look at an English carriage that is passing. They have no interest except in what is personal, sensual. Hence they have as little tenaciousness on the score of property as in the acquisition of ideas. They want neither. Their good spirits are food, clothing, and books to them. They are fond of comfort too, but their notion of it differs from ours. Ours consists in accumulating the means of enjoyment. Theirs is being free to enjoy in the dear faniente. What need have they to encumber themselves with furniture, or wealth, or business, when all they require, for the most part, is air, a bunch of grapes, bread, and stone walls. The Italians, generally speaking, have nothing, do nothing, want nothing, to the surprise of foreigners. Who ask how they live? The men are too lazy to be thieves, the women to be something else. The dependence of the Swiss and English on their comforts, that is, on all appliances and means to boot, as helps to enjoyment or hindrances to annoyance, makes them not only eager to procure different objects of accommodation and luxury, but makes them take such pains in their preservation and embellishment, and pet them so when acquired. A man, says Yorick, finds an apple, spits upon it, and calls it his. The more any one finds himself clinging to material objects, for existence or gratification, the more he will take a personal interest in them, and the more will he clean, repair, polish, scrub, scour, and tug at them without end, as if it were his own soul that he was keeping clear from spot or blemish. A Swiss dairymaid scours the very heart out of a wooden pail. A scullion washes the taste 
as well as the worms, out of a dish of broccoli. The wenches are in like manner neat and clean in their own persons, but insipid. The most coarse and ordinary furniture in Switzerland has more pains bestowed upon it to keep it in order than the finest works of art in Italy. There the pictures are suffered to moulder on the walls, and the clods in the Doria Palace at Rome are black with age and dirt. We set more store by them in England, where we have scarce any other sunshine. At the common inns on this side the Simplon, the very sheets have a character for whiteness to lose. The rods and testers of the beds are like a peeled wand. On the opposite side you are thankful when you are not shown into an apartment resembling a three-stall stable, with horse-cloths for coverlids to hide the dirt, and beds of horsehair or withered leaves as harbourage for vermin. The more the merrier, the dirtier the warmer, live and let live, seem maxims inculcated by the climate. Wherever things are not kept carefully apart from foreign admixtures and contamination, the distinctions of property itself will not, I conceive, be held exceedingly sacred. This feeling is strong as the passions are weak. A people that are remarkable for cleanliness will be so for industry, for honesty, for avarice, and vice versa. The Italians cheat, steal, rob, when they think it worth their while to do so, with licensed impunity. The Swiss, who feel the value of property, and labour incessantly to acquire it, are afraid to lose it. At Brig, I first heard the cry of watchmen at night, which I had not heard for many months. I was reminded of the traveller who, after wandering in remote countries, saw a gallows near at hand, and knew by this circumstance that he approached the confines of civilization. The police in Italy is both secret and severe, but it is directed chiefly to political and not to civil matters. Patriot sighs are heaved unheard in the dungeons of St. Angelo. The Neapolitan bandit breathes the free air of his native mountains. It may by this time be conjectured why Catholics are less cleanly than Protestants, because in fact they are less scrupulous and swallow whatever is set before them in matters of faith as well as other things. Protestants, as such, are captious and scrutinising, try to pick holes and find fault, have a dry, meagre, penurious imagination. Catholics are buoyed up over doubts and difficulties by a greater redundance of fancy, and make religion subservient to a sense of enjoyment. The one are for detecting and weeding out all corruptions and abuses in doctrine or worship. The others enrich theirs with the dust and cobwebs of antiquity, and think their ritual none the worse for the tarnish of age. Those of the Catholic communion are willing to take it for granted that everything is right. The professors of the reformed religion have a pleasure in believing that everything is wrong, in order that they may have to set it right. In morals, again, Protestants are more precise than their Catholic brethren. The creed of the latter absolves them of half their duties. Of all those that are a clog on their inclinations, atones for all slips, and patches up all deficiencies. But though this may make them less censorious and sour, I am not sure that it renders them less in earnest in the part they do perform. When more is left to freedom of choice, perhaps the service that is voluntary will be purer and more effectual. That which is not so may as well be done by proxy, or if it does not come from the heart, may be suffered to exhale merely from the lips. If less is owing in this case to a dread of vice and fear of shame, more will proceed from a love of virtue, free from the least sinister construction. It is asserted that Italian women are more gross, I can believe it, and that they are at the same time more refined than others. Their religion is in the same manner more sensual, but is it not to the full as visionary and imaginative as any? I have heard Italian women say things that others would not. It does not therefore follow that they would do them, partly because the knowledge of vice that makes it familiar renders it indifferent 
and because the same masculine tone of thinking that enables them to confront vice may raise them above it into a higher sphere of sentiment if their senses are more inflammable their passions and their love of virtue and of religion among the rest may glow with proportionable ardour indeed the truest virtue is that which is least susceptible of contamination from its opposite i may admire raphael and yet not swoon at sight of a daub why should there not be the same taste in morals as in pictures or poems granting that vice has more votaries here at least it has fewer mercenary ones and this is no trifling advantage as to manners the catholics must be allowed to carry it all over the world the better sort not only say nothing to give you pain they say nothing of others that it would give them pain to hear repeated scandal and tittle-tattle are long banished from good society after all to be wise is to be humane what would our english blue stockings say to this the fault and the excellence of italian society is that the shocking or disagreeable is not supposed to have an existence in the nature of things end of section 20section twenty one of the plain speaker this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by nicole lee the plain speaker opinions on books men and things by William Hazlitt, section 21, The New School of Reform, a dialogue between a rationalist and a sentimentalist, part 1. Rationalist, what is it you so particularly object to this school? Is there anything so very obnoxious in the doctrine of utility which they profess, or in the design to bring about the greatest possible good? by the most efficacious and disinterested means sentimentalist disinterested enough indeed since their plan seems to be to sacrifice every individual comfort for the good of the whole can they find out no better way of making human life smooth and pleasant than by drying up the brain and curdling the blood i do not want society to resemble a living skeleton whatever these job's comforters may do they are like the fox in the fable they have no feeling themselves, and would persuade others to do without it. Take away the dulce of the poet, and I do not see what is to become of the utile. It is the common error of the human mind, of forgetting the end in the means. Rationalist. I see you are at your sentimentalities again. Pray tell me, is it not their having applied this epithet to some of your favourite speculations, that has excited this sudden burst of spleen against them. Sentimentalist. At least I cannot retort this phrase on those printed circulars, which they throw down areas and fasten under knockers, but pass on for that. Answer me, then. What is there agreeable or ornamental in human life, that they do not explode with fanatic rage? What is there sordid and cynical, that they do not eagerly catch at? What is there that delights others, that does not disgust them? What that disgusts others, with which they are not delighted? I cannot think that this is owing to philosophy, but to a sinister bias of mind, inasmuch as a marked deficiency of temper is a more obvious way of accounting for certain things than an entire superiority of understanding. The ascetics of old thought they were doing God good service, by tormenting themselves and denying others the most innocent amusements. Who doubts now that in this, armed as they were with texts and authorities and awful denunciations, they were really actuated by a morose and envious disposition, that had no capacity for enjoyment itself, or felt a malicious repugnance 
to the idea of it in any one else. What in them took the garb of religion, with us puts on the semblance of philosophy. And instead of dooming the heedless and refractory to hellfire or the terrors of purgatory, our modern polemics set their disciples in the stocks of utility, or throw all the elegant arts and amiable impulses of humanity into the limbo of political economy. Rationalist I cannot conceive what possible connection there can be between the weak and mischievous enthusiasts you speak of and the most enlightened reasoners of the nineteenth century. They would laugh at such a comparison. Sentimentalist Self-knowledge is the last thing which I should lay to the charge of soi-disant philosophers. But a man may be a bigot without a particle of religion. A monk or an inquisitor in a plain coat, and professing the most liberal opinions. Rationalist. You still deal as usual, in idle sarcasms and flimsy generalities. Will you descend to particulars and state facts before you draw inferences from them? Sentimentalist. In the first place, then, they are mostly Scotchmen, lineal descendants of the Covenanters and Cameronians, and inspired with the true John Knox zeal for mutilating and defacing the carved work of the sanctuary. Rationalist. Hold, hold! This is vulgar prejudice and personality. Sentimentalist. But it's the fact, and I thought you called for facts. Do you imagine if I hear a fellow in Scotland abusing the author of Waverley, who has five hundred hearts beating in his bosom, because there is no religion in his works, and a fellow in Westminster doing the same thing, because there is no political economy in them, that anything will prevent me from supposing that this is virtually the same Scotch peddler with his pack of utility at his back, whether he deals in tape and stays, or in drawling compilations of histories and reviews. Rationalist. I did not know you had such an affection for Sir Walter. Sentimentalist. I said the author of Waverley. Not to like him would be not to love myself or human nature, of which he has given so many interesting specimens. Though for the sake of that same human nature I have no liking to Sir Walter. Those few and recent writers, on the contrary, who by their own account have discovered the true principles of the greatest happiness to the greatest numbers, are easily reconciled to the Tory and the bigot, because they here feel a certain superiority over him. But they cannot forgive the great historian of life and manners, because he has enlarged our sympathy with human happiness beyond their pragmatical limits. They are not even good haters, for they hate not what degrades and afflicts, but what consoles and elevates the mind. Their plan is to block out human happiness wherever they see a practicable opening to it. Rationalist. But perhaps their notions of happiness differ from yours. They think it should be regulated by the doctrine of utility. Whatever is incompatible with this they regard as spurious and false, and scorn all base compromises and temporary palliatives. Sentimentalist. Yes. Just as the religious fanatic thinks there is no salvation out of the pale of his own communion, and damns without scruple every appearance of virtue and piety beyond it. Poor David Deans! How would he have been surprised to see all his follies, his right-hand defections, and his left-hand compliances, and his contempt for human learning, blossom again in a knot of sophists and professed illuminés? Such persons are not to be treated as philosophers and metaphysicians, but as conceited sectaries and ignorant mechanics. In neither case is the intolerant and proscribing spirit a deduction of pure reason, indifferent to consequences, but the dictate of presumption, prejudice, and spiritual pride, or a strong desire in the elect to narrow the privilege of salvation to as small a circle as possible, and in a few and recent writers, to have the whole field of happiness and argument to themselves. The enthusiasts of old did all they could to strike the present existence from under our feet, to give us another, to annihilate our natural affections and worldly vanities, so as to conform us to the likeness of God. The modern skeolists offer us utopia in lieu of our actual enjoyments, 
for warm flesh and blood would give us a head of clay and a heart of steel, and conform us to their own likeness, a consummation not very devoutly to be wished. Where is the use of getting rid of the trammels of superstition and slavery? If we are immediately to be handed over to these new ferrets, and inspectors of a police philosophy, who pay domiciliary visits to the human mind, catechise an expression, impale a sentiment, put every enjoyment to the rack, leave you not a moment's ease or respite, and imprison all the faculties in a round of cant phrases, the shibboleth of a party. They are far from indulging or even tolerating the strain of exulting enthusiasm expressed by Spencer. What more felicity can fall to creature than to enjoy delight with liberty, and to be lord of all the works of nature, to reign in the air from earth to highest sky, to feed on flowers and weeds of glorious feature, to taste whatever thing doth please the eye, who rest not pleased with such happiness, well worthy he to taste of wretchedness. Without air or light they grope their way underground, till they are made fierce with dark keeping. Their attention confined to the same dry, hard, mechanical subjects, which they have not the power nor the will to exchange for the others, frets and corrodes, and soured and disappointed, they wreak their spite and mortification on all around them. Rationalist, I cannot but think your imagination runs away with your candour. Surely the writers you are so ready to inveigh against labour hard to correct errors and reform grievances. Sentimentalist, yes, because the one affords exercise for their vanity, and the other for their spleen. They are attracted by the odour of abuses, and regale on fancied imperfections. But do you suppose they like anything else better than they do the government? Are they on any better terms with their own families or friends? Do they not make the lives of every one they come near a torment to them, with their pedantic notions and captious egotism? Do they not quarrel with their neighbours, placard their opponents, supplant those on their own side of the question? Are they not equally at war with the rich and the poor? And having failed, for the present, in their project of cashiering kings, do they not give scope to their troublesome, overbearing humour, by taking upon them to snub and lecture the poor gratis? Do they not wish to extend the greatest happiness to the greatest numbers, by putting a stop to population, to relieve distress by withholding charity, to remedy disease by shutting up hospitals? Is it not a part of their favourite scheme, their nostrum, their panacea, to prevent the miseries and casualties of human life, by extinguishing it in the birth? Do they not exult in the thought, and revile others who do not agree to it, of plucking the crutch from the cripple, and tearing off the bandages from the agonised limb? Is it thus they would gain converts, or make an effectual stand against acknowledged abuses? By holding up a picture of the opposite side, the most sordid, squalid, harsh and repulsive, that narrow reasoning, a want of imagination, and a profusion of bile can make it. There is not enough of evil already in the world, but we must harden our feelings against the miseries that daily, hourly, present themselves to our notice, and set our faces against everything that promises to afford any one the least gratification or pleasure. This is their idea of a perfect commonwealth, where each member performs his part in the machine, taking care of himself and no more concerned about his neighbours than the iron and woodwork, the pegs and nails in a spinning jenny. Good screw, good wedge, good tenpenny nail. Are they really in earnest, or are they bribed, partly by their interests, partly by the unfortunate bias of their minds, to play the game into the adversary's hands? It looks like it, and the government gives them good oeillade. Mr. Blackwood pats them on the back. Mr. Canning grants an interview and plays the amiable. Mr. Hobhouse keeps the peace. One of them has a place at the India House, but then nothing is said against the India House, though the poor and pious old lady sweats and almost swoons at the conversations which her walls are doomed to hear 
but of which she is ashamed to complain. One triumph of the school is to throw old ladies into hysterics. The obvious, I should still hope not the intentional, effect of the Westminster tactics, is to put every volunteer on the same side hors de combat, who is not a zealot of the strictest sect of those they call political economists, to come behind you with dastard, cold-blooded malice, and trip up the heels of those stragglers whom their friends and patrons in the quarterly have left still standing, to strip the cause of reform out of seeming affection to it, of everything like a mesalliance, with elegance, taste, decency, common sense, or polite literature, as their fellow labourers in the same vineyard had previously endeavoured to do out of acknowledged hatred, to discuss the friends of humanity, to cheer its enemies, and for the sake of indulging their unbridled dogmatism, envy, and uncharitableness, to leave nothing intermediate between the ultra-Toryism of the courtly scribes and their ultra-radicalism, between the extremes of practical wrong and impracticable right. Their our antagonists will be very well satisfied with this division of the spoil. Give them the earth, and any one who chooses may take possession of the moon for them. A rationalist. You allude to their attacks on the Edinburgh Review. A sentimentalist. And to their articles on Scott's novels. On hospitals, on national distress, on Moore's life of Sheridan and on every subject of taste, feeling, or common humanity. Sheridan, in particular, is termed an unsuccessful adventurer. How gently this Jacobin jargon will fall on ears polite. This is what they call attacking principles and sparing persons. They spare the persons, indeed, of men in power, who have places to give away, and attack the characters of the dead or the unsuccessful with impunity. Sheridan's brilliant talents his genius, his wit, his political firmness, which all but they admire, draw forth no passing tribute of admiration. His errors, his misfortunes, and his death, which all but they deplore, claim no pity. This indeed would be to understand the doctrine of utility to very little purpose, if it did not at the first touch weed from the breast every amiable weakness and imperfect virtue which had never taken root there but they make up for utter want of sympathy with the excellences or failings of others by a proportionable self-sufficiency. Sheridan, Fox, and Burke were mere tyros and schoolboys in politics, compared to them, who are the mighty landmarks of these latter times, ignorant of those principles of the greatest happiness to the greatest numbers, which a few and recent writers have promulgated. It is one way of raising a pure and lofty enthusiasm, as to the capacities of the human mind, to scorn all that has gone before us. Rather say this dwelling with overacted disgust on common frailties, and turning away with impatience from the brightest points of character, is a discipline of humanity, which should be confined as much as possible to the Westminster School. Believe me, their theories and their mode of enforcing them stand in the way of reform. Their philosophy is as little addressed to the head as to the heart, it is fit neither for man nor beast. It is not founded on any sympathy with the secret yearnings or higher tendencies of man's nature, but on a rankling antipathy to whatever is already best. Its object is to offend, its glory to find out and wound the tenderest part. What is not malice is cowardice and not candour. They attack the weak and spare the strong, to indulge their officiousness and add to their self-importance. Nothing is said in the Westminster Review of the treatment of Mr. Buckingham by the East India Company. It might lessen the writer's fear of utility, as Mr. Hall goes from Leicester to Bristol to save more souls. They do not grapple with the rich to wrest his superfluities from him. In this they might be foiled. But trample on the poor, a safe and pick thank office, and wrench his pittance from him with their logical instruments and lying arguments let their system succeed, as they pretend it would, and diffuse comfort and happiness around, and they would immediately turn against it as effeminate, insipid, and sickly, for their tastes and understandings are too strongly braced to endure any but the most unpalatable truths and the bitterest ingredients. 
their benefits are extracted by the caesarean operation their happiness in short is that which will never be just as their receipt for a popular article in a newspaper or review is one that will never be read their articles are never read and if they are not popular no others ought to be so the more any flimsy stuff is read and admired and the more service it does to the sale of a journal so much the more does it debauch the public taste and render it averse to their dry and solid lucubrations this is why they complain of the patronage of my sentimentalities as one of the sins of the edinburgh review and why they themselves are determined to drench the town with the most unsavoury truths without one drop of honey to sweeten the gall had they felt the least regard to the ultimate success of their principles of the greatest happiness to the greatest numbers though giving pain might be one paramount and primary motive they would have combined this object with something like the comfort and accommodation of their unenlightened readers rationalist i see no ground for this philippic except in your own imagination sentimentalist tell me do they not abuse poetry painting music is it think you for the pain or the pleasure these things give or because they are without eyes ears imaginations is that an excellence in them or the fault of these arts why do they treat shakespeare so cavalierly is there any one they would set up against him any sir richard blackmore they patronize or do they prefer racine as adam smith did before them or what are we to understand rationalist i can answer for it they do not wish to pull down shakespeare in order to set up racine on the ruins of his reputation they think little indeed of racine sentimentalist or of moliere either i suppose rationalist not much sentimentalist and yet these two contributed something to the greatest happiness of the greatest numbers that is to the amusement and delight of a whole nation for the last century and a half but that goes for nothing in the system of utility which is satisfied with nothing short of the good of the whole such benefactors of the species as shakespeare racine and moliere who sympathized with human character and feeling in their finest and liveliest moods can expect little favour from those few and recent writers who scorn the muse and whose philosophy is a dull antithesis to human nature unhappy they who lived before their time o oh, age of louis the fourteenth and of charles the second ignorant of the je ne sais quoi and of the savoir vivre o oh, paris built till now of mud athens rome zusa babylon palmyra barbarous structures of a barbarous period hide your diminished heads ye fens and dykes of holland ye mines of mexico what are ye worth o oh, bridges raised palaces adorned cities built fields cultivated without skill or science how came ye to exist till now o oh, pictures statues temples altars hearths the poet's verse and solemn breathing airs are ye not an insult on the great principles of few and recent writers how came ye to exist without their leave o oh, arkwright unacquainted with spinning jennies o oh, sir robert peel unversed in calico printing o oh, generation of upstarts what good could have happened before your time what ill can happen after it rationalist but at least you must allow the importance of first principles sentimentalist much as i respect a dealer in marine stores in old rags and iron both the goods and the principles are generally stolen i see advertised in the papers elements of political economy by james mill and principles of political economy by john mcculloch will you tell me in this case whose are the first principles which is the true simon pure strange that such difference should be twixt tweedledum and tweedledee rationalist you know we make it a rule to discountenance every attempt at wit as much as the world in general abhor a punster sentimentalist by your using the phrase attempts at wit it would seem that you admit there is a true and a false wit then why do you confound the distinction is this logical or even politic rationalist the difference is not worth attending to sentimentalist 
Still, I suppose you have a great deal of this quality, if you chose to exert it. Rationalist. I fancy not much. Sentimentalist. And yet you take upon you to despise it. I have sometimes thought that the great professors of the modern philosophy were hardly sincere in the contempt they express for poetry, painting, music, and the fine arts in general, that they were private amateurs and prodigious proficients under the rose, and like other lovers hid their passion as a weakness, that Mr. M. turned a barrel-organ, that Mr. P. warbled delightfully, that Mr. P. L. had a manuscript tragedy by him called The Last Man, which he withheld from the public not to compromise the dignity of philosophy by affording any one the smallest actual satisfaction during the term of his natural life. Rationalist. Oh, no! You are quite mistaken in this supposition, if you are at all serious in it. So far from being proficients, or having wasted their time in these trifling pursuits, I believe not one of the persons you have named has the least taste or capacity for them, or any idea corresponding to them, except Mr. Bentham, who is fond of music, and says with his usual bonhomie, which seems to increase with his age, that he does not see why others should not find an agreeable recreation in poetry and painting. Sentimentalist. You are sure this cynical humour of theirs is not affectation, at least? Rationalist. I am quite sure of it. Sentimentalist. Then I am sure it is intolerable presumption in them to think their want of taste and knowledge qualifies them to judge ex cathedra of these arts, or is a standard by which to measure the degree of interest which others do or ought to take in them. It is the height of impertinence, mixed up with the worst principle. As to the excesses or caprices of posthumous fame, like other commodities, it soon finds its level in the market. Dato optimo is a tolerably general rule. It is not of forced or factitious growth. People would not trouble their heads about Shakespeare, if he had given them no pleasure, or cry him up to the skies, if he had not first raised them there. The world are not grateful for nothing. Shakespeare, it is true, had the misfortune to be born before our time, and is not one of those few and recent writers who monopolise all true greatness and wisdom, though not the reputation of it, to themselves. He need not, however, be treated with contumely on this account. The instance might be passed over as a solitary one. We shall have a thousand political economists before we have another Shakespeare. End of section 21section 22 of the plain speaker this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by nicole lee the plain speaker Opinions on Books, Men, and Things by William Hazlitt Section 22 The New School of Reform A Dialogue Between a Rationalist and a Sentimentalist Part 2 Rationalist Your mode of arriving at conclusions is very different, I confess, from the one to which I have been accustomed and is too wild and desultory for me to follow it. Allow me to ask in my turn. Do you not admit utility to be the test of morals, as reason is the test of utility? Sentimentalist. Pray, what definition have you, in the school, of reason and of utility? Rationalist. Nay, they require no definition. The meaning of both is obvious. Sentimentalist. Indeed, it is easy to dogmatise without definitions, and to repeat broad assertions without understanding them. Nothing is so convenient as to begin with gravely assuming our own infallibility, and we can then utter nothing but oracles, of course. Rationalist. 
what is it you understand by reason sentimentalist it is your business to answer the question but still if you choose i will take the onus upon myself and interpret for you rationalist i have no objection if you do it fairly sentimentalist you shall yourself be judge reason with most people means their own opinion and i do not find your friends a particular exception to the rule their dogmatical tone their arrogance their supercilious treatment of the pretensions of others their vulgar conceit and satisfaction in their own vulgar tenets so far from convincing me that they are right convince me that they must be wrong except by accident or by mechanically parroting others for no one ever thought for himself or looked attentively at truth and nature that did not feel his own insufficiency and the difficulty and delicacy of his task self-knowledge is the first step to wisdom the rational dissenters who took this title as a characteristic distinction and who professed an entire superiority over prejudice and superstition of all sorts were as little disposed to have their opinions called in question as any people i ever knew one of their preachers thanked god publicly for having given them a liberal religion so your school thank god in their hearts for having given them a liberal philosophy though what with them passes for liberal is considered by the rest of the world as very much akin to illiberality rationalist may i beseech you to come to the point at once sentimentalist we shall be there soon enough without hurrying reason i conceive in the sense that you would appeal to it may signify any one of three things all of them insufficient as tests and standards of moral sentiment or if that word displeases of moral conduct one abstract truth as distinct from local impressions or individual partialities two calm inflexible self-will as distinct from passion three dry matter of fact or reality as distinct from sentimentality or poetry rationalist let me hear your objections but do for once adhere to the track you have chalked out sentimentalist thereafter as it happens you may drag your grating go-cart of crude assumptions and heavy paralogisms along your narrow iron railway if you please but let me diverge down primrose paths or break my neck over precipices as i think proper rationalist take your own course a wilful man must have his way you demur if i apprehend you right to founding moral rectitude on the mere dictates of the understanding this i grant to be the grand arcanum of the doctrine of utility i desire to know what other foundation for morals you will find so solid sentimentalist i know of none so flimsy what would you suspend all the natural and private affections on the mere logical deductions of the understanding and accentuate the former of all the force tenderness and constancy they derive from habit local nearness or immediate sympathy because the last are contrary to the speculative reason of the thing i am afraid such a speculative morality will end in speculation or in something worse am i to feel no more for a friend or a relative say than for an inhabitant of china or of the moon because as a matter of argument or setting aside their connection with me and considered absolutely in themselves the objects are perhaps of equal value 
or am I to screw myself up to feel as much for the antipodes, or God knows who, as for my next-door neighbours, by such a forced intellectual scale? The last is impossible, and the result of the attempt will be to make the balance even by a diminution of our natural sensibility, instead of a universal and unlimited enlargement of our philosophic benevolence. The feelings cannot be made to keep pace with our bare knowledge of existence or of truth, nor can the affections be disjoined from the impressions of time, place, and circumstance, without destroying their vital principle. Yet, without the sense of pleasure and pain, I do not see what becomes of the theory of utility, which first reduces everything to pleasure and pain and then tramples upon and crushes these by its own sovereign will. The effect of this system is like the touch of the torpedo to chill and paralyse. We notwithstanding find persons acting upon it with exemplary coolness and self-complacency. One of these subtilised savages informs another who drops into his shop that news is come of the death of his eldest daughter adding, as matter of boast, I am the only person in the house who will eat any dinner to-day. They do not understand the doctrine of utility. I perceive this illustration is not quite to your taste. Rationalist. Is it anything more than the old doctrine of the Stoics? Sentimentalist. I thought the system had been wholly new, the notable project of a few and recent writers, I could furnish you with another parallel passage in The Hypocrite. Rationalist. Is it not as well on any system to suppress the indulgence of inordinate grief and violent passion that is as useless to the dead as it is hurtful to the living? Sentimentalist. If we could indulge our affections while they run on smoothly, and discard them from our breasts the instant they fail of their objects, it might be well. But the feelings, the habitual and rooted sentiments of the soul, are not the creatures of choice or of a fanciful theory. To take the utmost possible interest in an object, and be utterly and instantaneously indifferent to the loss of it, is not exactly in the order of human nature. We may blunt or extirpate our feelings altogether, with proper study and pains, by ill-humour, conceit and affectation, but not make them the playthings of a verbal paradox. I fancy if Mr. X had lost a hundred pounds by a bad debt, or if a lump of soot had fallen into his broth, it would have spoiled his dinner. The doctrine of utility would not have come to his aid here. It is reserved for great and trying occasions, or serves as an excuse for not affecting grief, which its professors do not feel. So much for reason against passion. Rationalist. But if they do not possess all the softness and endearing charities of private life, they have the firmness and unflinching hardihood of patriotism and devotion to the public cause. Sentimentalist, that is what I have yet to learn. They are a kind of Ishmaelites, whose hand is against others. What or who they are for, except themselves, I do not know. They do not willingly come forward into the front, nor even show themselves in the rear of the battle, but are very ready to denounce and disable those who are indiscreet enough to do so. They are not for precipitating a crisis, but for laying down certain general principles, which will do posterity a world of good, and themselves no harm. They are a sort of occult reformers, and patriots incognito. They get snug places under government, and mar popular elections. But it is to advance the good of the cause. Their theories are as a whole and as sleek as their skins, but that there is a certain jejuneness and poverty in both, 
which prevents their ever putting on a wholesome or comfortable appearance. Rationalist. But at least you will not pretend to deny the distinction, you just now hinted at, between things of real utility and merely fanciful interest. Sentimentalist. No. I admit that distinction to the full. I only wish you and others not to mistake it. Rationalist. I have not the slightest guess at what you mean. Sentimentalist. Is there any possible view of the subject that has not been canvassed over and over again in the school? Or do you pass over all possible objections as the dreams of idle enthusiasts? Let me ask, have you not a current dislike to anything in the shape of sentiment or sentimentality? For with you they are the same. Yet a thing and the cant about it are not the same. The cant about utility does not destroy its essence. What do you mean by sentimentality? Rationalist. I do not know. Sentimentalist. Well, you complain, however, that things of the greatest use in reality are not always of the greatest importance in an imaginary and romantic point of view. Rationalist. Certainly. This is the very pivot of all our well-grounded censure and dissatisfaction with poetry, novel writing, and other things of that flimsy, unmeaning stamp. Sentimentalist. It appears, then, that there are two standards of value and modes of appreciation in human life, the one practical, the other ideal that that which is of the greatest moment to the understanding is often of little or none at all to the fancy, and vice versa. Why then force these two standards into one, or make the understanding judge of what belongs to the fancy, any more than the fancy judge of what belongs to the understanding? Poetry would make bad mathematics, mathematics bad poetry. Why jumble them together? Leave things that are so separate. Quique tribuito suum. Rationalist. I do not yet comprehend your precise drift. Sentimentalist. Nay, then, you will not. It is granted that a certain thing, in itself highly useful, does not afford as much pleasure to the imagination, or excite as much interest as it ought to do, or as some other thing which is of less real and practical value. But why ought it to excite this degree of interest, if it is not its nature to do so? Why not set it down to its proper account of utility in any philosophical estimate? Let it go for what it is worth there, valeat quantum valet and let the other less worthy and, if you will, more meretricious object be left free to produce all the sentiment and emotion it is capable of, and which the former is inadequate to, and its value be estimated accordingly. Rationalist. Will you favour me with an illustration, with anything like common sense? Sentimentalist. A table. A chair, a fire shovel, a Dutch stove are useful things, but they do not excite much sentiment. They are not confessedly the poetry of human life. Rationalist. No. Sentimentalist. Why then endeavour to make them so, or, in other words, to make them more than they are or can become? A lute, a sonnet, a picture... The sound of distant bells can and do excite an emotion, do appeal to the fancy and the heart. Excuse this antiquated phraseology. Why then grudge them the pleasure they give to the human mind, and which it seems on the very face of the argument, your objects of mere downright utility, which are not also objects of imagination, cannot 
Why must I come to your shop, though you expressly tell me you have not the article I want? Or why swear, with Lord Peter, in the tale of a tub, that your loaf of brown bread answers all the purposes of mutton? Why deprive life of what cheers and adorns, more than of what supports it? A chair is good to sit in, as a matter of fact, a table to write on, a fire to warm oneself by. No one disputes it. But at the same time, I want something else to amuse and occupy my mind. Something that stirs the breath of fancy. Something that but to think of is to feel an interest in. Besides my automatic existence, I have another, a sentimental one, which must be nourished and supplied with proper food. This end, the mere circumstance of practical or real utility, does not answer, and therefore is so far good for nothing. Rationalist. But is it not to be feared that this preference should be carried to excess, and that the essential should be neglected for the frivolous? Sentimentalist. I see no disposition in mankind to neglect the essential. Necessity has no choice. They pursue the mechanical mechanically, as Puss places herself by the fireside and snuffs up the warmth. They dream over the romantic. And when their dreams are golden ones, it is pity to disturb them. There is as little danger as possible of excess here, for the interest in things merely ideal can be only in proportion to the pleasure, that is, the real benefit which attends them. A calculation of consequences may deceive. The impulses of passion may hurry us away. Sentiment alone is infallible, since it centres and reposes on itself. Like mercy, its quality is not strained. It droppeth as the gentle dew from heaven upon the place beneath. Rationalist. You have asked me what reason is. May I ask you what it is that constitutes sentiment? Sentimentalist. I have told you what reason is. You should tell me what sentiment is. Or I will give your learned professors and profound encyclopedists who lay down laws for the human mind without knowing any of the springs by which it acts five years to make even a tolerable guess at what it is in objects that produces the fine flower of sentiment and what it is that leaves only the husk and stalk of utility behind it. Rationalist. They are much obliged to you, but I fancy their time is better employed. Sentimentalist. What? In ringing the changes on the same cant phrases, one after the other, in newspapers, reviews, lectures, octavo volumes, examinations, and pamphlets, and seeing no more of the matter all the while than a blind horse in a mill. Rationalist. I have already protested against this personality, but surely you would not put fiction on a par with reality. Sentimentalist. My good friend. Let me give you an instance of my way of thinking on this point. I met Dignam, the singer, in the street the other day. He was humming a tune, and his eye, though quenched, was smiling. I could scarcely forbear going up to speak to him. Why so? I had seen him in the year 1792, the first time I ever was at a play, with Suet and Miss Romanzini, and some others, in No Song, No Supper, and ever since, that bright vision of my childhood has played round my fancy with unabated, vivid delight. Yet the whole was fictitious, your cynic philosophers will say. I wish there were but a few realities that lasted so long, and were followed with so little disappointment. The imaginary is what we conceive to be. It is reality that tantalizes us, 
and turns out a fiction. That is the false Florimel. Rationalist. But the political economists, in directing the attention to the greatest happiness of the greatest numbers, wish to provide for the solid comforts and amelioration of human life. Sentimentalist. Yes, in a very notable way, after their fashion. I should not expect from men who are jealous of the mention of anything like enjoyment, any great anxiety, about its solid comforts. Theirs is a very comfortable theory indeed. They would starve the poor outright, reduce their wages to what is barely necessary to keep them alive, and if they cannot work, refuse them a morsel for charity. If you hint at any other remedy but the grinding law of necessity, suspended in terrorem over the poor, they are in agonies, and think their victims are escaping them. If you talk of the pressure of debt and taxes, they regard you as a very commonplace person indeed, and say they can show you cases in the reign of Edward the Third, where, without any reference to debt or taxes, the price of labour was tripled, after a plague. So full is their imagination of this desolating doctrine, that sees no hope of good but in cutting off the species, that they fly to a pestilence as a resource against all our difficulties. If we had but a pestilence, it would demonstrate all their theories. Rationalist. Leave political economy to those who profess it, and come back to your mystical metaphysics. Do you not place actual sensations before sentimental refinements, and think the former the first things to be attended to in a sound moral system? Sentimentalist. I place the heart in the centre of my moral system, and the senses and the understanding are its two extremities. You leave nothing but gross, material objects, as the ends of pursuit, and the dry, formal calculations of the understanding, as the means of ensuring them. Is this enough? Is man a mere animal, or a mere machine, for philosophical experiments? All that is intermediate between these two is sentiment. I do not wonder you sometimes feel a vacuum, which you endeavour to fill up with spleen and misanthropy. Can you divest the mind of habit, memory, imagination, foresight, will? Can you make it go on physical sensations, or on abstract reason alone, not without making it over again? As it is constituted, reflection recalls what sense has once embodied. Imagination weaves a thousand associations round it, Time endears, regret, hope, fear, innumerable shapes of uncertain good still hover near it. I hear the sound of village bells. It opens all the cells where memory slept. I see a well-known prospect. My eyes are dim with manifold recollections. What say you? Am I only as a rational being to hear the sound, to see the object with my bodily sense, is all the rest to be dissolved as an empty delusion by the potent spell of unsparing philosophy? Or rather, have not a thousand real feelings and incidents hung upon these impressions, of which such dim traces and doubtful suggestions are all that is left? And is it not better that truth and nature should speak this imperfect but heartfelt language than be entirely dumb? And should we not preserve and cherish this precious link that connects together the finer essence of our past and future being by some expressive symbol, rather than suffer all that cheers and sustains life to fall into the dregs of material sensations and blindfold ignorance? There now is half a definition of sentiment, for the other half we must wait till we see the article in the Scotch Encyclopedia on the subject. To deprive man of sentiment, 
is to deprive him of all that is interesting to himself or others, except the present object and a routine of cant phrases, and to turn him into a savage, an automaton, or a political economist. Nay, more, if we are to feel or do nothing for which we cannot assign a precise reason, why, we cannot so much as walk, speak, hear, or see, without the same unconscious implicit faith. Not a word, not a sentence, but hangs together by a number of imperceptible links, and is a bundle of prejudices and abstractions. Rationalist. I can make nothing of you or your arguments. Sentimentalist. All I would say is that you cannot take the measure of human nature with a pair of compasses or a slip of parchment. Nor do I think it an auspicious opening to the new political millennium to begin with setting our faces against all that has hitherto kindled the enthusiasm, or shutting the door against all that may in future give pleasure to the world. Your Elysium resembles Dante's Inferno. Who enters there must leave all hope behind. Rationalist. The poets have spoiled you for all rational and sober views of men and society. Sentimentalist. I had rather be wrong with them than right with some other persons that I could mention. I do not think you have shown much tact or consecutiveness of reasoning in your defence of the system, but you have only to transcribe the trite arguments on the subject, set your own and a bookseller's name to them, and pass off for the head of a school and one of the great lights of the age. End of section 22、section 23 of The Plain Speaker. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mark Michelson. The Plain Speaker Opinions on Books, Men, and Things by William Hazlitt. Section 23 on the qualifications necessary to success in life. Part 1. On the qualifications necessary to success in life. It is curious to consider the diversity of men's talents, and the causes of their failure or success, which are not less numerous and contradictory than their pursuits in life. Fortune does not always smile on merit. The race is not to the swift, nor the battle to the strong and even where the candidate for wealth or honors succeeds, it is as often perhaps from the qualifications which he wants as from those which he possesses, or the eminence which he is lucky enough to attain is owing to some faculty or acquirement, which neither he nor anybody else suspected. There is a balance of power in the human mind, by which defects frequently assist in furthering our views. As superfluous excellence are converted into the nature of impediments, and again there is a continual substitution of one talent for another, through which we mistake the appearance for the reality, and judge, by implication, of the means from the end. So a minister of state wields the House of Commons by his manner alone, while his friends and his foes are equally at a loss to account for his influence looking for it in vain in the matter of style of his speeches. So the air with which a celebrated barrister waved a white Cambria handkerchief passed for eloquence. So the buffoon is taken for a wit. To be thought wise, it is for the most part only to seem so. And the noisy demagogue is easily translated, by the popular voice, into the orator and patriot. Qualities take their color from those that are next to them, as the chameleon borrows its hue from the nearest object, and unable otherwise to grasp the phantom of our choice or our ambition. We do well to lay our violent hands on something else within our reach, which bears a general resemblance to it, and the impression of which, in proportion as the thing itself is cheap and worthless, is likely to be gross, obvious, striking, and effectual. The way to secure success is to be more anxious about obtaining than about deserving it. The surest hindrance to it is to have too high a standard of refinement, 
in our own minds, or too high an opinion of the discernment of the public. He who is determined not to be satisfied with anything short of perfection will never do anything at all, either to please himself or others. The question is not what we ought to do, but what we can do for the best. An excess of modesty is in fact an excess of pride, and more hurtful to the individual, and less advantageous to society, than the grossest and most unblushing vanity. Aspiring to be gods, if angels fell, aspiring to be angels, men rebel. If a celebrated artist in our day had stayed to do justice to his principal figure in a generally admired painting, before he had exhibited it, it would have never seen the light. He has passed on to other things more within his power to accomplish, and more within the competence of the spectators to understand. They see what he has done, which is a great deal. They could not have judged of, or given him credit for, the ineffable idea in his own mind which he might vainly have devoted his whole life in endeavoring to embody. The picture, as it is, is good enough for the age and for the public. If it had been ten times better, its merits would have been thrown away. If it had been ten times better in the more refined and lofty conception of character and sentiment, and had failed in the more palpable appeal to the senses and prejudices of the vulgar, in the usual appliances and means to boot, it would never have done. The work might have been praised by a few, a very few, and the artist himself have pined in penury and neglect. Mr. Wordsworth has given us the essence of poetry in his works without the machinery. The apparatus of poetic diction, the theatrical pomp, the conventional ornaments, and we see what he has made of it. The weight of fame through merit alone is the narrowest, the steepest, the longest, the hardest of all others. That it is the most certain and lasting is even in doubt. The most sterling reputation is, after all, but a species of imposture. As for ordinary cases of success and failure, they depend on the slightest shades of character or turn of accident some trick not worth an egg. There's but the twinkling of a star, betwixt a man of peace and war, a thief and justice, fool and knave, a huffing officer and a slave, a crafty lawyer and pickpocket, a great philosopher and a blockhead, a formal preacher and a player, a learned physician and manslayer. Men are in numberless instances qualified for certain things for no other reason than because they are qualified for nothing else. Negative merit is the passport to negative success. In common life, the narrowness of our ideas and appetites is more favorable to the accomplishment of our designs, by confining our attention and ambition to one single object, than a greater enlargement of comprehension or susceptibility of taste, which, as far as the trammels of custom and routine of business are concerned, only operate as diversions to our ensuring the main chance, and, even in the pursuit of arts and science, a dull, plodding fellow will often do better than one of a more mercurial and fiery cast. The mere unconsciousness of his own deficiencies, or of anything beyond what he himself can do, reconciles him to his mechanical progress, and enables him to perform all that lies in his power, with labor and patience. By being content with mediocrity, he advances beyond it, whereas the man of a greater taste, or genius, may be supposed to fling down his pen or pencil in despair, haunted with the idea of unattainable excellence, and ends in being nothing, because he cannot be everything at once. Those even who have done the greatest things were not always perhaps the greatest men. To do any given work, a man should not be greater in himself than the work he has to do. The faculties which he has beyond this will be facilities to let, either not used or used idly and unprofitably, to hinder, not to help. To do any one thing best, there should be an exclusiveness, a concentration, a bigotry, a blindness of attachment to that one object, so that the widest range of knowledge and most diffusive subtlety of intellect will not uniformly produce the most beneficial results.
and the performance is very frequently in the inverse ratio, not only of the pretensions, as we might superficially conclude, but of the real capacity. A part is greater than the whole, and this old saying seems to hold true in moral and intellectual questions also. In nearly all that relates to the mind of man, which cannot embrace the whole, but only a part. I do not think, to give an instance or two of what I mean, that Milton's mind was, so to speak, greater than the paradise lost. It was just big enough to fill that mighty mold. The shrine contained the Godhead. Shakespeare's genius was, I should say, greater than anything he has done, because it still soared free and unconfined beyond whatever he undertook, ran over and could not be constrained by mastery of his subject. Goldsmith, in his retaliation, celebrates Burke as one who was kept back in his dazzling wayward career by the supererogation of his talents, though equal to all things, for all things unfit, too nice for a statesman, too proud for a wit. Dr. Johnson, in Boswell's life, tells us that the only person whose conversation he ever sought for improvement was George Salmanser, yet who knows anything of this extraordinary man now, but that he wrote about twenty volumes of the universal history, invented a Formosan alphabet and vocabulary, being a really learned man, contrived to pass for an impostor, and died no one knows how or where. The well-known author of the inquiry concerning political justice, in conversation has not a word to throw at a dog. All the stores of his understanding or genius he reserves for his books, and he has need of them, otherwise there would be a hiatus in manuscriptus. He says little, and that little were better left alone, being both dull and nonsensical. His talk is as flat as a pancake. There is no leaven in it. He has not dough enough to make a loaf and a cake. He has no idea of anything till he is wound up, like a clock, not to speak, but to write, and then he seems like a person risen from sleep, or from the dead. The author of The Diversions of Purley, on the other hand, besides being the inventor of the theory of grammar, was a politician, a wit, a master of conversation, and overflowing with an indeterminable babble. That fellow had cut and come again in him, and tongue with a garnish of brains, but it only served as an excuse to cheat posterity of the definition of a verb, by one of those conversational ruse de guerre, by which he put off his guest at Wimbledon with some teasing equivoque, which he would explain the next time they met, and made him die at last with a nostrum in his mouth. The late Professor Porson was said to be a match for the member of Old Sarum in argument and raillery. He was a profound scholar, and had a wit at will. Yet what did it come to? His jest have evaporated with marks of the wine on the tavern table, the page of Thucydides or Aeschylus, which was stamped on his brain, and which he could read there with equal facility backwards or forwards, is contained after his death, as it was while he lived, just as well in the volume of the library shelf. The man of perhaps the greatest ability now living is the one who has not only done the least, but who is actually incapable of ever doing anything worthy of him, unless he had a hundred hands to write with, and a hundred mouths to utter all that it hath entered into his heart to conceive, and centuries before him to embody the endless volume of his waking dreams. Cloud rolls over cloud, one train of thought suggests and is driven away by another. Theory after theory is spun out of the bowels of his brain, not like the spider's web, compact and round, a citadel and a snare, built for mischief and for use, but like the gossamer, stretched out and entangled without end, clinging to every casual object, flitting in the idle air, and glittering only in the ray of fancy. No subject can come amiss to him, and he is alike attracted and alike indifferent to all. He is not tied down to any one particular but floats from one to another, his mind everywhere, finding its level, and feeling no limit but that of thought, now soaring with its head above the stars, now treading with fairy feet among flowers, now winnowing the air with winged words, passing from Dun Scotus to Jacob Bayman, from the Kantian philosophy to a conundrum, 
and from the apocalypse to an acrostic taking in the whole range of poetry painting wit history politics metaphysics criticism and private scandal every question giving birth to some new thought and every thought discoursed in eloquent music that lives only in the ear of fools or in the report of absent friends set him to write a book and he belies all that has ever been said about him ten thousand great ideas filled his mind but with the clouds they fled and left no trace behind now there is who never had an idea in his life and who therefore has never been prevented by the fastidious refinements of self-knowledge or the dangerous seductions of the muse from succeeding in a number of things which he has attempted to the utmost extent of his dullness and contrary to the advice and opinion of all his friends he has written a book without being able to spell by dint of asking questions has painted draperies with great exactness which have passed for finished portraits daubs in an unaccountable figure or two with a background and on due deliberation calls it history he is dubbed an associate after being twenty times blackballed wins his way to the highest honors of the academy through all the gradations of discomfiture and disgrace and may end in being a foreign count and yet such is the principle of distributed justice in matters of taste he is just where he was we judge of men not what they do but by what they are non exquilibet ligno fit mercurius having once got an idea of it is impossible that anything he can do should ever alter it though he would paint like raphael and michelangelo no one in the secret would give him credit for it and though he had all knowledge and could speak with the tongues of angels yet without genius he would be nothing the original sin of being what he is renders his good works and most meritorious efforts null and void you cannot gather grapes of thorns nor figs of thistles nature still prevails over art you look at as you do at a curious machine which performs certain puzzling operations and as your surprise ceases gradually unfolds other powers which you would little expect but do what it will it is but a machine still the thing is without a soul respice finem is the great rule in all practical pursuits to attain our journey's end we should look little to the right or to the left the knowledge of excellence as often deters and distracts as it stimulates the mind to exertion and hence we may see some reason why the general diffusion of taste and liberal arts is not always accompanied with an increase of individual genius as there is a degree of dullness and phlegm which in the long run sometimes succeed better than the more noble and aspiring impulses of our nature as the beagle by its sure tracing overtakes the bounding stag so there is a degree of animal spirits and showy accomplishment which enables its possessors to get the start of the majestic world and bear the palm alone how often do we see vivacity and impertinence mistaken for wit fluency for argument sound for sense a loud or musical voice for eloquence impudence again is an equivalent for courage and the assumption of merit and the possession of it are too often considered as one and the same thing on the other hand simplicity of manner reduces the person who cannot so far forego his native disposition as by any effort to shake it off to perfect insignificance in the eyes of the vulgar who if you do not seem to doubt your own pretensions will never question them and on the same principle if you do not try to palm yourself on them for what you are not will never be persuaded that you can be anything admiration like mocking is catching and the good opinion which gets abroad of us begins at home if a man is not so much astonished at his own acquirements as proud of and as delighted with the bauble as others would be if put into sudden possession of it they hold that true desert and he must be strangers to each other if he entertains an idea beyond his own immediate profession or pursuit they think very wisely he can know nothing at all if he does not play off the quack or the coxum among them at every step 
they are confident he is a dunce and a fellow of no pretensions. It has been sometimes made a matter of surprise that Mr. Pitt did not talk politics out of the house, or that Mr. Fox conversed like anyone else on common subjects, or that Sir Walter Scott is fonder of an old Scotch ditty or an antiquarian record than of listening to the praises of the author of Waverley. On the contrary, I cannot conceive how any one who feels conscious of certain powers should always be laboring to convince others of the fact, or how a person, to whom their exercise is as familiar as the breath he draws, should think it worth his while to convince them of what to him must seem very simple, and at the same time so very evident. I should not wonder, however, if the author of the Scotch novels laid an undue stress on the praises of the monastery. We nurse the rickety child, and prop up our want of self-confidence by the opinion of friends. A man, unless he is a fool, is never vain, but when he stands in need of the tribute of adulation, to strengthen the hollowness of his pretensions, nor conceited, but when he can find no one to flatter him, and is obliged secretly to pamper his good opinion of himself, to make up for the want of sympathy in others, a damned author has the highest sense of his own merits, and has an inexpressible contempt for the judgment of his contemporaries, in the same manner that an actor who is hissed or hooted from the stage creeps into exquisite favor with himself, in proportion to the blindness and injustice of the public. A prose writer, who has been severely handled in the reviews, will try to persuade himself that there is nobody else who can write a word of English, and we have seen a poet of our time, whose works have been much, but not, as he thought, sufficiently admired, undertake formally to prove that no poet, who deserved the name of one, was ever popular in his lifetime, or scarcely after his death. End of section 23, part 1section 24 of the plain speaker this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by mark michelson the plain speaker opinions on books men and things by william hazlitt section 24 on the qualifications necessary to success in life part 2 there is nothing that floats a man sooner into the tide of reputation, or oftener passes current for genius, than what might be called constitutional talent. A man without this, whatever may be his worth or real powers, will no more get on in the world than a leaden mercury will fly into the air. As any pretender with it, and with no one quality beside to recommend him, will be sure either to blunder upon success or will set failure at defiance. By constitutional talent I mean, in general, the warmth and vigor given to a man's ideas and pursuits by his bodily stamina, by mere physical organization. A weak mind in a sound body is better, or at least more profitable, than a sound mind in a weak and crazy confirmation. How many instances might I quote? Let a man have a quick circulation, a good digestion, the bulk and thews and sinews of a man, and the alacrity, the unthinking confidence inspired by these, and without an atom, a shadow of the mens de venoir, he shall strut and swagger and vapor and jostle his way through life, and have the upper hand of those who are his betters in everything but health and strength. His jest shall be echoed with loud laughter, because his own lungs begin to crow like Chanticleer, before he has uttered them, while a little hectic nervous humorist shall stammer out an admirable conceit that is damned in the doubtful delivery, vox fossibit hasit. The first shall test a story as long as his arm, without interruption, while the latter stops short in his attempts from mere weakness of chest. The one shall be empty and noisy and successful in argument, putting forth the most commonplace things, with a confident brow and throng of words that come with more than impudent sauciness from him, while the latter shrinks from an observation 
too deep for his hearers, into the delicacy and unnoticed retirement of his own mind. The one shall never feel the want of intellectual resources, because he can back his opinions with his person. The other shall lose the advantages of mental superiority, seek to anticipate contempt by giving offense, court mortification in despair of popularity, and even in the midst of public and private admiration, extorted slowly by incontrovertible proofs of genius, shall never get rid of the awkward, uneasy sense of personal weakness and insignificance, contracted by early and long-continued habit. What imports the inward to the outward man, when it is the last that is general and inevitable but of ridicule or object of admiration? It has been said that a good face is a letter of recommendation, but the finest face will not carry a man far, unless it is set upon an active body and a stout pair of shoulders. The countenance is the index of a man's talents and attainments. His figure is the criterion of his progress through life. We may have seen faces that spoke. A soul as fair, bright as the children of yon azur sheen, yet that met with but an indifferent reception in the world, and that being supported by a couple of spindle shanks and a weak stomach, in fulfilling what was expected of them, fell flat and shamed their worshippers. Hence the successes of such persons did not correspond with their deserts. There was a natural contradiction between the physiognomy of their minds and bodies. The phrase, a good-looking man, means different things in town and country, and artists have a separate standard of beauty from other people. A country squire is thought good-looking, who is in good condition like his horse. A country farmer, to take the neighbor's eyes, must seem stall-fed, like the prize ox. They ask, how he cuts up in the call, how he tallows in the kidneys. The letter of recommendation face, in general, is not one that expresses the finer movements of thought or of the soul, but that makes part of a vigorous and healthy form. It is one in which Cupid and Mars take up their quarters, rather than Saturn or Mercury. It may be objected here that some of the greatest favorites of fortune have been little men. A little man, but of high fancy, is Stern's description of Mr. Hammond Shandy. But then they have been possessed of strong fibers and an iron constitution. The late Mr. West said that Bonaparte was the best-made man he ever saw in his life. In other cases, the gauntlet of contempt, which a puny body and a fiery spirit are forced to run, may determine the possessors to aim at great actions. Indignation may make men heroes as well as poets, and thus revenge them on the niggardliness of nature and the prejudices of the world. I remember Mr. Wordsworth saying that he thought ingenious poets had been of small and delicate frames, like Pope, but that the greatest, such as Shakespeare and Milton, had been healthy and cast in a larger and handsomer mold. So were Titian, Raphael, and Michelangelo. This is one of the few observations of Mr. Wordsworth's I recollect worth quoting, and I accordingly set it down as his, because I understand he is tenacious on that point. In love, in war, in conversation, in business, confidence and resolution are the principal things. Hence the poet's reasoning. For women, born to be controlled, affect the loud, the vain, the bold. Nor is this peculiar to them, but runs all through life. It is the opinion we appear to entertain of ourselves, from which, thinking we must be the best judges of our own merits, Others accept their idea of us on trust. It is taken for granted that every one pretends to the utmost he can do, and he who pretends to little is supposed capable of nothing. The humility of our approaches to power or beauty ensures a repulse, and repulse makes us unwilling to renew the application, for there is pride as well as humility in this habitual backwardness and reserve. If you do not bully the world, they will be sure to insult over you, because they think that they can do it with impunity. They insist upon the arrogant assumption of superiority somewhere, and if you do not prevent them, they will practice it on you. Someone must top the part of captain in the play. Servility, however, chimes in 
and play scrub in the farce. Men patronize the fawning and obsequious, as they submit to the vain and boastful. It is the air of modesty and independence, which will neither be put upon itself, nor put upon others, that they cannot endure, that excites all the indignation that they should feel for pompous affectation, and all the contempt they do not show to meanness and duplicity. Our indolence, and perhaps our envy, take part with our cowardice and vanity in all this. The obtrusive claims of empty ostentation, played off like the ring on the finger, fluttering and sparkling in our sight, relieve us from the irksome task of seeking out obscure merit. The scroll of virtues written on the bold front, or triumphing in the laughing eye, save us the trouble of sifting the evidence and deciding for ourselves. Besides, our self-love receives a less sensible shock from encountering the mere semblance than the solid substance of worth. Folly chuckles to find the blockhead put over the wise man's head, and cunning winks to see the knave, by his own good leave, transformed into a saint. Doubtless the pleasure is as great in being cheated as to cheat. In all cases, there seems a sort of compromise, a principle of collusion between impostor and credulity. If you ask what sort of adventurers have swindled tradesmen of their goods, you will find they are all likely men, with plausible manners or a handsome equipage, hired on purpose. If you ask what sort of gallants have robbed women of their hearts, you will find they are those who have jilted hundreds before from which the willing fair conceives the project of fixing the truant to herself. So the bird flutters its idle wings in the jaws of destruction, and the foolish moth rushes into the flame that consumes it. There is no trusting to appearances, we are told, but this maxim is of no avail, for men are the eager dupes of them. Life, it has been said, is the art of being well deceived, and accordingly, Hypocrisy seems to be the great business of mankind. The game of fortune is, for the most part, set up with counters, so that he who will not cut in because he has no gold in his pocket must sit out above half his time and lose his chance of sweeping the tables. Delicacy is, in ninety-nine cases out of a hundred, considered as rusticity, and sincerity of purpose is the greatest affront that can be offered to society. To insist on simple truth is to disqualify yourself for place or patronage. The less you deserve, the more merit in their encouraging you. And he who, in the struggle for distinction, trusts to realities and not to appearances, will in the end find himself the object of universal hatred and scorn. A man who thinks to gain and keep the public ear by the force of style will find it very uphill work. If you wish to pass for a great author, you ought not look as if you were ignorant that you had ever written a sentence or discovered a single truth. If you keep your own secret, be assured the world will keep it for you. A writer whom I know very well, footnote one, himself, ed, and a footnote, cannot gain an admission to Drury Lane Theatre, because he does not lounge into the lobbies or sup at the Shakespeare. Nay, the same person having written upwards of sixty columns of original matter on politics, criticism, Bell's letters, and virtue in a respectable morning paper, footnote two, the morning chronicle, ed, end of footnote, in a single half year was at the end of the period on applying for a renewal of his engagement, told by the editor, he might give in a specimen of what he could do. One would think sixty columns of the Morning Chronicle were a sufficient specimen of what a man could do. But while this person was thinking of his next answer to Vetus, footnote one, this series of papers will be found reprinted in Political Essays, 1819, E.D., end of footnote, or his account of Mr. Keene's performance in Hamlet, he had neglected to point the toe, to hold up his head higher than usual, having acquired a habit of poring over books when young, and to get a new velvet collar to an old-fashioned great coat. These are the graceful ornaments to the columns of a newspaper, the Corinthian capitals of a polished style. This unprofitable servant of the press 
found no difference in himself before or after he became known to the readers of the Morning Chronicle, and it accordingly made no difference in his appearance or pretensions. Don't you remember, says Gray in one of his letters, Lord C. and Lord M., who are now great statesmen, little dirty boys playing at cricket? For my own part, I don't feel myself a bit taller, or older, or wiser than I did then. It is no wonder that a poet, who thought in this manner of himself, was hunted from college to college, has left us so few precious specimens of his fine powers, and shrunk from his reputation into a silent grave. I never knew a man of genius, a coxcomb in dress, said a man of genius, and sloven in dress. I do know a man of genius, who is a coxcomb in his dress, and in everything else, but let that pass. C'est un mauvais métier que c'est lui de me dire. I also know an artist who has at least the ambition and the boldness of genius, who has been reproached with being a coxcomb, and with affecting singularity in his dress and demeanor. If he is a coxcomb that way, he is not so in himself, but a rattling, hair-brained fellow, with a great deal of unconstrained gaiety, and impetuous, not to say turbulent, life of mind. Happy it is when a man's exuberance of self-love flies off to the circumference of a broad-brimmed hat, descends to the toes of his shoes, or carries itself off with the peculiarity of his gait, or even vents itself in a little professional quackery, and when he seems to think sometimes of you, sometimes of himself, and sometimes of others, and you do not feel it necessary to pay to him all the finical devotion, or to submit to be treated with the scornful neglect of a proud beauty, or some prince pretty man, it is well to be something besides the coxcomb, for our own sake as well as that of others, but to be born wholly without the faculty or gift of providence. A man had better have had a stone tied around his neck, and been cast into the sea. In general, the consciousness of internal power leads rather to a disregard of than a studied attention to the external appearance. The wear and tear of the mind does not improve the sleekness of the skin, or the elasticity of the muscles. The burther of thought weighs down the body like a porter's burthen. A man cannot stand so upright, or move so briskly under it, as if he had nothing to carry in his head or on his shoulders. The rose on the cheek and the canker at the heart do not flourish at the same time, and he who has much to think of must take many things to heart, for thought and feeling are one. He who can truly say, Nihil humani e me alienum puto, has a world of cares on his hands, which nobody knows anything of but himself. This is not one of the least miseries of a studious life. The common herd do not by any means give him full credit for his gratuitous sympathy with their concerns, but are struck with his lack-luster eye and wasted appearance. They cannot translate the expression of his countenance out of the Vulgate. They mistake the knitting of his brows for the frown of displeasure, the paleness of study for the languor of sickness, the furrows of thought for the regular approaches of old age. They read his looks, not his books, have no clue to penetrate the last recesses of the mind, and attribute the height of abstraction to more than the ordinary share of stupidity. Mr. Hazlitt never seems to take the slightest interest in anything, is a remark I have often heard made in a whisper. People do not like your philosopher at all, for he does not look, say, or think as they do, and they respect him still less. The majority go by personal appearances, not by proofs of intellectual power, and they are quite right in this, for they are better judges of the one than of the other. There is a large party who undervalue Mr. Keene's acting, and very properly, as far as they are concerned, for they can see that he is a little ill-made man, but they are incapable of entering into the depth and height of the passion in his Othello. A nobleman of high rank, sense, and merit, who had accepted an order of knighthood, on being challenged for so doing by a friend, as a thing rather degrading to him than otherwise, made answer, What you say may be very true, but I am a little man, and am sometimes jostled, 
and treated with very little ceremony in walking along the streets. Now the advantage of this new honor will be that when people see the star at my breast, they will every one make way for me with the greatest respect. Pope bent himself double and ruined his constitution by overstudy when young. He was hardly indemnified by all his posthumous fame, the flattery that soothes the dull cold ear of death, nor by the admiration of his friends, nor the friendship of the great, for the distortion of his person, the want of robust health, and the insignificant figure he made in the eyes of strangers, and of Lady Mary Wortley Montague. Not only was his diminutive and misshapen form against him in such trivial toys, but it was made a set-off and a bar to his poetic pretensions by his brother poets, who ingeniously converted the initials and final letters of his name into the invidious appellation A. Period, P. Period, e. Period. He probably had the passage made underground from his garden to his grotto, that he might not be rudely gazed at in crossing the road by some untutored clown, and perhaps started to see the worm he trod upon writhed into his own form, like Elsheet the Black Dwarf. Let those who think the mind everything, and the body nothing, ere we shuffle off this mortal coil, read that fine moral fiction of the real story of David Ritchie, Believe and Tremble. Footnote. Here it is more desirable to be the handsomest than the wisest man in His Majesty's dominions, for there are more people who have eyes than understandings. Sir John Suckling tells us that he prized black eyes and a lucky hit at bowls above all the trophies of wit. In like manner, I would be permitted to say that I am somewhat sick of this trade of authorship, where the critics look askance at one's best-meant efforts, but am still fond of those athletic exercises, where they do not keep two scores to mark the game, with wig and tory notches. The accomplishments of the body are obvious and clear to all. Those of the mind are recondite and doubtful, and therefore grudgingly acknowledged, or held up as the sport of prejudice, spite, and folly. End of footnote. It may be urged that there is a remedy for all of this in the appeal from the ignorant many to the enlightened few. But the few who are judges of what is called real and solid merit are not forward to communicate their occult discoveries to others. They are withheld, partly by envy and partly by pusillanimity. The strongest minds are by rights the most independent and ingenious, but then they are competitors in the list, and jealous of the prize. The prudent, and the wise are prudent, only add their hearty applause to the acclamations of the multitude, which they can neither silence nor dispute. So Mr. Gifford dedicated those verses to Mr. Hopner, when securely seated on the heights of fame and fortune, which before he thought might have savored too much of flattery or friendship, those even who have the sagacity to discover it, seldom volunteer to introduce obscure merit into publicity, so as to endanger their own pretensions. They praise the world's idols, and bow down at the altars which they cannot overturn by violence or undermine by stealth. Suppose literary men to be the judges and vouchers for literary merit. But it may sometimes happen that a literary man, however high in genius or in fame, has no passion but the love of distinction, and hates every person or thing that interferes with his inadmissible and exorbitant claims. Dead to every other interest, he is alive to that, and starts up like a serpent when trod upon, out of the slumber of the wounded pride. The cold slime of indifference is turned into a rank poison at the sight of your approach to an equality or competition within himself. If he is an old acquaintance, he would keep you always where you were, under his feet to be trampled on. If a new one, he wonders he never heard of you before. As you become known, he expresses a greater contempt for you, and grows more captious and uneasy. The more you strive to merit his good word, the farther you are from it. Such characters will not only sneer at your well-meant endeavors and keep silent as to your good qualities, but are out of countenance, quite chop-fallen, if they find you have a cup of water or a crust of bread. It is only when you are in jail, starved or dead, that their exclusive pretensions are safe, 
or their argus-eyed suspicions laid asleep. This is a true copy, nor is it taken from one sitting or a single subject. An author nowadays, to succeed, must be something more than an author, a nobleman, or rich plebeian. The simple literary character is not enough. Such a poor forked animal, as a mere poet or philosopher turned loose upon public opinion, has no chance against the flocks of bats and owls that instantly assail him. It is name, it is wealth, it is title and influence that mollifies the tender-hearted Serbius of criticism. First, by placing the honorary candidate for fame out of the reach of Grub Street malice. Secondly, by holding out the prospect of a dinner or a vacant office to successful sycophancy. This is the reason why a certain magazine praises Percy by Shelley and vilifies Johnny Keats. Footnote. Written in June, 1820. End of footnote. They know very well that they cannot ruin the one in fortune as well as in fame. But they may ruin the other in both. Deprive him of a livelihood together with his good name. Send him to Coventry and into the rules of a prison. And this is a double incitement to the exercises of their laudable and legitimate vocation. We do not hear that they plead the good-natured motive of the editor of the Quarterly Review, that they did it for his good, because someone, in consequence of that critic's abuse, had sent the author a present of five and twenty pounds. One of those writers went so far, in a sort of general profession of literary servility, as to declare broadly that there had been no great English poet and that no one had a right to pretend to the character of a man of genius in this country, who was not of patrician birth, or connections by marriage. This hook was well baited. These are the doctrines that enrich the shops, that pass with reputation through the land, and bring their authors an immortal name. It is the sympathy of the public with the spite, jealousy, and irritable humors of the writers that nourishes this disease in the public mind. This, this embalms and spices to the April day again, what otherwise the Spittle and Lazar house would heave the gorge at. End of section 24。section 25 of the plain speaker。this is a librivox recording。All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sandra Luna. The Plain Speaker. Opinions on Books, Men, and Things. By William Hazlitt. Section 25. On the Look of a Gentleman. The nobleman look. Yes, I know what you mean very well. That look, which a nobleman should have, rather than what they have generally now. The Duke of Buckingham, Sheffield, was a genteel man, and had a great deal the look you speak of. Wycherley was a very genteel man, and had the nobleman look as much as the Duke of Buckingham. Spence's Anecdotes, edited by Singer, page 215. He, Pope, instanced it too in Lord Peterborough, Lord Bolingbroke, Lord Hitchinbroke, the Duke of Bolton, and two or three more. Ibidem. I have chosen the above motto to a very delicate subject, which in prudence I might let alone. I, however, like the title, and will try, at least, to make a sketch of it. What it is that constitutes the look of a gentleman is more easily felt than described. We all know it, when we see it, but we do not know how to account for it, or to explain in what it consists. Causa latet recipsia notissima. Ease, grace, dignity have been given as the exponents and expressive symbols of this look. But I would rather say that an habitual self-possession determines the appearance of a gentleman. He should have the complete command not only over his countenance, but over his limbs and motions. In other words, he should discover in his air and manner a voluntary power over his whole body, which with every inflection of it should be under the control of his will. It must be evident that he looks and does as he likes, without any restraint, confusion, or awkwardness. He is, in fact, 
master of his person, as the professor of any art or science is of a particular instrument. He directs it to what use he pleases and intends. Wherever this power and facility appear, we recognize the look and deportment of the gentleman, that is, of a person who by his habits and situation in life, and in his ordinary intercourse with society, has had little else to do than to study those movements and that carriage of the body which were accompanied with most satisfaction to himself, and were calculated to excite the approbation of the beholder. Ease, it might be observed, is not enough. Dignity is too much. There must be a certain retenue, a conscious decorum added to the first, and a certain familiarity of regard quenching the austere countenance of control in the other, to answer to our conception of this character. Perhaps propriety is as near a word as any to denote the manners of the gentleman. Elegance is necessary to the fine gentleman, dignity is proper to noblemen, and majesty to kings. Wherever this constant and decent subjection of the body to the mind is visible in the customary actions of walking, sitting, riding, standing, speaking, and etc., we draw the same conclusion as to the individual. Whatever may be the impediments or unavoidable defects of the machine of which he has the management, a man may have a mean or disagreeable exterior, may halt in his gait, or have lost the use of half his limbs, and yet he may show this habitual attention to what is graceful and becoming in the use he makes of all the powers he has left, in the nice conduct of the most unpromising and impracticable figure. A hump-backed or deformed man does not necessarily look like a clown or a mechanic. On the contrary, from his care in the adjustment of his appearance and his desire to remedy his defects, he, for the most part, acquires something of the look of a gentleman. The common nickname of my lord, applied to such persons, has allusion to this, to their circumspect deportment and tacit resistance to vulgar prejudice. Lord Ogilby, in the clandestine marriage, is as crazy a piece of elegance and refinement, even after he is wound up for the day, as can well be imagined. Yet, in the hands of a genuine actor, his tottering step, his twitches of the gout, his unsuccessful attempts at youth and gaiety, take nothing from the nobleman. He has the ideal model in his mind, resents his deviations from it with proper horror, recovers himself from any ungraceful action as soon as possible does all he can with his limited means, and fails in his just pretensions, not from inadvertence, but necessity. Sir Joseph Banks, who was almost bent double, retained to the last the look of a privy counsellor. There was all the firmness and dignity that could be given by the sense of his own importance to so distorted and disabled a trunk. Sir Charles Bunbury, as he saunters down St. James Street, with a large slouched hat, a lack-lustre eye, an aquiline nose, an old shabby drab-coloured coat, buttoned across his breast without a cape, with old top boots and his hands in his waistcoat or breech-pockets, as if he were strolling along his own garden walks, or over the turf at Newmarket, after having made his bed secure, presents nothing very dazzling or graceful or dignified to the imagination, though you can tell infallibly at the first glance or even a bow shot off, that he is a gentleman of the first water, the same that sixty years ago married the beautiful Lady Sarah Lennox, with whom the king was in love. What is the clue to this mystery? It is evident that his person costs him no more trouble than an old glove. His limbs are, as it were, left to take care of themselves. They move of their own accord, he does not strut or stand on tiptoe to show how tall his person is above them all, but he seems to find his own level, and wherever he is, to slide into his place naturally. He is equally at home among lords or gamblers. Nothing can discompose his fixed serenity of look and purpose. There is no mark of superciliousness about him, nor does it appear as if anything could meet his eye to startle or throw him off his guard. He neither avoids nor courts notice, but the archaism of his dress may be understood to denote a lingering partiality 
for the custom of the lost age, and something like a prescriptive contempt for the finery of this. The old one-eyed Duke of Queensbury is another example that I might quote. As he sat in his bow-window in Piccadilly, erect and emaciated, he seemed like a nobleman, framed and glazed, or a well-dressed mummy of the court of George the Second. We have few of these precious specimens of the gentleman or nobleman look now remaining. Other considerations have set aside the exclusive importance of the character, and of course the jealous attention to the outward expression of it. Where we oftenest meet with it nowadays is perhaps in the butlers in old families, or the valets and gentlemen's gentlemen of the younger branches. The sleek pursy gravity of the one answers to the stately air of some of their quantum masters, and the flippancy and finery of our old-fashioned bows, having been discarded by the heirs to the title and estate, have been retained by their lackeys. The late Admiral Byron, I have heard Northcote say, had a butler, or steward, who, from constantly observing his master, had so learned to mimic him, the look, the manner, the voice, the bow were so alike, he was so subduced to the very quality of his lord, that it was difficult to distinguish them apart. Our modern footmen, as we see them fluttering and lounging in lobbies, or at the doors of ladies' carriages, bedizened in lace and powder, with ivory-headed cane and embroidered gloves, give one the only idea of the fine gentlemen of former periods, as they are still occasionally represented on the stage, and indeed our theatrical heroes, who top such parts, might be supposed to have copied, as a last resource, from the heroes of the shoulder knot. We also sometimes meet with a straggling personation of this character, got up in common life from pure romantic enthusiasm, and on absolutely ideal principles. I recollect a well-grown comely haberdasher, who made a practice of walking every day from Bishopsgate Street to Pall Mall and Lawn Street, with the undaunted air and strut of a general officer, and also a prim undertaker, who regularly tended his person, whenever the weather would permit, from the neighbourhood of Camberwell into the favourite promenades of the city, with a mincing gait that would have become a gentleman's husher of the black thought. What a strange infatuation! to live in a dream of being taken for what one is not, in deceiving others, and at the same time ourselves, for no doubt these persons believed that they thus appeared to the world in their true characters, and that their assumed pretensions did no more than justice to their real merits. Dress makes the man, and want of it the fellow. The rest is all but leather and prunella. I confess, however, that I admire this look of a gentleman more when it rises from the level of common life, and bears the stamp of intellect, than when it is formed out of the mould of adventitious circumstances. I think more highly of Witchley than I do of Lord Hitchinbroke, for looking like a lord. In the one it was the effect of native genius, grace, and spirit, in the other, comparatively speaking, of pride or custom. A visitor complimenting Voltaire on the growth and flourishing condition of some trees in his grounds. Hey, said the French wit, they have nothing else to do. A lord has nothing to do but to look like a lord. Our comic poet had something else to do, and did it. Though the disadvantages of nature or accident do not act as obstacles to the look of a gentleman, those of education and employment do. A shoemaker, who is bent in two over his daily task, a tailor, who sits cross-legged all day, a ploughman, who wears clock shoes over the furrowed miry soil and can hardly drag his feet after him, a scholar, who has pored all his life over books, are not likely to possess that natural freedom and ease, or to pay that strict attention to personal appearances that the look of a gentleman implies. I might add that a man milliner, behind a counter, who is compelled to show every mark of complacence to his customers, but hardly expects common civility from them in return, or a sheriff's officer, who has a consciousness of power, but none of good will to or from anybody, are equally remote from the beau ideal of this character. A man 
who is awkward from bashfulness is a clown as one who is showing off a number of impertinent airs and graces at every turn is a coxcomb or an upstart mere awkwardness or rusticity of behaviour may arise either from want of presence of mind in the company of our betters the commonest hint goes about his regular business without any of the mauvaise honte from a deficiency of breeding as it is called in not having been taught certain fashionable accomplishments or from unremitting application to certain sorts of mechanical labours unfitting the body for general or indifferent uses that vulgarity which proceeds from a total disregard of decorum and want of careful control over the different actions of the body such as loud speaking boisterous gesticulations and etc is rather rudeness and violence than awkwardness or uneasy restraint now the gentleman is free from all these causes of ungraceful demeanour he is independent in his circumstances and is used to enter into society on equal terms he is taught the modes of address and forms of curtsy most commonly practised and most proper to ingratiate him into the good opinion of those he associates with and he is relieved from the necessity of following any of those laborious trades or callings which cramp strain and distort the human frame he is not bound to do any one earthly thing to use any exertion or put himself in any posture that is not perfectly easy and graceful agreeable and becoming neither is he at the present day required to excel in any art or science game or exercise he is supposed qualified to dance a minuet not to dance on the tight rope to stand upright not to stand on his head he has only to sacrifice to the graces alcibiades threw away a flute because the playing on it discomposed his features take the fine gentleman out of the common boarding-school or drawing-room accomplishments and set him to any ruder or more difficult task and he will make but a sorry figure ferdinand in the tempest when he is put by prospero to carry logs of wood does not strike us as a very heroic character though he loses nothing of the king's son if a young gallant of the first fashion were asked to shoe a horse or hold a plough or fell a tree he would make a very ridiculous business of the first experiment i saw a set of young naval officers very genteel-looking young men playing at rackets not long ago and it is impossible to describe the uncouthness of their motions and unaccountable contrivances for hitting the ball something effeminate as well as commonplace then enters into the composition of the gentleman he is a little of the petit maître in his pretensions he is only graceful and accomplished in those things to which he has paid almost his whole attention such as the carriage of his body and adjustment of his dress and to which he is of sufficient importance in the scale of society to attract the idle attention of others a man's manner of presenting himself in company is but a superficial test of his real qualifications sergeant atkinson we are assured by fielding would have marched at the head of his platoon up to a masked battery with less apprehension than he came into a room full of pretty women so we may sometimes see persons look foolish enough on entering a party or returning a solution but instantly feel themselves at home and recover all their self-possession as soon as any of that sort of conversation begins from which nine-tenths of the company retire in the extremest turpidation lest they should betray their ignorance or incapacity a high spirit and stubborn pride are often accompanied with an unprepossessing and unpretending appearance the greatest heroes do not show it by their looks there are individuals of a nervous habit who might be said to abhor their own persons and to startle at their own appearance as the peacock tries to hide its legs they are always shy uncomfortable restless and all their actions are in a manner at cross purposes with themselves this of course destroys the look we are speaking of from the want of ease and self-confidence there is another sort who have too much negligence of manner and contempt for formal punctilious they take their full swing in whatever they are about and make it seem almost necessary to get out of their way 
perhaps something of this bold licentious slovenly lounging character may be objected by a fastidious eye to the appearance of lord castlereagh it might be said of him without disparagement that he looks more like a lord than a gentleman we see nothing pretty or finical assuredly nothing hard bound or reined in but a flowing outline a broad free style he sits in the house of commons with his hat slouched over his forehead and a sort of stoop in his shoulders as if he cowered over his antagonists like a bird of prey over its quarry hatching vain empires there is an irregular grandeur about him an unwieldy power loose disjointed voluminous and vast coiled up in the folds of its own purposes cold death-like smooth and smiling that is neither quite at ease with itself nor safe for others to approach on the other hand there is the marquis wellesley a jewel of a man he advances into his place in the house of lords with head erect and his best foot foremost the star sparkles on his breast and the garter is seen bound tight below his knee it might be thought that he still trod a measure on soft carpets and was surrounded not only by spiritual and temporal lords but stores of ladies whose bright eyes reign influence and judge the prize the chivalrous spirit that shines through him the air of gallantry in his personal as well as rhetorical appeals to the house glances a partial lustre on the woolsack as he addresses it and makes lord erskine raise his sunken head from a dream of transient popularity his heedless vanity throws itself unblushingly on the unsuspecting candour of his hearers and ravishes mute admiration you would almost guess of this nobleman beforehand that he was a marquis something higher than an earl and less important than a duke nature has just fitted him for the niche he fills in the scale of rank or title he is a finished miniature picture set in brilliance lord c might be compared to a loose sketch in oil not properly hung the character of the one is ease of the other elegance elegance is something more than ease it is more than a freedom from awkwardness or restraint it implies i conceive a precision a polish a sparkling effect spirited yet delicate which is perfectly exemplified in lord wellesley's face and figure the greatest contrast to this little lively nobleman was the late lord stanhope tall above his peers he presented an appearance something like between a patagonian chief and one of the long parliament with his long black hair unkept and wild his black clothes lank features strang antiques and screaming voice he was the orson of debate a satyr that comes staring from the woods cannot at first speak like an orator yet he was both an orator and a wit in his way his harangues were an odd jumble of logic and mechanics of the statues at large and joe miller's jest of stern principle and sly humour of shrewdness and absurdity of method and madness what is more extraordinary he was an honest man he was out of his place in the house of lords he particularly delighted in his eccentric onsets to make havoc on the bench of bishops i like said he to argue with one of my lords the bishops and the reason why i do so is that i generally have the best of the argument he was altogether a different man from lord eldon yet his lordship gave him good oeillade as he broke a jest or argued a motor point and while he spoke smiles roguish twinkles glittered in the chancellor's eyes the look of a gentleman the nobleman look is little else than the reflection of the looks of the world we smile at those who smile upon us we are gracious to those who pay their court to us we naturally acquire confidence and ease when all goes well with us when we are encouraged by the blandishments of fortune and the good opinion of mankind a whole street bowing regularly to a man every time he rides out may teach him how to pull off his hat in return without supposing a particular genius for bowing 
more than for governing or anything else, born in the family. It has been observed that persons who sit for their pictures improve the character of their countenances from the desire they have to procure the most favourable representation of themselves. Tell me, pray, good Mr. Carmine, when you come to the eyes, that I may call up a look, says the alderman's wife, in Footy's farce of taste. Ladies grow handsome by looking at themselves in the glass, and heightening the agreeable airs and expression of features they so much admire there. So the favourites of fortune adjust themselves in the glass of fashion, and the flattering illusions of public opinion. Again, the expression of face in the gentleman or thoroughbred man of the world is not that of refinement so much as of flexibility, of sensibility or enthusiasm, so much as of indifference. It argues presence of mind, rather than enlargement of ideas. In this it differs from the heroic and philosophical look. Instead of an intense unity of purpose, wound up to some great occasion, it is dissipated and frittered down into a number of evanescent expressions, fitted for every variety of unimportant occurrences. Instead of the expansion of general thought or intellect, you trace chiefly the little, tried, cautious, movable lines of conscious but concealed self-complacency. If Raphael had painted St. Paul as a gentleman, what a figure he would have made of the great apostle of the Gentiles, occupied with himself, not carried away, raised, inspired with his subject, insinuating his doctrines into his audience, not launching them from him with the tongues of the Holy Spirit, and with looks of fiery scorching zeal. Gentlemen luckily can afford to sit for their own portraits. Painters do not trouble them to sit as studies for history. What a difference is there in this respect between a Madonna of Raphael and a lady of fashion, even by Van Dyck. The former refined and elevated, the later light and trifling, with no emanation of soul, no depth of feeling, each arc expression playing on the surface and passing into any other at pleasure, no one thought having its full scope, but checked by some other, soft, careless, insincere, pleased, affected, amiable. The French physiognomy is more cut up and subdivided into pretty lines and sharp angles than any other. It does not want for subtlety, or an air of gentility, which last it often has in a remarkable degree. But it is the most unpoetical and least picturesque of all others. I cannot explain what I mean by this variable telegraphic machinery of polite expression better than by an obvious illusion. Every one by walking the streets of London, or any other populous city, acquires a walk which is easily distinguished from that of strangers. A quick flexibility of movement, a smart jerk, an aspiring and confident tread, and an air as if on the alert to keep the line of march. But for all that, there is not much grace or grandeur in this local strut. You see, the person is not a country bumpkin. But you would not say he is a hero or a sage, because he is a cockney. So it is, in passing through the artificial and thickly peopled scenes of life. You get the look of a man of the world, you rub off the pedant and the clown, but you do not make much progress in wisdom or virtue, or in the characteristic expression of either. The character of a gentleman, I take it, may be explained nearly thus. A blackguard, a vaurien, is a fellow who does not care whom he offends. A clown is a blockhead who does not know when he offends. A gentleman is one who understands and shows every mark of deference to the claims of self-love in others, and exacts it in return from them. Politeness and the pretensions to the character in question have reference almost entirely to this reciprocal manifestation of goodwill and good opinion towards each other in casual society. Morality regulates our sentiments and conduct, as they have a connection with ultimate and important consequences. Manners, properly speaking, regulate our words and actions in the routine of personal intercourse. They have little to do with real kindness of intention, or practical services, or disinterested sacrifices, but they put on the garb, 
and mock the appearance of these in order to prevent a breach of the peace and to smooth and varnish over the discordant materials when any number of individuals are brought in contact together the conventional compact of good manners does not reach beyond the moment of the company say for instance that the rabble the laboring and industrious part of the community are taken up with supplying their own wants and pinning over their own hardships scrambling for what they can get and not refining on any of their pleasures or troubling themselves about the fastidious pretensions of others again there are philosophers who are busied in the pursuit of truth or patriots who are active for the good of their country but here we will suppose are a knot of people got together who having no serious wants of their own with leisure and independence and caring little about abstract truth or practical utility are met for no mortal purpose but to say and to do all manner of obliging things to pay the greatest possible respect and show the most delicate and flattering attentions to one another the politest set of gentlemen and ladies in the world can do no more than this the laws that regulate the species of select and fantastic society are comfortable to its end and origin the fine gentleman or lady must not on any account say a rude thing to the persons present but you may turn them into the utmost ridicule the instant they are gone nay not to do so is sometimes considered as an indirect slight to the party that remains you must compliment your bitterest foe to his face and may slander your dearest friend behind his back the last may be immoral but it is not unmannerly the gallant maintains his title to this character by treating every woman he meets with the same marked and unremitting attention as if she was his mistress the courtier treats every man with the same professions of esteem and kindness as if he were an accomplice with him in some plot against mankind of course these professions made only to please go from nothing in practice to insist on them afterwards as literal obligations would be to betray an ignorance of this kind of interlude or masquerading in real life to ruin your friend at play is not inconsistent with the character of a gentleman and a man of honour if it is done with civility though to warn him of his danger so as to imply a doubt of his judgment or interference with his will would be to subject yourself to be run through the body with a sword it is that which wounds the self-love of the individual that is offensive that which flatters it that is welcome however salutary the one or however fatal the other may be a habit of plain speaking is totally contrary to the tone of good breeding you must prefer the opinion of the company to your own and even to the truth i doubt whether a gentleman must not be of the established church and a tory a true cavalier can only be a martyr to prejudice or fashion a whig lord appears to me as great an anomaly as a patriot king a sectary is sour and unsociable a philosopher is quite out of the question he is in the clouds and had better not be let down on the floor in a basket to play the blockhead he is sure to commit himself in good company and by dealing always in abstractions and driving at generalities to offend against the three properties of time place and person authors are angry loud and vehement in argument the man of more refined breeding who has been all tranquillity and smiles goes away and tries to ruin the antagonist whom he could not vanquish in a dispute the manners of a court and the polished life are by no means downright straightforward but the contrary they have something dramatic in them each person plays an assumed part the affected overstrained politeness and suppression of real sentiment lead to concealed irony and the spirit of satire and raillery and hence we may account for the perfection of the genteel comedy of the century before the last when poets were allowed to mingle in the court circles and took their cue from the splendid ring of mimic statesmen and their merry king the essence of this sort of conversation and intercourse both on and off the stage has somehow since evaporated the disguises of royalty nobility gentry have been in some measure seen through 
we have become individually of little importance compared with greater objects in the eyes of our neighbours and even in our own abstract topics not personal pretensions are the order of the day so that what remains of the character we have been talking of is chiefly exotic and provincial and may be seen still flourishing in country places in a wholesome state of vegetable decay a man may have the manners of a gentleman without having the look and he may have the character of a gentleman in a more abstracted point of view without the manners the feelings of a gentleman in his higher sense only denote a more refined humanity a spirit delicate in itself and unwilling to offend either in the greatest or the smallest things this may be coupled with absence of mind with ignorance of forms and frequent blunders but the will is good the spring of gentle offices and true regards is untainted a person of this stamp blushes at an impropriety he was guilty of twenty years before though he is perhaps liable to repeat it to-morrow he never forgives himself for even a slip of the tongue that implies an assumption of superiority over any one. In proportion to the concessions made to him, he lowers his demands. He gives the wall to a beggar, but does not always bow to great men. This class of character have been called God Almighty's gentlemen. There are not a great many of them. The late George Dyer was one, for we understand that that gentleman was not able to survive some ill-disposed persons having asserted of him that he had mistaken lord castlereagh for the author of waverley end of section twenty five recording by sandra luna Section twenty six of the Plain Speaker. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sandra Luna. The Plain Speaker. Opinions on Books, Men, and Things by William Hazlitt. Section twenty six on Reading Old Books. I hate to read new books. There are twenty or thirty volumes that I have read over and over again, and these are the only ones that I have any desire ever to read at all. It was a long time before I could bring myself to sit down to the tales of my landlord, but now that author's works have made a considerable addition to my scanty library. I am told that some of Lady Morgan's are good, and have been recommended to look into Anastasius, but I have not yet ventured upon that task. A lady, the other day, could not refrain from expressing her surprise to a friend, who said he had been reading Delphine. She asked if it had not been published some time back. Women judge of books as they do of fashions or complexions, which are admired only in their newest gloss. That is not my way. I am not one of those who trouble the circulating libraries much, or pester the booksellers for mail-coach copies of standard periodical publications. I cannot say that I am greatly addicted to black letter, but I profess myself well versed in the marble bindings of Andrew Miller in the middle of the last century, nor does my taste revolt at Thurlow's state papers in Russia leather, or an ample impression of Sir William Temple's essays, with a portrait after Sir Godfrey Kneller in front. I do not think altogether the worse of a book for having survived the author a generation or two. I have more confidence in the dead than the living. Contemporary writers may generally be divided into two classes, one's friends or one's foes. Of the first we are compelled to think too well, and of the last we are disposed to think too ill, to receive much genuine pleasure from the perusal, or to judge fairly of the merits of either. One candidate for literary fame, who happens to be of our acquaintance, writes finely and like a man of genius, but unfortunately has a foolish face which spoils a delicate passage. Another inspires us with the highest respect for his personal talents and character, but does not quite come up to our expectations in print. 
all these contradictions and petty details interrupt the calm current of our reflections if you want to know what any of the authors were who lived before our time and are still objects of anxious inquiry you have only to look into their works but the dust and smoke and noise of modern literature have nothing in common with a pure silent air of immortality when i take up a work that i have read before the oftener the better i know what i have to expect the satisfaction is not lessened by being anticipated when the entertainment is altogether new, I sit down to it as I should to a strange dish, turn and pick out a bit here and there, and am in doubt what to think of the composition. There is a want of confidence and security to second appetite. New-fangled books are also like made dish in this respect, that they are generally little else than ashes and rifacimenti of what has been served up entire and in a more natural state at other times. Besides, in thus turning to a well-known author, there is not only an assurance that my time will not be thrown away, or my palate nauseated with the most insipid or vilest trash, but I shake hands with, and look an old, tried, and valued friend in the face, compare notes, and chat the hours away. It is true, we form dear friendships with such ideal guests, dearer, alas, and more lasting than those with our most intimate acquaintance. In reading a book, which is an old favourite with me, say, the first novel I ever read, I not only have the pleasure of imagination and of a critical relish of the work, but the pleasures of memory added to it. It recalls the same feelings and associations which I had in first reading it, and which I can never have again in any other way. Standard productions of this kind are links in the chain of our conscious being. They bind together the different scattered divisions of our personal identity. They are landmarks and guides in our journey through life. They are pegs and loops on which we can hang up, or from which we can take down, at pleasure, the wardrobe of a moral imagination, the relics of our best affections the tokens and records of our happiest hours. They are for thoughts and for remembrance. They are like Fortunatus' wishing cup. They give us the best riches, those of fancy, and transport us, not over half the globe, but, which is better, over half our lives, at a word's notice. My father Shandy solaced himself with Bruskenbill. Give me for this purpose a volume of Peregrine Pickle or Tom Jones open either of them anywhere, at the memoirs of Lady Vane, or the adventures at the masquerade with Lady Ballaston, or the dispute between Thwackham and Square, or the escape of Molly Seagram, or the incident of Sophia and her muff, or the edifying prolixity of her aunt's lecture, and there I find the same delightful, busy, bustling scene as ever, and feel myself the same as when I was first introduced into the midst of it. Nay, sometimes the sight of an odd volume of these good old English authors on a stall, or the name lettered on the back among others on the shelves of a library, answers the purpose, revives the whole train of ideas, and sets the puppets dallying. Twenty years are struck off the list, and I am a child again. A sage philosopher, who was not a very wise man, said that he would like very well to be young again, if he could take his experience along with him. This ingenious person did not seem to be aware, by the gravity of his remark, that the great advantage of being young is to be without this weight of experience, which he would fain place upon the shoulders of youth, and which never comes too late with years. Oh, what a privilege to be able to let this hump, like Christian's burthen, drop from off one's back, and transport oneself, by the help of a little musty duodecimo, to the time when ignorance was bliss, and when we first got a peep at the rarest show of the world, through the glass of fiction, gazing at mankind, as we do at wild beasts in a menagerie, through the bars of their cages, or at curiosities in a museum that we must not touch. For myself, not only are the old ideas of the contents of the work, brought back to my mind, in all their vividness, 
but the old associations of the faces and persons of those I then knew, as they were in their lifetime, the place where I sat to read the volume, the day when I got it, the feeling of the air, the fields, the sky, return, and all my early impressions with them. This is better to me. Those places, those times, those persons, and those feelings that come across me as I retrace the story and devour the page, are to me better far than the wet sheets of the last new novel from the Valentine Press, to say nothing of the Minerva Press, in Leadenhall Street. It is like visiting the scenes of early youth. I think of the time when I was in my father's house, and my path ran down with butter and honey, when I was a little, thoughtless child, and had no other wish or care but to con my daily task and be happy. Tom Jones, I remember, was the first work that broke the spell. It came down in numbers once a fortnight, in Cook's pocket edition, embellished with cuts. I had hitherto read only in school books, and a tiresome ecclesiastical history, with the exception of Mrs. Radcliffe's Romance of the Forest. But this had a different relish with it, sweet in the mouth, though not bitter in the belly. It smacked of the world I lived in, and in which I was to live, and showed me groups, gay creatures, not of the element, but of the earth, not living in the clouds, but travelling the same road that I did, some that had passed on before me, and others that might soon overtake me. My heart had palpitated at the thoughts of a boarding-school ball, or gala day at midsummer or Christmas, but the world I had found out in Cook's edition of the British novelists was to me a dance through life, a perpetual gala day. The sixpenny numbers of this work regularly contrived to leave off just in the middle of a sentence, and in the nick of a story, where Tom Jones discovers square behind the blanket, or where Parson Adams, in the inextricable confusion of events, very undesignedly gets to bed to Mrs. Slipslop. Let me caution the reader against this impression of Joseph Andrews, for there is a picture of Fanny in it which he should not set his heart on lest he should never meet with anything like it, or if she should, it would perhaps be better for him that he had not. It was just like, with what eagerness I used to look forward to the next number, and open the prints. Ah, never again shall I feel the enthusiastic delight with which I gazed at the figures and anticipated the story and adventures of Major Bath and Commodore Trunian, of Trim and my uncle Toby, of Don Quixote and Sancho and Dapple, of Jill Blas and Dame Lorenza Sephora, of Laura and the fair Lucretia, whose lips open and shut like buds of roses. To what nameless ideas did they give rise? With what airy delights I filled up the outlines as I hung in silence over the page. Let me still recall them, that they may breathe fresh life into me, and that I may live that birthday of thought and romantic pleasure over again. Talk of the ideal. This is the only true ideal, the heavenly tints of fancy reflected in the bubbles that float upon the spring-tide of human life. O oh, memory, shield me from the world's poor strife, and give me those scenes thine everlasting life. The paradox with which I set out is, I hope, less startling than it was. The reader will, by this time, have been let into my secret. Much about the same time, or I believe rather earlier, I took a particular satisfaction in reading Chubb's tracts, and I often think I will get them again to wade through. There is a high gusto of polemical divinity in them, and you fancy that you hear a club of shoemakers at Salisbury, debating a disputable text from one of St. Paul's epistles, in a workmanlike style, with equal shrewdness and pertinacity, I cannot say much for my metaphysical studies, into which I launched shortly after with great ardour, so as to make a toil of a pleasure. I was presently entangled in the briars and thorns of subtle distinctions, of fate, free will, foreknowledge absolute though I cannot add that in their wandering mazes I found no end, 
for I did arrive at some very satisfactory and potent conclusions, nor will I go so far, however ungrateful the subject might seem, as to exclaim, with Marlowe's Fosters, would I had never seen Wittenberg, never read book, that is, never studied such authors as Hartley, Hume, Berkeley, and etc. Locke's essay on the human understanding is, however, a work from which I never derived either pleasure or profit, and hopes, dry and powerful as he is, I did not read till long afterwards. I read a few poets, which did not much hit my taste, for I would have the reader understand I am deficient in the faculty of imagination, but I fell early upon French romances and philosophy, and devour them tooth and nail. Many a dainty repast have I made of the new Eloise, the description of the kiss, the excursion on the water, the letter of St. Prue, recalling the time of their first loves, and the account of Julia's death. These I read over and over again with unspeakable delight and wonder. Some years after, when I met with this work again, I found I had lost nearly my whole relish for it, except some few parts and was, I remember, very much mortified with the change in my taste, which I sought to attribute to the smallness and gilt edges of the edition I had bought, and its being perfumed with rose-leaves. Nothing could exceed the gravity, the solemnity with which I carried home and read the dedication to the social contract, with some other pieces of the same author, which I had picked up at a stall in a coarse leathern cover of the confessions I have spoken elsewhere, and may repeat what I have said. Sweet is the dew of their memory, and pleasant the balm of their recollection. Their beauties are not scattered like stray gifts over the earth, but sown thick on the page, rich and rare. I wish I had never read the Emilius, or read it with implicit faith. I had no occasion to pamper my natural aversion to affectation or pretense by romantic and artificial means. I had better have formed myself on the model of Sir Flopping Flutter. There is a class of persons whose virtues and most shining qualities sink in, and are concealed by, an absorbent ground of modesty and reverse, and such a one I do, without vanity, profess myself. Now, these are the very persons who are likely to attach themselves to the character of Emilius, and of whom it is sure to be the bane. This dull, phlegmatic, retiring humour is not in a fair way to be corrected, but confirmed and rendered desperate by being in that work held up as an object of imitation, as an example of simplicity and magnanimity by coming upon us with all the recommendations of novelty, surprise, and superiority to the prejudices of the world, by being stuck upon a pedestal, made amiable, dazzling, a lueur de dupe. The reliance on solid worth which it inculcates, the preference of sober truth to gaudy tinsel, hangs like a millstone round the neck of the imagination, a load to sink a navy, impedes our progress and blocks up every prospect in life. A man to get on, to be successful, conspicuous, applauded, should not retire upon the centre of his conscious resources, but be always at the circumference of appearances. He must envelop himself in a hallow of mystery, he must ride in an equipage of opinion, he must walk with a train of self-conceit following him, he must not strip himself to a buff jerkin, to the doublet and hose of his real merits, but must surround himself with a cortege of prejudices, like the signs of the zodiac. He must seem anything but what he is, and then he may pass for anything he pleases. The world loved to be amused by hollow professions, to be deceived by flattering appearances, to live in a state of hallucination, and can forgive everything but the plain, downright, simple, honest truth, such as we see it, chalked out in the character of Emilius. To return from this digression, which is a little out of place here. Books have in a great measure lost their power over me. Nor can I revive the same interest in them as formerly. I perceive when a thing is good, rather than feel it. It is true, 
Marcion Colonna is a dainty book, and the reading of Mr. Keats' Eve of St. Agnes lately made me regret that I was not young again. The beautiful and tender images there conjured up comes like shadows so depart. The tiger moth's wings, which he has sprung over his rich poetic blazonry, just flit across my fancy. The gorgeous twilight window, which he has painted over again in his verse, to me blushes, almost in vain, with blood of queens and kings. I know how I should have felt at one time in reading such passages. And that is all. The sharp, luscious flavour, the fine aroma, is fled, and nothing but the stalk, the bran, the husk of literature is left. If any one were to ask me what I read now, I might answer with my Lord Hamlet in play, Words, words, words. What is the matter? Nothing. They have scarce a meaning. But it was not always so. There was a time when, to my thinking, every word was a flower or a pearl, like those which dropped from the mouth of the little peasant girl in the fairy tale or like those that fall from the great preacher in the Caledonian chapel. I drank of the stream of knowledge that tempted, but did not mock my lips as of the river of life freely. How eagerly I slacked my thirst of German sentiment, as the heart that panteth for the water springs. How I bathed and reveled and added my floods of tears to Goethe's sorrows of Werther and to Schiller's robbers giving my stock of more to that which had too much. I read and assented with all my soul to Coleridge's fine sonnet, beginning, Schiller, that hour I would have wished to die, if through the shuddering midnight I had sent, from the dark dungeon of the tower time rent, that fearful voice, a famished father's cry. I believe I may date my insight into the mysteries of poetry from the commencement of my acquaintance with the authors of the lyrical ballads, at least my discrimination of the higher sorts, not my predilection for such writers as Goldsmith or Pope, nor do I imagine they will say I got my liking for the novelists, or the comic writers, for the characters of Valentine, Tattle, or Miss Prue from them. If so, I must have got from them what they never had themselves. In points where poetic diction and conception are concerned, I may be at a loss, and liable to be imposed upon. But in forming an estimate of passages relating to common life and manners, I cannot think I am a plagiarist from any man. I there know my cue without a prompter. I may say of such studies, intus et in cute. I am just able to admire those literal touches of observation and description which persons of loftier pretensions overlook and despise. I think I comprehend something of the characteristic part of Shakespeare, and in him, indeed, all is characteristic, even the nonsense and poetry. I believe it was the celebrated Sir Humphrey Davy who used to say that Shakespeare was rather a metaphysician than a poet. At any rate, it was not ill said. I wish I had sooner known the dramatic writers contemporary with Shakespeare, for in looking them over about a year ago I almost revived my old passion for reading, and my old delight in books, though they were very nearly new to me. The periodical essayist I read long ago, the spectator I liked extremely, but the tattler took my fancy most. I read the others soon after the rambler, the adventurer, the world, the connoisseur, I was not sorry to get to the end of them, and have no desire to go regularly through them again. I consider myself a thorough adept in Richardson. I like the longest of his novels best, and think no part of them tedious, nor should I ask to have anything better to do than to read them from beginning to end, to take them up when I chose, and lay them down when I was tired in some old family mansion in the country, till every word and syllable relating to the bright Clarissa, the divine Clementina, the beautiful Pamela, with every trick and line of their sweet favour, were once more graven in my heart's table. I have a sneaking kindness for Mackenzie's Juliette de Rouvigny, 
for the deserted mansion and strangling jilly flowers on the mouldering garden wall, and still more for his man of feeling, not that it is better, nor so good, but at the time I read it I sometimes thought of the heroine, Miss Walton, and of Miss, together, and that ligament, fine as it was, was never broken. One of the poets that I have always read with most pleasure, and can wander about in forever with a sort of voluptuous indolence, is Spencer, and I like Chaucer even better. The only writer among the Italians I can pretend to any knowledge of is Boccaccio, and of him I cannot express half my admiration. His story of the hawk I could read and think of from day to day, just as I would look at a picture of Titian's. I remember, as long ago as the year 1788, going to a neighboring town, Shrewsbury, where Farquhar has laid the plot of his recruiting officer, and bringing home with me, at one proud swoop, a copy of Milton's Paradise Lost, and another of Burke's Reflections on the French Revolution, both which I have still, and still recollect when I see the covers, the pleasure with which I dipped into them as I returned with my double prize. I was set up for one while. That time is past, with all its giddy raptures, but I am still anxious to preserve its memory, embalmed with odours. With respect to the first of these works, I would be permitted to remark here in passing that it is a sufficient answer to the German criticism which has since been started against the character of Satan, viz. that it is not one of disgusting deformity or pure, defecated malice. To say that Milton has there drawn not the abstract principle of evil, not a devil incarnate, but a fallen angel, this is the scriptural account, and the poet has followed it. We may safely retain such passages as that well-known one. His form had not yet lost all her original brightness, nor appeared less than archangel ruined, and the excess of glory obscured. For the theory, which is opposed to them, falls flat upon the grunsel edge, and shames its worshippers. Let us hear no more, then, of this monkish cant, and by got it outcry for the restoration of the horns and tail of the devil. Again, as to the other work, Burke's Reflections, I took a particular pride and pleasure in it, and read it to myself and others for months afterwards. I had reason for my prejudice in favour of this author. To understand an adversary is some praise, to admire him is more. I thought I did both. I knew I did one. From the first time I ever cast my eyes on anything of Burke's, which was an extract from his letters to a noble lord, in a three times a week paper, the St. James Chronicle, in 1796, I said to myself, This is true eloquence. This is a man pouring out his mind on paper. All other style seemed to me pedantic and impertinent. Dr. Johnson's was walking on stilts, and even Junius's, who was at that time a favourite with me, with all his tasseness, shrunk up into little antithetic points and well-trimmed sentences. But Burke's style was forked and playful as the lightning, crested like the serpent. He delivered plain things on a plain ground, but when he rose there was no end of his flights and circumjurations, and in this very letter he, like an eagle in a dovecoat, fluttered his volscians, the Duke of Bedford, and the Earl of Lauderdale, in Corioli. I did not care for his doctrines. I was then, and am still, proof against their contagion. But I admired the author, and was considered as not a very staunch partisan of the opposite side, though I thought myself that an abstract proposition was one thing, a masterly transition, a brilliant metaphor, another. I conceived, too, that he might be wrong in his main argument, and yet deliver fifty truths in arriving at a false conclusion. I remember Coleridge assuring me, as a poetical and political set-off to my sceptical iteration, that Woodsworth had written an essay on marriage, which, for manly thought and nervous expression, he deemed incomparably superior. As I had not at that time seen any specimens of Mr. Woodsworth's prose style, 
I could not express my doubts on the subject. If there are greater prose writers than Burke, they either lie out of my course of study, or are beyond my sphere of comprehension. I am too old to be a convert to a new mythology of genius. The niches are occupied, the tables are full. If such is still my admiration of this man's misapplied powers, what must it have been at a time when I myself was in vain trying, year after year, to write a single essay, nay, a single page or sentence, when I regarded the wonders of his pen with the longing eyes of one who was dumb and a changeling, and when to be able to convey the slightest conception of my meaning to others in words was the height of an almost hopeless ambition. But I never measured others' excellences by my own defects, though a sense of my own incapacity and of the steep, impassable ascent from me to them made me regard them with greater awe and fondness. I have thus run through most of my early studies and favourite authors, some of whom I have since criticised more at large. Whether those observations will survive me, I neither know, nor do I much care. But the works themselves, worthy of all acceptation, and to the feelings they have always excited in me since I could distinguish a meaning in language, nothing shall ever prevent me from looking back with gratitude and triumph. To have lived in the cultivation of an intimacy with such works, and to have familiarly relished such names, is not to have lived quite in vain. There are other authors whom I have never read, and yet whom I have frequently had a great desire to read, from some circumstance relating to them. Among these is Lord Clarendon's History of the Grand Rebellion, after which I have a hankering from hearing it spoken of by good judges from my interest in the events and knowledge of the characters from other sources and from having seen fine portraits of most of them i like to read a well-penned character and clarendon is said to have been a master in his way i should like to read froissart's chronicles hollingshed and stowe and fuller's worthies i intend whenever i can to read beaumont and Fletcher, all through. There are fifty-two of their plays, and I have only read a dozen or fourteen of them. A Wife for a Month, and Thierry and Theodorette, are, I am told, delicious, and I can believe it. I should like to read the speeches in Thucydides and Guicciardini's History of Florence, and Don Quixote in the original. I have often thought of reading The Loves of Persils and Sigismunda, and the Galatea of the same author, but I somehow reserve them like another Yarrow. I should also like to read the last new novel, if I could be sure it was so, of the author of Waverley. No one would be more glad than I to find it the best. End of section 26 Recording by Sandra Luna Section 27 of The Plain Speaker. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Plain Speaker Opinions on Books, Men, and Things by William Hazlitt. Section 27 On Personal Character, Part 1. Men palliate and conceal their original qualities, but do not extirpate them. Montaigne's Essays No one ever changes his character from the time he is two years old, nay, I might say from the time he is two hours old. We may, with instruction and opportunity, mend our manners, or else alter for the worse, as the flesh and fortune shall serve, but the character, the internal, original bias, remains always the same, true to itself to the very last, and feels the ruling passion strong in death. A very grave and dispassionate philosopher, the late celebrated chemist Mr. Nicholson, was so impressed with the conviction of the instantaneous commencement and the development of the character with the birth, 
that he published a long and amusing article in the monthly magazine, giving a detailed account of the progress, history, education and tempers of two twins up to the period of their being eleven days old. This is, perhaps, considering the matter too curiously, and would amount to a species of horoscopy, if we were to build on such premature indications, but the germ no doubt is there, though we must wait a little longer to see what form it takes. We need not in general wait long. The devil soon betrays the cloven foot, or a milder and better spirit appears in its stead. A temper sullen or active, shy or bold, grave or lively, selfish or romantic, to say nothing of quickness or dullness of apprehension, is manifest very early, and imperceptibly but irresistibly moulds our inclinations, habits and pursuits through life. The greater or less degree of animal spirits, of nervous irritability, the complexion of the blood, the proportion of hot, cold, moist and dry, four champions fierce that strive for mastery, the saturnin or the mercurial, the disposition to be affected by objects near or at a distance or not at all, to be struck with novelty, or to brood over deep-rooted impressions, to indulge in laughter or in tears, the leaven of passion or of prudence that tempers this frail clay, is born with us and never quits us. It is not in our stars, in planetary influence, but neither is it owing to ourselves that we are thus or thus. The accession of knowledge, the pressure of circumstances, favourable or unfavourable, does little more than minister occasion to the first predisposing bias, than assist like the dews of heaven or retard like the nipping north the growth of the seed originally sown in our constitution, than give a more or less decided expression to that personal character the outlines of which nothing can alter. What I mean is that Blyfell and Tom Jones, for instance, by changing places, would never have changed characters. The one might, from circumstances and from the notions instilled into him, have become a little less selfish and the other a little less extravagant, but with a trifling allowance of this sort, taking the proposition cum grano salis, they would have been just where they set out. Blyfell would have been Blyfell still, and Jones what nature intended him to be. I have made use of this example without any apology for its being a fictitious one, because I think good novels are the most authentic as well as most accessible repositories of the natural history and philosophy of the species. I shall not borrow assistance or illustration from the organic system of Drs. Gall and Spurzheim, which reduces this question to a small compass and very distinct limits, because I do not understand or believe in it, but I think those who put faith in physiognomy at all, or imagine that the mind is stamped upon the countenance, must believe that there is such a thing as an essential difference of character in different individuals. We do not change our features with our situations, neither do we change the capacities or inclinations which lurk beneath them. A flat face does not become an oval one, nor a pug nose a Roman one, with the acquisition of an office or the addition of a title so neither is the pert, hard, unfeeling outline of character turned from selfishness and cunning to openness and generosity by any softening of circumstances. If the face puts on an habitual smile in the sunshine of fortune, or if it suddenly lowers in the storms of adversity, do not trust too implicitly to appearances. The man is the same at bottom. The designing knave may sometimes wear a visor, or to beguile the time look like the time but watch him narrowly and you will detect him behind his mask. We recognise, after a length of years, the same well-known face that we were formerly acquainted with, changed by time, but the same in itself, and can trace the features of the boy in the full-grown man. Can we doubt that the character and thoughts have remained as much the same all that time, have borne the same image and superscription, have grown with the growth and strengthened with the strength? In this sense, and in Mr. Wordsworth's phrase, the child's the father of the man, surely enough. The same tendencies may not always be equally visible, but they are still in existence and break out whenever they dare and can, the more for being checked. Again, we often distinctly notice the same features, the same bodily peculiarities, 
the same look and gestures in different persons of the same family, and find this resemblance extending to collateral branches and through several generations, showing how strongly nature must have been warped and biased in that particular direction at first. This predetermination in the blood has its caprices too, and wayward as well as obstinate fits. The family likeness sometimes skips over the next of kin, or the nearest branch, and reappears in all its singularity in a second or third cousin, or passes over the son to the grandchild. Where the pictures of the heirs and successors to a title or estate have been preserved for any length of time in Gothic halls and old-fashioned mansions, the prevailing outline and character does not wear out, but may be traced through its numerous inflections and descents, like the winding of a river through an expanse of country for centuries. The ancestor of many a noble house has sat for the portraits of his youthful descendants, and still the soul of Fairfax and the starry veer, consecrated in Marvel's verse, may be seen mantling in the suffused features of some young court beauty of the present day. The portrait of Judge Jeffreys, which was exhibited lately in the gallery in Pall Mall, young, handsome, spirited, good-humoured, and totally unlike, at first view, what you would expect from the character, was an exact likeness of two young men whom I knew some years ago, the living representatives of that family. It is curious that, consistently enough with the delineation of the portrait, old Evelyn should have recorded in his memoirs that he saw the Chief Justice Jeffreys in a large company the night before, and that he thought he laughed, drank and danced too much for a man who had that day condemned Algernon Sidney to the block. It is not always possible to foresee the tiger's spring, till we are within his grasp. The fawning cruel eye dooms its prey while it glitters. Features alone do not run in the blood. Vices and virtues, genius and folly, are transmitted through the same sure but unseen channel. There is an involuntary, unaccountable family character, as well as family face, and we see it manifesting itself in the same way, with unbroken continuity or by fits and starts. There shall be a regular breed of misers, of uncourageable old hunkses in a family, time out of mind, or the shame of the thing, and the hardships and restraint imposed upon him while young, shall urge some desperate spendthrift to wipe out the reproach upon his name by a course of extravagance and debauchery, and his immediate successors shall make his example an excuse for relapsing into the old jog-trot incurable infirmity, the grasping and pinching disease of the family again. A person may be indebted for a nose or an eye, for a graceful carriage or a voluble discourse, to a great aunt or uncle whose existence he has scarcely heard of, and distant relations are surprised on some casual introduction to find each other an alter idem. Country cousins who meet after they are grown up for the first time in London often start at the likeness. It is like looking at themselves in the glass. Nay, they shall see, almost before they exchange a word, their own thoughts, as it were, staring them in the face. The same ideas, feelings, opinions, passions, prejudices, likings and antipathies, the same turn of mind and sentiment, the same foibles, peculiarities, faults, follies, misfortunes, consolations, the same self, the same everything, and farther, this coincidence shall take place, and be most remarkable, where not only no intercourse has previously been kept up, not even by letter or by common friends, but where the different branches of a family have been estranged for long years, and where the younger part in each have been brought up in totally different situations, with different studies, pursuits, expectations and opportunities. To assure me that this is owing to circumstances is to assure me of a gratuitous absurdity, which you cannot know and which I shall not believe. It is owing not to circumstances, but to the force of kind, to the stuff of which our blood and humours are compounded being the same. Why should I and an old hair-brained uncle of mine fasten upon the same picture in a collection and talk of it for years after, though one of no particular mark or likelihood in itself, but for something congenial in the look to our own humour and way of seeing nature? Why should my cousin L and I fix upon the same book, Tristram Shandy, without comparing notes, have it doubled down and dog-eared in the same places, and live upon it as a sort of food that assimilated with our natural dispositions. Instinct, Hal, instinct. They are fools who say otherwise, and have never studied nature or mankind, but in books and systems of philosophy. 
But indeed, the colour of our lives is woven into the fatal thread at our births. Our original sins and our redeeming graces are infused into us, nor is the bond that confirms our destiny ever cancelled. Beneath the hills, amid the flowery groves, the generations are prepared. The pangs, the internal pangs, are ready. The dread strife of poor humanity's afflicted will, struggling in vain with ruthless destiny. The winged wounds that rankle in our breasts to our latest day were planted there long since, ticketed and labelled on the outside, in small but indelible characters, written in our blood, like that ensanguined flower inscribed with woe. We are in the toils from the very first, hemmed in by the hunters, and these are our own passions, bred of our brain and humours, and that never leave us but consume and gnaw the heart in our short lifetime, as worms wait for us in the grave. Critics and authors who congregate in large cities and see nothing of the world but a sort of phantasmorgia to whom the numberless characters they meet in the course of a few hours are fugitive as the flies of a summer, evanescent as the figures in a camera obscura, may talk very learnedly and attribute the motions of the puppets to circumstances of which they are confessedly in total ignorance. They see character only in the bust and have not room for the crowd to study it as a whole length, that is, as it exists in reality. But those who trace things to their source and proceed from individuals to generals know better. Schoolboys, for example, who are early let into the secret and see the seeds growing, are not only sound judges but true prophets of character, so that the nicknames they give their playfellows usually stick by them ever after. The gossips in country towns, also, who study human nature, not merely in the history of the individual but in the genealogy of the race, know the comparative anatomy of the minds of a whole neighbourhood to a tittle, where to look for marks and defects, explain the vulgarity by a cross in the breed, or a foppish air in a young tradesman by his grandmother's marriage with a dancing master, and are the only practical conjurers and expert decipherers of the determinate lines of true or supposititious character. The character of women, I should think it will at this time of day be granted, differs essentially from that of men, not less so than their shape or the texture of their skin. It has been said, indeed, most women have no character at all, and on the other hand, the fair and eloquent authoress of the rights of women was for establishing the masculine pretensions and privileges of her sex on a perfect equality with ours. I shall leave Pope and Mary Wollstonecraft to settle that point between them. I should laugh at anyone who told me that the European, the Asiatic and the African character were the same. I no more believe it than I do that black is the same colour as white or that a straight line is a crooked one. We see in whole nations and large classes the physiognomies, and, I should suppose, not to speak it profanely, the general characters of different animals with which we are acquainted, as of the fox, the wolf, the hog, the goat, the dog, the monkey, and I suspect this analogy, whether perceived or not, has as prevailing an influence on their habits and actions as any theory of moral sentiments taught in the schools. Rules and precautions may no doubt be applied to counteract the excesses and overt demonstrations of any such characteristic infirmity, but still the disease will be in the mind an impediment not a help to virtue. An exception is usually taken to all national or general reflections as unjust and illiberal because they cannot be true of every individual. It is not meant that they are, and besides, the same captious objection is not made to the handsome things that are said of whole bodies and classes of men. A lofty panegyric, a boasted virtue, will fit the inhabitants of an entire district to a hair. The want of strict universality, of philosophical and abstract truth, is no difficulty here. But if you hint at an obvious vice or defect, this is instantly construed into a most unfair and partial view of the case, and each defaulter throws the imputation from himself and his country with scorn. Thus you may praise the generosity of the English, the prudence of the Scotch, the hospitality of the Irish as long as you please, and not a syllable is whispered against these sweeping expressions of admiration. But reverse the picture, hold up to censure, or only glance at the unfavourable side of each character, and they themselves admit that they have a distinguishing and generic character as a people, 
and you are assailed by the most violent clamours and a confused babel of noises as a disseminator of unfounded prejudices or a libeller of human nature i am sure there is nothing unreasonable in this harsh and disagreeable qualities wear out in nations as in individuals from time and intercourse with the world but it is at the expense of their intrinsic excellences the vices of softness and effeminacy sink deeper with age like thorns in the flesh single acts or events often determine the fate of mortals yet may have nothing to do with their general deserts or failings he who is said to be cured of any glaring infirmity may be suspected never to have had it and lastly it may be laid down as a general rule that mankind improve by means of luxury and civilization in social manners and become more depraved in what relates to personal habits and character there are few nations as well as few men with the exception of tyrants that are cruel and voluptuous immersed in pleasure and bent on inflicting pain on others at the same time ferociousness is the characteristic of barbarous ages licentiousness of more refined periods End of section 27. Recording by Goldfish. Section 28 of The Plain Speaker. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Goldfish. The Plain Speaker. Opinions on Books, Men and Things by William Hazlitt Section 28 on Personal Character, Part 2 I shall not undertake to decide exactly how far the original character may be modified by the general progress of society or by particular circumstances happening to the individual, but I think the alteration, be it what it may, is more apparent than real, more in conduct than in feeling. I will not deny that an extreme and violent difference of circumstances, as that between the savage and the civilised state, will supersede the common distinctions of character and prevent certain dispositions and sentiments from ever developing themselves. Yet with reference to this, I would observe, in the first place, that in the most opposite ranks and conditions of life, we find qualities showing themselves which we should have least expected, grace in a cottage, humanity in a bandit, and sincerity in courts. And secondly, in ordinary cases, and in the mixed mass of human affairs, the mind contrives to lay hold of those circumstances and motives which suit its own bias and confirm its natural disposition, whatever it may be, gentle or rough, vulgar or refined, spirited or cowardly, open-hearted or cunning. The will is not blindly impelled by outward accidents, but selects the impressions by which it chooses to be governed with great dexterity and perseverance or the machine may be at the disposal of fortune, the man is still his own master. The soul, under the pressure of circumstances, does not lose its original spring, but, as soon as the pressure is removed, recoils with double violence to its first position. That which any one has been long learning unwillingly, he unlearns with proportionable eagerness and haste. Kings have been said to be incorrigible to experience. The maxim might be extended without injury to the benefit of their subjects, for every man is a king, with all the pride and obstinacy of one, in his own little world. It is only lucky that the rest of the species are not answerable for his caprices. We laugh at the warnings and advice of others, we resent the lessons of adversity, and lose no time in letting it appear that we have escaped from its importunate hold. I do not think, with every assistance from reason and circumstances, that the slothful ever becomes active, the coward brave, the headstrong prudent, the fickle steady, the mean generous, the coarse delicate, the ill-tempered amiable, or the knave honest, but that the restraint of necessity and appearances once taken away, they would relapse into their former and real character again. Cacullus non facit monarchum. Manners, situation, example, fashion have a prodigious influence on exterior deportment, but do they penetrate much deeper? The thief will not steal by day, but his having this command over himself does not do away with his character or calling. The priest cannot indulge in certain irregularities, but unless his pulse beats temperately from the first, he will only be playing a part through life. Again, 
The soldier cannot shrink from his duty in a dastardly manner, but if he has not naturally steady nerves and strong resolution, except in the field of battle, he may be fearful as a woman, though covered with scars and honour. The judge must be disinterested and above suspicion, yet should he have from nature an itching palm, an eye servile and greedy of office, he will somehow contrive to indemnify his private conscience out of his public principle, and husband a reputation for legal integrity as a stake to play the game of political profligacy with more advantage. There is often a contradiction in character which is composed of various and unequal parts, and hence there will arise an appearance of fickleness and inconsistency. A man may be sluggish by the father's side, and of restless and uneasy temper by the mother's, and he may favour either of these inherent dispositions according to circumstances. But he will not have changed his character any more than a man who sometimes lives in one apartment of a house, and then takes possession of another, according to whim or convenience, changes his habitation. The simple phlegmatic never turns to the truly fiery quality. So the really gay or trifling never become thoughtful and serious. The light-hearted wretch takes nothing to heart. He on whom, from natural carelessness of disposition, the shot of accident and dart of chance, fall like drops of oil on water, so that he brushes them aside with heedless hand and smiling face, will never be roused from his volatile indifference to meet inevitable calamities. He may try to laugh them off, but will not put himself to any inconvenience to prevent them. I know a man that, if a tiger were to jump into his room, would only play off some joke, some quip or crank or wanton wile upon him. Mortifications and disappointments may break such a person's heart, but they will be the death of him ere they will make him provident of the future, or willing to forego one idle gratification of the passing moment for any consideration whatever. The dilatory man never becomes punctual. Resolution is of no avail, for the very essence of the character consists in this, that the present impression is of more efficacy than any previous resolution. I have heard it said of a celebrated writer that if he had to get a reprieve from the gallows for himself or a friend, with leave be it spoken, and was to be at a certain place at a given time for this purpose, he would be a quarter of an hour behind hand. What is to be done in this case? Can you talk or argue a man out of his humour? You might as well attempt to talk or argue him out of a lethargy or a fever. The disease is in the blood. You may see it, if you are a curious observer, meandering in his veins and reposing on his eyelids. Some of our foibles are laid in the constitution of our bodies, others in the structure of our minds, and both are irremediable. The vain man, who is full of himself, is never cured of his vanity, but looks for admiration to the last, with a restless, suppliant eye, in the midst of contumely and contempt. The modest man never grows vain from flattery or unexpected applause, for he sees himself in the diminished scale of things. He will not have his nothings monstered. He knows how much he himself wants, how much others have, until you can alter this conviction in him, or make him drunk by infusing some new poison, some celestial ichor, into his veins. You cannot make a coxcomb of him. He is too well aware of the truth of what has been said, that the wisest amongst us is a fool in some things, as the lowest amongst men has some just notions, and therein is as wise as Socrates, so that every man resembles a statue made to stand against a wall or in a niche. On one side it is a Plato, an Apollo, a Demosthenes. On the other it is a rough, unformed piece of stone. Some persons of my acquaintance, who think themselves terris et rotundus, and armed at all points with perfections, would not be much inclined to give in to this sentiment, the modesty of which is only equalled by its sense and ingenuity. The man of sanguine temperament is seldom weaned from his castles in the air, nor can you, by virtue of any theory, convert the cold, careful calculator into a wild enthusiast. A self-tormentor is never satisfied, come what will. He always apprehends the worst, and is indefatigable in conjuring up the apparition of danger. He is uneasy at his own good fortune, as it takes from him his favourite topic of repining and complaint. Let him succeed to his heart's content in all that is reasonable or important, 
yet if there is any one thing and that he is sure to find out in which he does not get on this embitters all the rest i know an instance perhaps it is myself Again, a surly man, in spite of warning, neglects his own interest, and will do so because he has more pleasure in disobliging you than in serving himself. A friendly man will show himself friendly to the last. For those who are said to have been spoiled by prosperity were never really good for anything. A good-natured man never loses his native happiness of disposition. Good temper is an estate for life, and a man born with common sense rarely turns out a very egregious fool. It is more common to see a fool become wise, that is, set up for wisdom, and be taken at his word by fools. We frequently judge of a man's intellectual pretensions by the number of books he writes, of his eloquence by the number of speeches he makes, of his capacity for business by the number of offices he holds. These are not true tests. Many a celebrated author is a known blockhead between friends, and many a minister of state whose gravity and self-importance pass with the world for depth of thought and weight of public care is a laughing-stock to his very servants and dependents. The talents of some men, indeed, which might not otherwise have had a field to display themselves, are called out by extraordinary situations and rise with the occasion. But for all the routine and mechanical preparation, the pomp and parade and big looks of great statesmen, or what is called merely filling office, a very shallow capacity, with a certain immovableness of countenance, is, I suppose, sufficient from what I have seen. Such political machines are not so good as the mock duke in the honeymoon. As to genius and capacity for the works of art and science, all that a man really excels in is his own and incommunicable. What he borrows from others he has in an inferior degree, and it is never what his fame rests on. Sir Joshua observes that Raphael, in his later pictures, showed that he had learnt in some measure the colouring of Titian. If he had learnt it quite, the merit would still have been Titian's, but he did not learn it, and never would. But his expression, his glory and his excellence, was what he had within himself first and last, and this it was that seated him on the pinnacle of fame, a preeminence that no artist without an equal warrant from nature and genius will ever deprive him of. With respect to indications of early genius for particular things, I will just mention that I myself know an instance of a little boy who could catch the hardest tunes when between two and three years old, without any assistance, but hearing them played on a hand organ in the street and who followed the exquisite pieces of Mozart played to him for the first time, so as to fall in like an echo at the close. Was this accident, or education, or natural aptitude? I think the last. All the presumptions are for it, and there are none against it. In fine, do we not see how hard certain early impressions or prejudices acquired later are to overcome? Do we not say habit is a second nature? and shall we not allow the force of nature itself? If the real disposition is concealed for a time and tampered with, how readily it breaks out with the first excuse or opportunity! How soon does the drunkard forget his resolution and constrained sobriety at the sight of the foaming tankard and blazing hearth? Does not the passion for gaming, in which there had been an involuntary pause, return like a madness all at once? It would be needless to offer instances of so obvious a truth. But if this superinduced nature is not to be got the better of by reason or prudence, who shall pretend to set aside the original one by prescription and management? Thus, if we turn to the characters of women, we find that the shrew, the jilt, the coquette, the wanton, the intriguer, the liar, continue all their lives the same. Meet them after the lapse of a quarter or half a century, and they are still infallibly at their old work. No rebuke from experience, no lessons of misfortune make the least impression on them. On they go, and, in fact, they can go on in no other way. They try other things, but it will not do. They are like fish out of water, except in the element of their favourite vices. They might as well not be, as cease to be, what they are by nature and custom. Can the Ethiopian change his skin, or the leopard his spots? 
neither do these wretched persons find any satisfaction or consciousness of their power but in being a plague and a torment to themselves and every one else as long as they can a good sort of woman is a character more rare than any of these but it is equally durable look at the head of hogarth's idle apprentice in the boat holding up his fingers as horns at cuckold's point and ask what penitentiary what prison discipline would change the form of his forehead villainous low or the conceptions lurking within it nothing no mother's fearful warnings nor the formidable precautions of that wiser and more loving mother his country that fellow is still to be met with somewhere in our time is he a spy a jack ketch or an underling of office in truth almost all the characters in hogarth are of the class of incorrigibles so that i often wonder what has become of some of them have the worst of them been cleared out like the breed of noxious animals or have they been swept away like locusts in the whirlwind of the french revolution or has mr bentham put them into his panopticon from which they have come out so that nobody knows them like the chimney sweeper boy at saddler's wells that was thrown into a cauldron and came out a little dapper volunteer i will not deny that some of them may like chaucer's characters have been modernized a little but i think i could retranslate a few of them into their mother tongue the original honest black letter we may refine we may disguise we may equivocate we may compound for our vices without getting rid of them as we change our liquors but do not leave off drinking we may in this respect look forward to a decent and moderate rather than a thorough and radical reform or without going deep into the political question i can conceive we may improve the mechanism if not the texture of society that is we may improve the physical circumstances of individuals and their general relations to the state though the internal character like the grain in wood or the sap in trees that still rises bend them how you will may remain nearly the same the clay that the potter uses may be of the same quality coarse or fine in itself though he may mould it into vessels of very different shape or beauty who shall alter the stamina of national character by any systematic process who shall make the french respectable or the english amiable yet the author of the year two thousand five hundred has done it suppose public spirit to become the general principle of action in the community how would it show itself would it not then become the fashion like loyalty and have its apes and parrots like loyalty the man of principle would no longer be distinguished from the crowd the servum pecus imitatorum there is a cant of democracy as well as of aristocracy and we have seen both triumphant in our day the jacobin of seventeen ninety four was the anti-jacobin of eighteen fourteen the loudest chaunters of the paeans of liberty were the loudest applauders of the restored doctrine of divine right they drifted with the stream they sailed before the breeze in either case the politician was changed the man was the same the very same but enough of this i do not know any moral to be deduced from this view of the subject but one namely that we should mind our own business cultivate our good qualities if we have any and irritate ourselves less about the absurdities of other people which neither we nor they can help i grant there is something in what i have said which might be made to glance towards the doctrines of original sin grace election reprobation or the gnostic principle that acts did not determine the virtue or vice of the character and in those doctrines so far as they are deducible from what i have said i agree but always with a salvo end of section twenty eight read by goldfish Section 29 of The Plain Speaker. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sandra Luna. The Plain Speaker. Opinions on Books, Men, and Things by William Hazlitt. Section 29 On People of Sense people of sense as they are called give themselves great and unwarrantable airs of the rest of the world if we examine the history of mankind
we shall find that the greatest absurdities have been most strenuously maintained by these very persons who give themselves out as wiser than everybody else the fictions of law the quibbles of school divinity the chickenry of politics the mysteries of the cabala the doctrine of divine right and the secret of the philosopher's stone all the grave impostures that have been acted in the world have been the contrivance of those who set up for oracles to their neighbours the learned professions alone have propagated and lent their countenance to as many perverse contradictions and idle fallacies as have puzzled the wits and set the credulous thoughtless unpretending part of mankind together by the ears ever since the distinction between learning and ignorance subsisted it is the part of deep investigators to teach others what they do not know themselves and to prove by infallible rules the truth of any nonsense they happen to take in their heads or choose to give out to amuse the gapping multitude what every one felt and saw for himself the obvious dictates of common sense and humanity such superficial studies as these afforded a very insufficient field for the exercise of reason and abstruse philosophy in the view of the demeanour grave-looking spring-nailed velvet-pawed green-eyed despisers of popular opinion their object has regularly been by taking post in the terra incognita of science to discover what could not be known and to establish what could be of no use if it were hence one age is employed in pulling down what another with infinite pomp and pains has been striving to build up and our greatest proof of wisdom is to unlearn the follies and prejudices that have been instilted into us by our predecessors it took ages of ingenuity of sophistry and learning to incorporate the aristotelian or scholastic philosophy into a complete system of absurdity applicable to all questions and to all the purposes of life and it has taken two centuries of metaphysical acuteness and boldness of inquiry to take to pieces the cumbrous disproportioned edifice and to convert the materials to the construction of the modern french philosophy by means of verbal logic self-evident propositions and undoubted axioms a philosophy just as remote from truth and nature and setting them equally at defiance what a number of parties and school have we in medicine all noisy and dogmatical and agreeing in nothing but content and reprobation of each other again how many sects in religion all confident of being in the right able to bring chapter and verse in support of every doctrine and title of belief all ready to damn and excommunicate one another yet only one out of all these pretenders to superior wisdom and infallibility can be right the conclusions of all the others drawn with such laboured accuracy and supported with such unbending constancy and solemnity are and must be a bundle of heresies and errors how many idle schemes and intolerant practices have taken their rise from no better foundation than a mystic garment a divining rod or pythagoras golden thigh when baxter the celebrated controversial divine and nonconformist minister in the reign of charles the second went to preach at kidderminster he regularly every sunday insisted from the pulpit that baptism was necessary to salvation and roundly asserted that hell was paved with infant skulls this roused the indignation of the poor women of kidderminster so much that they were inclined to pelt their preacher as he passed along the streets his zeal however was as great as theirs and his learning and eloquence greater and he poured out such torrents of texts upon them and such authorities from grave councils and pious divines that the poor women were defeated and forced with tears in their eyes to surrender their natural feelings and unlightened convictions to the proofs from reason and scripture which they did not know how to answer yet these untutored unsophisticated dictates of nature and instinctive affection have in their turn triumphed over all the pride and casuistry and merciless bigotry of calvinism we hear it said 
that the inquisition would not have been lately restored in spain but for the infatuation and prejudices of the populace that is after power and priestcraft have been instilling the poison of superstition and cruelty into the minds of the people for centuries together hoodwinking their understandings and hardening every feeling of the heart it is made a taunt and a triumph over these very people so long the creatures of the government carefully moulded by them like clay in the potter's hand into vessels not of honour but of dishonour that their prejudices and misguided zeal are the only obstacles that stand in the way of the adoption of more liberal and humane principles the engines and establishments of tyranny however are the work of cool plotting specious heads and not the spontaneous product of the levity and rashness of the multitude it is a work of time to reconcile them to such abominable and revolting abuses of power and authority as it is a work of time to wean them from their monstrous infatuation we may trace a speculative absurdity or practical enormity of this kind into its tenth or fifteenth century supported story above story gloss upon gloss till it mocks at heaven and tramples upon earth propped up on decrees and councils and synods and appeals to popes and cardinals and fathers of the church all grave reverend men with the regular clergy and people at their side battling for it and others below schismatics and heretics are punching it till in the din and commotion and collision of dry rubs and hard blows it loses ground as it rose century by century is taken to pieces by timid friends and determined foes totters and falls and not a fragment of it is left upon another a text of scripture or a passage of ecclesiastical history is for one whole century torn to tatters to very rags and wrangled and fought for as maintaining the doctrine of the true and catholic church in the next century after that the whole body of the reformed clergy lutherans calvinists arminians get hold of it wrest it out of the hands of their adversaries and twist and torture it in a thousand different ways to overturn the abominations of antichrist in the third a great cabal a clamour a noise like the confusion of babel jealousies feuds heart burnings wars in countries division in family schisms in the church arise because this text has been thought to favour a lax interpretation of an article of faith necessary to salvation and in the fourth century from the time the question began to be agitated with so much heat and fury it is discovered that no such text existed in the genuine copies yet all and each of these popes councils fathers of the church reformed leaders lutherans calvinists independents presbyterian sects schisms clergy people all believe that their own interpretation is the true sense that compared with this fabricated and spurious faith of theirs the pillared firmament is rottenness and earth's base built on stumble and are so far from being disposed to treat the matter lightly or to suppose it possible that they do not proceed on solid and undubitable grounds in every contradiction they run into that they would hand over to the civil power to be consigned to a prison the galleys or the stake as it happened any one who demurred from a single instant to their being people of sense gravity and wisdom sense that is that sort of sense which consists in pretension and a claim to superiority is shown not in things that are plain and clear but in deciding upon doubts and difficulties the greater the doubt therefore the greater must be the dogmatism and the consequential airs of those who profess to settle points beyond the reach of the vulgar nay to increase the authority of such persons the utmost stress must be laid on the most frivolous as well as ticklish questions and the most unconsciousable absurdities have always had the stoutest sticklers and the most numerous victims the affectation of sense so far then has given birth to more folly and done more mischief than any one thing else hence we may perhaps be able to assign one reason why those arts which do not undertake to unfold mysteries and inculcate dogmas 
generally shine out at first with full lustre, because they start from the vantage ground of nature, and are not buried under the dust and rubbish of ages of perverse prejudice. Pibical critics were a long time at work to strip Popery of her finery, muffled up as she was in the formal disguises of interest, pride, and bigotry. It was like peeling off the coats of an onion, which is a work of time and patience. Titinian, on the other hand, which our Protestant painters are sometimes amazed at, saw the colour of the skin at once, without any intellectual film spread over it. Raphael painted the action and passions of men, without any indirect process as he found them. The fine arts, such as painting, which reveals the face of nature, and poetry, which paints the heart of man, are true and unsophisticated, because they are conversant with real objects, and because they are cultivated for amusement without any further view or interference, and please by the truth of imitation only. Yet your people of sense, in all ages, have made a point of scouting the arts of painting and music and poetry, as frivolous, effeminate, and worthless, as appealing to sentiment and fancy alone, and involving no useful theory or principle, because they afforded them no scoop, no opportunity for darkening knowledge, and setting up their own blindness and frailty as the measure of abstract truth, and the standard of universal property. Poetry acts by sympathy with nature, that is, with the natural impulses, customs, and imaginations of men, and is, on that account, always popular, delightful, and at the same time instructive. It is nature moralizing and idealizing for us, inasmuch as, by showing us things as they are, it implicitly teaches us what they ought to be and the grosser feelings, by passing through the strainers of this imaginary, wide-extended experience, acquire an involuntary tendency to higher objects. Shakespeare was, in this sense, not only one of the greatest poets, but one of the greatest moralists that we have. Those who read him are the happier, better, and wiser for it. No one, that I know of, is the happier, better, or wiser for reading Mr. Shelley's Prometheus Unbound. One thing is that nobody reads it, and the reason for one or both is the same, that he is not a poet, but a sophist, a theorist, a controversial writer in verse. He gives us, for representations of things, rhapsodies of words. He does not lend the colours of imagination and the ornaments of style to the objects of nature, but paints gaudy, flimsy allegorical pictures on gauze, on the cobwebs of his own brain, Gorgons and Idris and Chimeria's dire. He assumes certain doubtful speculative notions, and proceeds to prove their truth by describing them in detail as matters of fact. This mixture of fanatic zeal with poetical licentiousness is not quite the thing. The poet describes what he pleases as he pleases. If he is not tied down to certain given principles, if he is not to plead prejudice and opinion as his warrant or excuse, we are left out at sea, at the mercy of every reckless fancy monger who may be tempted to erect an ipse dixit of his own, by the help of a few idle flourishes and extravagant epithets, into an exclusive system of morals and philosophy. The poet describes vividly and individually so that any general results from what he writes must be from the aggregate of well-founded particulars, to embody an abstract theory, as if it were a given part of actual nature, is an impertinence and indecorum. The charm of poetry, however, depends on the union of fancy with reality, on its findings that tally in the human breast and without this all its tumid efforts will be less pernicious and than vain and abortive. Plato showed himself to be a person of frigid apprehension, with eye severed and beard a formal cut, when he banished the poets from his republic to corruptors of morals, because they described the various passions and affections of the mind. This did not suit with that procrustes bed of criticism on which he wished to stretch and loop them, but Homer's imitations of nature have been more popular than Plato's inversions of her and his morality is at least as sound. 
the errors of nature are accidental and pardonable those of science are systematic and incorrigible the understanding or reasoning faculty presumes too much over her younger sisters and yet plays as fantastic tricks as any of them only with more solemnity which enhances the evil we have partially seen what rights she has on the score of past behaviour to set up for a strict and unerring guide the haughtiness of her pretensions at present full of wise souls and modern instances is not the most unequivocal pledge of her abandonment of her old errors to bring down this account then from the ancients to the moderns people of sense the self-conceited wise are at all times at issue with common sense and feeling they formerly dogmatized on speculative matters out of the reach of common apprehension they now dogmatize with the same headstrong self-sufficiency on practical questions more within the province of actual inquiry and observation in this new and more circumscribed career they set out with exploding the sense of all those who have gone before them as of too light and fanciful a texture they make a clear stage of all firmer opinions get rid of the mixed modes of prejudice authority suggestion and begin de novo with reason for their rule certainty for their guide and the greatest possible good as a sine qua non the modern panoptic and christomathic school of reformers and reconstructors of society propose to do it upon entirely mechanical and scientific principles nothing short of that will satisfy their scrupulous pretensions to wisdom and gravity they proceed by the rule and compass by logical diagrams and with none but demonstrable conclusions and leave all the taste fancy and sentiment of the thing to the admirers of mr burke's reflection on the french revolution that work is to them a very flimsy and superficial performance because it is rhetorical and figurative and they judge of solidity by barrenness of depth by dryness till they see a little farther into it they will not be able to answer it or counteract its influence and yet that there were a task of some importance to achieve they say that the proportions are false because the colouring is fine which is bad logic if they do not like a painted statue a florid argument that is a matter of taste and not of reasoning some may conceive that the gold the sterling bullion of thought is the better for being wrought into rich and elegant figures they are the only people who contend that it is the worse on that account those crude projectors give in their new plan and elevation of society neither princesses palaces nor poor men's cottages but a sort of log houses and gable ends in which the solid contents and square dimensions are to be ascertained and parcelled out to a nicety they employ the carpenter joiner and bricklayer but will have nothing to say to the plasterer painter paper hanger upholsterer carver and gilder and etc so that i am afraid in this fastidious and luxurious age they will hardly find tenants for their bare walls and skeletons of houses run up in haste and by the job their system wants house-warming it is destitute of comfort as of outside show it has nothing to recommend it but its poverty and nakedness they profess to set aside and reject all compromise with the prejudices of authority the allurements of sense the customs of the world and the instincts of nature they will make a man with a quadrant as the tailors at laputa made a suit with clothes they put the mind into a machine as the potter puts a lump of clay into a mould and out it comes in any clumsy or disagreeable shape that they would have it they hate all grace ornament elegance they are addicted to a true science but sworn enemies to the fine arts they are a kind of puritans in morals do you suppose that the race of the iconoclasts is dead with the dispute in land's time about image worship we have just the same set of moon-side philosophers in our days who cannot bear to be dazzled with the sun of beauty they are only half alive they can distinguish the hard edges and determine outlines of things 
but are alike insensible to the stronger impulses of passion to the finer essences of thought their intellectual food does not assimilate with the juices of the mind or turn to subtle spirit but lies a crude undigested heap of material substance begetting only the windy impertinence of words they are acquainted with the form not the power of truth they insist on what is necessary and never arrive at what is desirable they refer everything to utility and yet banish pleasure with stoic pride and cynic slovenliness they talk big of increasing the sum of human happiness and yet in the mighty grasp and extension of their views leave hardly any one source from which the smallest ray of satisfaction can be derived they have an instinctive aversion to plays novels amusements of every kind and this not so much from affectation or want of knowledge as from sheer incapacity and want of taste show one of these men of narrow comprehension a beautiful prospect and he wonders you can take delight in what is of no use you would hardly suppose that this very person had written a book and was perhaps at the moment holding an argument to prove that nothing is useful but what pleases speak of shakespeare and another of the same automatic school will tell you he has read him but could find nothing in him point to hogarth and they do confess there is something in his prints that by contrast throws a pleasing light on their utopian schemes and the future progress of society one of these pseudo philosophers would think it a disparagement to compare him to aristotle he fancies himself as great a man as aristotle was in his day and that the world is much wiser now than it was in the time of aristotle he would be glad to live the ten remaining years of his life a year at time at the end of the next ten centuries to see the effect of his writings on social institutions though posterity will know no more than his contemporaries that so great a man never existed so little does he know of himself or the world persons of his class indeed cautiously shut themselves up from society and take no more notice of men than of animals and from their ignorance of what mankind are can tell exactly what they will be what can he reason but from what we know is not their maxim reason with them is a mathematical force that acts with most certainty in the absence of experience in the vacuum of pure speculation these secure alarmists and dreaming guardians of the state are like superannuated watchmen enclosed in a sentry box that never hear when thieves break through and steal they put an oil skin over their heads that the dust raised by the passions and interests of the countless ever moving multitude may not annoy or disturb the clearness of their vision they build a penitentiary and are satisfied that diet street bloomsbury square will no longer send forth its hordes of young delinquents an airy of children the embryo performers on locks and pockets for the next generation they put men into a panopticon like a glass hive to carry on all sorts of handicrafts so work the honey-bees under the omnipresent eye of the inventor and want and idleness are banished from the world they propose to erect a christomatic school by cutting down some fine old trees on the classical ground where milton thought and wrote to introduce a rabble of children who for the greek and latin languages poetry and history that fine pabulum of useful enthusiasm that breath of immortality infused into our youthful blood that balm and cordial of our future years are to be drugged with chemistry and apothecary's receipts are to be taught to do everything and to see and feel nothing that the grubbing up of elegant arts and polite literature may be followed by the systematic introduction of accomplished barbarism and mechanical quackery such enlightened geniuses would pull down stone edge to build pig styes and would convert westminster abbey into a central house of correction it would be in vain to point to the arched windows shedding a dim religious light to touch the deep solemn organ stop in their ears to turn to the statue of newton to gaze up the sculptured marble on the walls to call back the hopes and fears that lie buried there to cast a wistful look at poet's corner 
they scorn the muse all this would not stand one moment in the way of any of the schemes of these retrograde reformers who instead of being legislators for the world and stewards to the intellectual inheritance of nations are hardly fit to be parish beadles or pettifogging attorneys to a litigated state their speech bewrayeth them the leader of this class of reasoners does not write to be understood because he would not make fewer converts if he did the language he adopts is his own a word to the wise a technical and conventional jargon unintelligible to others and conveying no idea to himself in common with the rest of mankind purposely cut off from human sympathy and ordinary apprehension mr bentham's writings require to be translated into a foreign tongue or his own before they can be read at all except by the adepts this is not a very fair or very wise proceeding no man who invents words arbitrarily can be sure that he uses them conscientiously there is no check upon him in the popular criticism exercised by the mass of readers there is no clue to propriety in the habitual association of his own mind he who pretends to fit words to things will much oftener accommodate things to words to answer a theory words are a measure of truth they are certain intuitively the degrees inflections and powers of things in a wonderful manner and he who voluntarily deprives himself of their assistance does not go the way to arrive at any very nice or sure results language is the medium of our communication with the thoughts of others but whoever becomes wise becomes wise by sympathy whoever is powerful becomes so by making others sympathize with him to think justly we must understand what others mean to know the value of our thoughts we must try their effect on other minds there is this privilege in the use of a conventional style as there was in that of the learned languages a man may be as absurd as he pleases without being ridiculous his folly and his wisdom are alike a secret to the generality if it were possible to contrive a perfect language consistent with itself and answering to the complexity of human affairs there would be some excuse for the attempt but he who knows anything of the nature of language or of the complexity of human thought knows that this is impossible what is gained in formality is more than lost in force ease and perspicuity mr bentham's language in short is like his reasoning a logical apparatus which will work infallibly and perform wonders taking it for granted that his principles and definitions are universally true and intelligible but as this is not exactly the case neither the one nor the other is of much use or authority thus the maxim that mankind act from calculation may be in a general sense true but the moment you apply this maxim to subject all their actions systematically and demonstrably to reason and to exclude passion both in common and extreme cases you give it a sense in which the principle is false and in which all the inferences built upon it many and mighty no doubt fall to the ground madmen reason but in what proportion does this hold good how far does reason guide them or their madness err there is a difference between reason and madness in this respect but according to mr bentham there can be none for all men act from calculation and equally so so runs the bond passion is liable to be restrained by reason as drunkenness may be changed to sobriety by some strong motive but passion is not reason that is does not act by the same rule or law and therefore all that follows is that men act according to the common sense of the thing either from passion or reason from impulse or calculation more or less as circumstances lead but no sweeping metaphysical conclusion can be drawn from hence as if reason were absolute and passion a mere nonity in the government of the world people in general or writers speculating on human actions form wrong judgments concerning them because they decide coolly and at the distance on what is done in the heat and on the spur of the occasion man is not a machine nor is he to be measured by mechanical rules 
the decisions of abstract reason would apply to what men might do if all men were philosophers but if all men were philosophers there would be no need of systems of philosophy the race of alchemists and visionaries is not yet extinct and what is remarkable we find them existing in the shape of deep logicians and enlightened legislators they have got a menstrual for dissolving the lead and copper of society and turning it to pure gold as the adepts of old had a trick for finding the philosopher's stone the author of st leon has represented his hero as possessed of the exilir vitae and aurum potabile the author of political justice has adopted one half of this romantic fiction as a serious hypothesis and maintains the natural immortality of men without a figure the truth is that persons of the most precise and formal understandings are persons of the loosest and most extravagant imaginations take from them their norma loquendi their literal clue and there is no absurdity into which they will not fall with pleasure they have no means or principle of judging of that which does not admit of absolute proof and between this and the idlest fiction they perceive no medium as those artists who take likenesses with a machine are quite thrown out in their calculations when they have to rely on the eye or hand alone people who are accustomed to trust to their imaginations or feelings know how far to go and how to keep within certain limits those who seldom exert these faculties are all abroad in a wide sea of speculation without rudder or compass the instant they leave the shore of matter-of-fact or dry reasoning and never stop short of the last absurdity they go all lengths or none they laugh at poets and are themselves lunatics they are the dupes of all sorts of projectors and impostors being of a busy meddlesome turn they are for reducing whatever comes into their heads and cannot be demonstrated by mood and figure to amount to a contradiction in terms to practice what they would scout in a fiction they would set about realizing in sober sadness and melt their fortunes in compassing what others consider as the amusement of an idle hour astolfo's voyage to the moon in ariosto they criticized sharply as a quaint and ridiculous burlesque but if any one had the face seriously to undertake such a thing they would immediately patronize it and defy any one to prove by a logical dilemma that the attempt was physically impossible so again we find that painters and engravers whose attention is confined and riveted to a minute investigation of actual objects or of visible lines and surfaces are apt to fly out into all extravagance and rhapsodies of the most unbridled fanaticism several of the most eminent are at this moment swedenborgians animal magnetisms and etc the mind as it should seem too long tied down to the evidence of sense and a number of trifling particulars is wearied of the bondage revolts at it and instinctively takes refuge in the wildest schemes and most magnificent contradictions of an unlimited faith poets on the contrary who are continually throwing off the superfluities of feeling or fancy in little sportive sallies and short excursions with a muse do not find the want of any greater or more painful effort of thought leave the ascent of the highest heaven of invention as a holiday task to persons of more mechanical habits and turn of mind and the characters of poet and sceptic are now often united in the same individual as those of poet and prophet were supposed to be of old end of section twenty nine recording by sandra luna section thirty of the plain speaker this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by nicole lee the plain speaker opinions on books men and things 
by William Hazlitt. Section 30. On Antiquity. There is no such thing as antiquity in the ordinary acceptation we affix to the term. Whatever is or has been, while it is passing, must be modern. The early ages may have been barbarous in themselves, but they have become ancient with the slow and silent lapse of successive generations. The olden times are only such in reference to us. The past is rendered strange, mysterious, visionary, awful, from the great gap in time that parts us from it, and the long perspective of waning years. Things gone by and almost forgotten look dim and dull, uncouth and quaint, from our ignorance of them and the mutability of customs. But in their day they were fresh, unimpaired, in full vigour, familiar and glossy. The children in the wood and Percy's relics were once recent productions, and old Robin Gray was in his time a very commonplace old fellow. The wars of York and Lancaster, while they lasted, were lively, audible, and full of vent, as fresh and lusty as the white and red roses that distinguished their different banners, though they have since become a byword and a solecism in history. The sun shone in Julius Caesar's time, just as it does now. On the roadside between Winchester and Salisbury are some remains of old Roman encampments, with their double lines of circumvallation, now turned into pasturage for sheep, which answer exactly to the descriptions of this kind. In Caesar's commentaries, in a dull and cloudy atmosphere, I can conceive that this is the identical spot that the first Caesar trod, and figure to myself the deliberate movements and scarcely perceptible march of close-embodied legions. But if the sun breaks out, making its way through dazzling, fleecy clouds, lights up the blue serene, and gilds the sombre earth, I can no longer persuade myself that it is the same scene as formerly, or transfer the actual image before me so far back. The brightness of nature is not easily reduced to the low twilight tone of history, and the impressions of sense defeat and dissipate the faint traces of learning and tradition. It is only by an effort of reason, to which fancy is averse, that I bring myself to believe that the sun shone as bright, that the sky was as blue, and the earth as green, two thousand years ago as it is at present. How ridiculous this seems! Yet so it is. The dark, or middle ages, when everything was hid in the fog and haze of confusion and ignorance, seem, to the same involuntary kind of prejudice, older and further off, and more inaccessible to the imagination than the brilliant and well-defined periods of Greece and Rome. A Gothic ruin appears buried in a greater depth of obscurity, to be weighed down and rendered venerable with the hoar of more distant ages, to have been longer mouldering into neglect and oblivion, to be a record and memento of events more wild and alien to our own times than a Grecian temple. Amadis de Gaulle, and the seven champions of Christendom, with me, honestly speaking, rank as contemporaries with Theseus, Pirithous, and the heroes of the fabulous ages. My imagination will stretch no further back into the commencement of time than the first traces and rude dawn of civilization and mighty enterprise in either case. And in attempting to force it upwards, by the scale of chronology, it only recoils upon itself, and dwindles from a lofty survey of the dark rearward and abyss of time, into a poor and puny calculation of insignificant ciphers. In like manner, I cannot go back to any time more remote and dreary than that recorded in Stowe's and Hollinshed's chronicles. 
unless I turn to the wars of old Asarachus and Inachus divine, and the gorgeous events of Eastern history, where the distance of place may be said to add to the length of time and weight of thought, that is, old in sentiment and poetry, which is decayed, shadowy, imperfect, out of date, and changed from what it was, that of which we have a distinct idea, which comes before us entire and made out in all its parts, will have a novel appearance, however old in reality, and cannot be impressed with the romantic and superstitious character of antiquity, those times that we can parallel with our own in civilization and knowledge, seem advanced into the same line with our own in the order of progression. The perfection of art does not look like the infancy of things, or those times are prominent and, as it were, confront the present age, that are raised high in the scale of polished society, and the trophies of which stand out above the low, obscure, grovelling level of barbarism and rusticity. Thus Rome and Athens were two cities set on a hill that could not be hid, and that everywhere meet the retrospective eye of history. It is not the full-grown, articulated, thoroughly accomplished periods of the world that we regard with the pity or reverence due to age, so much as those imperfect, unformed, uncertain periods which seem to totter on the verge of non-existence, to shrink from the grasp of our feeble imaginations, as they crawl out of, or retire into, the womb of time, and of which our utmost assurance is to doubt whether they ever were, or not. To give some other instances of this feeling, taken at random, Whittington and his cat, the first and favourite studies of my childhood, are, to my way of thinking, as old and reverend personages as any recorded in more authentic history. It must have been long before the invention of triple bob majors that bow bells rang out their welcome never-to-be-forgotten peal, hailing him thrice Lord Mayor of London. Does not all we know, relating to the sight of old London Wall, and the first stones that were laid of this mighty metropolis seem of a far older date, hid in the lap of chaos and old night, than the splendid and imposing details of the decline and fall of the Roman Empire. Again, the early Italian pictures of Cimabue, Giotto, and Ghirlandaio are covered with the marks of unquestionable antiquity, while the Greek statues, done a thousand years before them, shine in glossy, undiminished splendour, and flourish in immortal youth and beauty. The latter Grecian gods, as we find them there represented, are to all appearance a race of modern fine gentlemen, who led the life of honour with their favourite mistresses of mortal or immortal mould, were gallant, graceful, well-dressed, and well-spoken, whereas the Gothic deities long after, carved in horrid wood or misshapen stone, and worshipped in dreary waste or tangled forest, belong, in the mind's heraldry, to almost as ancient a date as those elder and discarded gods of the pagan mythology, Ops and Rhea, and old Saturn, those strange anomalies of earth and cloudy spirit, born of the elements, and conscious will, and clothing themselves, and all things, with shape and formal being. 
The chronicle of Brute in Spencer's Fairy Queen has a tolerable air of antiquity in it. So in the dramatic line, the ghost of one of the old kings of Ormus, introduced as prologue to Fulk Greville's play of Mustapha, is reasonably far-fetched and palpably obscure. A monk in the Popish calendar, or even in the Canterbury Tales, is a more questionable and out-of-the-way personage than the Chiron of Achilles, or the priest in Homer. When Chaucer, in his Troilus and Cressida, makes the Trojan hero invoke the absence of light, in these two lines, What profferest thou this light here for to seller? Go sell it him, that smaller sealer's graver. He is guilty of an anachronism, or at least I much doubt whether there was such a profession as that of seal engraver in the Trojan War. But the dimness of the objects and the quaintness of the allusion throw us further back into the night of time than the golden glittering images of the Iliad. The travels of Anacarsis are less obsolete at this time of day than Coriat's crudities or Fuller's worthies. Here is some of the ancient city, said a Roman, taking up a handful of dust from beneath his feet. The ground we tread on is as old as the creation, though it does not seem so, except when collected into gigantic masses, or separated by gloomy solitudes from modern uses and the purposes of common life. The lone Helvellyn and the silent Andes are in thought coeval with the globe itself, and can only perish with it. The pyramids of Egypt are vast, sublime, old, eternal, but Stonehenge, built no doubt in a later day, satisfies my capacity for the sense of antiquity. It seems as if as much rain had drizzled on its grey, withered head, and it had watched out as many winter nights. The hand of time is upon it, and it has sustained the burden of years upon its back, a wonder and a ponderous riddle, time out of mind, without known origin or use, baffling fable or conjecture, the credulity of the ignorant, or wise men's search. Thou noblest monument of Albion's isle, whether by Merlin's aid, from Scythia's shore to Amber's fatal plain Pendragon bore, huge frame of giant hands, the mighty pile, to entomb his Britain slain by Henge's skyle, or druid priests, sprinkled with human gore, taught mid thy massy maze their mystic lore, or Danish chiefs, enriched with savage spoil, to victory's idle vast and unhewn shrine, reared the rude heap, or in thy hallowed ground repose the kings of Brutus' genuine line, or here those kings in solemn state were crowned, studious to trace thy wondrous origin. We muse on many an ancient tale renowned. Wharton So it is with respect to ourselves also. It is the sense of change or decay that marks the difference between the real and apparent progress of time, both in the events of our lives and the history of the world we live in. Impressions of a peculiar and accidental nature, of which few traces are left, and which return seldom or never, fade in the distance and are consigned to obscurity, while those that belong to a given and definite class are kept up and assume a constant and tangible form from familiarity and habit. That which was personal to myself merely is lost and confounded with other things, like a drop in the ocean. It was but a point at first which, by its nearness, affected me, and by its removal becomes nothing. While circumstances of a general interest and abstract importance present the same distinct well-known aspect as ever, and are durable in proportion 
to the extent of their influence. Our own idle feelings and foolish fancies we get tired or grow ashamed of, as their novelty wears out. When we become men, we put away childish things. But the impressions we derive from the exercise of our higher faculties last as long as the faculties themselves. They have nothing to do with time, place, and circumstance, and are of universal applicability and recurrence. An incident in my own history that delighted or tormented me very much at the time, I may have long since blotted from my memory, or have great difficulty in calling to mind after a certain period. But I can never forget the first time of my seeing Mrs. Siddons act, which is as if it happened yesterday. And the reason is because it has been something for me to think of ever since. The petty and the personal, that which appeals to our senses and our appetites, passes away with the occasion that gives it birth. The grand and the ideal, that which appeals to the imagination, can only perish with it, and remains with us, unimpaired in its lofty abstraction, from youth to age, as wherever we go, we still see the same heavenly bodies shining over our heads. An old familiar face, the house that we were brought up in, sometimes the scenes and places that we formerly knew and loved, may be changed, so that we hardly know them again. The characters in books, the faces in old pictures, the propositions in Euclid, remain the same as when they were first pointed out to us. There is a continual alternation of generation and decay in individual forms and feelings that marks the progress of existence and the ceaseless current of our lives borne along with it. But this does not extend to our love of art or knowledge of nature. It seems a long time ago since some of the first events of the French Revolution. The prominent characters that figured then have been swept away and succeeded by others. Yet I cannot say that this circumstance has in any way abated my hatred of tyranny, or reconciled my understanding to the fashionable doctrine of divine right. The sight of an old newspaper of that date would give one a fit of the spleen for half an hour. On the other hand, it must be confessed, Mr. Burke's reflections on this subject are as fresh and dazzling as in the year 1791, and his letter to a noble lord is even now as interesting as Lord John Russell's letter to Mr. Wilberforce, which appeared only a few weeks back. Ephemeral politics and stillborn productions are speedily consigned to oblivion. Great principles and original works are a match even for time itself. We may, by following up this train of ideas, give some account why time runs faster as our years increase. We gain by habit and experience a more determinate and settled, that is, a more uniform notion of things. We refer each particular to a given standard. Our impressions acquire the character of identical propositions. Our most striking thoughts are turned into a truisms. One observation is like another that I made formerly. The idea I have of a certain character or subject is just the same as I had ten years ago. I have learnt nothing since. There is no alteration perceptible, no advance made, so that the two points of time seem to touch and coincide. I get from the one to the other immediately, by the familiarity of habit, by the undistinguishing process of abstraction. What I can recall so easily and mechanically does not seem far off. It is completely within my reach, and consequently close to me in apprehension. I have no intricate web of curious speculation to wind or unwind, to pass from one state of feeling and opinion to the other. 
no complicated train of associations, which place an immeasurable barrier between my knowledge or my ignorance at different epochs. There is no contrast, no repugnance to widen the interval, no new sentiment infused, like another atmosphere, to lengthen the perspective. I am but where I was. I see the object before me, just as I have been accustomed to do. The ideas are written down in the brain, as in the page of a book. Totidem verbis et literis. The mind becomes stereotyped. By not going forward to explore new regions, or break up new grounds, we are thrown back more and more upon our past acquisitions, and this habitual recurrence increases the facility and indifference with which we make the imaginary transition. By thinking of what has been, we change places with ourselves, and transpose our personal identity at will so as to fix the slider of our improgressive continuance at whatever point we please. This is an advantage or a disadvantage which we have not in youth. After a certain period, we neither lose nor gain, neither add to nor diminish our stock. Up to that period, we do nothing else but lose our former notions and being, and gain a new one every instant. Our life is like the birth of a new day. The dawn breaks apace, and the clouds clear away. A new world of thought and observation is open to our search. A year makes the difference of an age. A total alteration takes place in our ideas, feelings, habits, looks. We outgrow ourselves, a separate set of objects, of the existence of which we had not a suspicion, engages and occupies our whole souls. Shapes and colours of all varieties, and of gorgeous tint, intercept our view of what we were. Life thickens, time glows on its axle. Every revolution of the wheel gives an unsettled aspect to things. The world and its inhabitants turn round, and we forget one change of scene in another. Art woos us, science tempts us into her intricate labyrinths. Each step presents unlooked-for vistas, and closes upon us our backward path. Our onward road is strange, obscure, and infinite. We are bewildered in a shadow, lost in a dream. Our perceptions have the brightness and the indistinctness of a trance. Our continuity of consciousness is broken, crumbles, and falls in pieces. We go on, learning and forgetting every hour. Our feelings are chaotic, confused, strange to each other and to ourselves. Our life does not hang together, but straggling, disjointed, winds its slow length along, stretching out to the endless future, unmindful of the ignorant past. We see many beings in one, and cast the slough of our existence daily. The birth of knowledge is the generation of time. The unfolding of our experience is long and voluminous. Nor do we all at once recover from our surprise at the number of objects that distract our attention. Every new study is a separate, arduous and insurmountable undertaking. We are lost in wonder at the magnitude the difficulty and the interminable prospect. We spell out the first years of our existence, like learning a lesson for the first time, where every advance is slow, doubtful, interesting. Afterwards we rehearse our parts by rote, and are hardly conscious of the meaning. A very short period, from fifteen to twenty-five or thirty, includes the whole map and table of contents of human life. From that time we may be said to live our lives over again, repeat ourselves. The same thoughts return at stated intervals, like the tunes of a barrel organ, and the volume of the universe is no more than a form of words and book of reference. 
Time, in general, is supposed to move faster or slower, as we attend more or less to the succession of our ideas, in the same manner as distance is increased or lessened, by the greater or less variety of intervening objects. There is, however, a difference in this respect. Suspense, where the mind is engrossed with one idea, and kept from amusing itself with any other, is not only the most uncomfortable, but the most tiresome of all things. The fixing our attention on a single point makes us more sensible of the delay, and hangs an additional weight of fretful impatience on every moment of expectation. People in country places, without employment or artificial resources, complain that time lies heavy on their hands. Its leaden pace is not occasioned by the quantity of thought, but by vacancy and the continual languid craving after excitement. It wants spirit and vivacity to give it motion. We are on the watch to see how time goes, and it appears to lag behind because, in the absence of objects to arrest our immediate attention, we are always getting on before it. We do not see its divisions, but we feel the galling pressure of each creeping sand that measures out our hours. Again, a rapid succession of external objects and amusements, which leave no room for reflection, and where one gratification is forgotten in the next, makes time pass quickly as well as delightfully. We do not perceive an extent of surface, but only a succession of points. We are whirled swiftly along by the hand of dissipation, but cannot stay to look behind us. On the contrary, change of scene, travelling through a foreign country, or the meeting with a variety of striking adventures that lay hold of the imagination, and continue to haunt it in a waking dream, will make days seem weeks. From the crowd of events, the number of distinct points of view brought into a small compass, we seem to have passed through a great length of time, when it is no such thing. In traversing a flat, barren country, the monotony of our ideas fatigues and makes the way longer, whereas, if the prospect is diversified and picturesque, we get over the miles without counting them. In painting or writing, ours are melted almost into minutes. The mind, absorbed in the eagerness of its pursuit, forgets the time necessary to accomplish it, and indeed the clock often finds us employed on the same thought, or part of a picture, that occupied us when it struck last. It seems, then, there are several other circumstances besides the number and distinctness of our ideas to be taken into the account in the measure of time, or in considering whom time ambles withal, whom time gallops withal, and whom he stands still withal. Time wears away slowly with a man in solitary confinement, not from the number or variety of his ideas, but from their weary sameness, fretting like drops of water. The imagination may distinguish the lapse of time by the brilliant variety of its tints and the many striking shapes it assumes. The heart feels it by the weight of sadness and grim-visaged, comfortless despair. I will conclude this subject with remarking that the fancied shortness of life is aided by the apprehension of a future state. The constantly directing our hopes and fears to a higher state of being beyond the present necessarily brings death habitually before us, and defines the narrow limits within which we hold our frail existence, as mountains bound the horizon and unavoidably draw our attention to it. This may be one reason, among others, why the fear of death was a less prominent feature in ancient times than it is at present, because the thoughts of it, and of a future state, were less frequently impressed on the mind by religion and morality. The greater progress of civilization and security in modern times has also considerably to do with our practical effeminacy. For though the old pagans were not bound to think of death 
as a religious duty, they never could foresee when they should be compelled to submit to it, as a natural necessity, or accident of war, etc. They viewed death, therefore, with an eye of speculative indifference and practical resolution, that the idea of annihilation did not impress them with the same horror and repugnance as it does the modern believer, or even infidel, is easily accounted for, though a writer in the Edinburgh Review thinks the question insoluble, from this plain reason, viz., that not being taught from childhood a belief in a future state of existence as a part of the creed of their country, the supposition that there was no such fate in store for them could not shock their feelings or confound their imagination in the same manner as it does with us who have been brought up in such a belief and who live with those who deeply cherish and would be unhappy without a full conviction of it. It is the Christian religion alone that takes us to the highest pinnacle of the temple to point out to us the glory hereafter to be revealed and that makes us shrink back with affright from the precipice of annihilation that yawns below. Those who have never entertained a hope cannot be greatly staggered by having it struck from under their feet. Those who have never been led to expect the reversion of an estate will not be excessively disappointed at finding that the inheritance has descended to others. End of section 30Section 31 of The Plain Speaker. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Chieco. The Plain Speaker. Opinions on Books, Men, and Things by William Hazlitt. Section 31 on the Difference Between Writing and Speaking, Part 1. Some minds are proportioned to that which may be dispatched at once or within a short return of time others to that which begins afar off and is to be one with length of pursuit bacon it is a common observation that few persons can be found who speak and write equally well not only is it obvious that the two faculties do not always go together in the same proportions but they are not usually in direct opposition to each other we find that the greatest authors often make the worst company in the world and again some of the liveliest fellows imaginable in conversation or extempore speaking seem to lose all their vivacity and spirit the moment they set pen to paper for this a greater degree of quickness or slowness of parts education habit temper turn of mind and a variety of collateral and predisposing causes are necessary to account the subject is at least curious and worthy of an attempt to explain it I shall endeavour to illustrate the difference by familiar examples rather than by analytical reasonings. The philosopher of old was not unwise who defined motion by getting up and walking. The great leading distinction between writing and speaking is that more time is allowed for the one than the other, and hence different faculties are required for, and different objects attained by, each he is properly the best speaker who can collect together the greatest number of opposite ideas at a moment's warning. He is properly the best writer who can give utterance to the greatest quantity of valuable knowledge in the course of his whole life. The chief requisite for the one, then, appears to be quickness and facility of perception, for the other, patience of soul and a power increasing with the difficulties it has to master. He cannot be denied to be an expert speaker, a lively companion who is never at a loss for something to say on every occasion or subject that offers he by the same rule will make a respectable writer who by dint of study can find out anything good to say upon any one point that has not been touched upon before or who by asking for time can give the most complete and comprehensive view of any question the one must be done off-hand at a single blow the other can only be done by a repetition of blows by having time to think and do better in speaking less is required of you if you only do it at once with grace and spirit in writing you stipulate for all that you are capable of but you have the choice of your own time and subject you do not expect from the manufacturer the same dispatch in executing an order 
that you do from a shopman or warehouseman the difference of quicker and slower however is not all that is merely a difference of comparison in doing the same thing but the writer and speaker have to do things essentially different besides habit and greater or less facility there is also a certain reach of capacity a certain depth or shallowness grossness or refinement of intellect which marks out the distinction between those whose chief ambition is to shine by producing an immediate effect or who are thrown back by natural bias on the severe researches of thought and study we see persons of that standard or texture of mind that they can do nothing but on the spur of the occasion if they have time to deliberate they are lost there are others who have no resource who cannot advance a step by any efforts or assistance beyond a successful arrangement of commonplaces but these they have always at command at everybody's service there is mr fletcher meet him where you will in the street he has his topic ready to discharge in the same breath with the customary forms of salutations he is hand and glove with it on it goes and off and he manages it like wart his caliber hear him but reason and divinity and all admiring with an inward wish you would desire that he were made a prelate let him but talk of any state affair you'd say it had been all in all his study turn him to any cause of policy the gordian knot of it he will unloose familiar as his garter when he speaks the air a chartered libertine stands still but ere you have time to answer him he is off like a shot to repeat the same rounded fluent observations to others a perfect master of the sentences a walking polemic wound up for the day a smartly bound political pocket-book set the same person to write a common paragraph and he cannot get through it for very weariness ask him a question ever so little out of the common road and he stares you in the face what does all this bustle animation plausibility and command of words amount to a lively flow of animal spirits a good deal of confidence a communicative turn and a tolerably tenacious memory with respect to floating opinions and current phrases beyond the routine of the daily newspapers and coffee-house criticism such persons do not venture to think at all or if they did it would be so much the worse for them for they would only be perplexed in the attempt and would perform their part in the mechanism of society with so much the less alacrity and easy volubility the most dashing orator i ever heard is the flattest writer i ever read in speaking he was like a volcano vomiting out lava in writing he is like a volcano burnt out nothing but the dry cinders the hard shell remains the tongues of flame with which in haranguing a mixed assembly he used to illuminate his subject and almost scorched up the panting air do not appear painted on the margin of his works he was the model of a flashy powerful demagogue a madman blessed with a fit audience he was possessed infuriated with the patriotic mania he seemed to rend and tear the rotten carcass of corruption with the remorseless indecent rage of a wild beast he mourned over the bleeding body of his country like another antony over the dead body of caesar as if he would move the very stones of rome to rise in mutiny he pointed to the persian abodes the glittering temples of oppression and luxury with prophetic exultation and like another helen had almost fired another troy the lightning of national indignation flashed from his eye the workings of the popular mind were seen laboring in his bosom it writhed and swelled with its rank fraught of aspic's tongues and the poison frothed over at his lips thus qualified he wielded at will the fierce democracy and fulmined over an area of souls of no mean circumference he who might be said to have roared you in the ears of the groundlings and to where any lion aggravates his voice on paper like any sucking dove it is not merely that the same individual cannot sit down quietly in his closet and produce the same or a correspondent effect that what he delivers over to the compositor is tame and trite and tedious that he cannot by any means as it were create a soul under the ribs of death but sit down yourself and read one of these very popular and electrical effusions for they have been published and you would not believe it to be the same the thunder and lightning mixture of the orator turns out a mere drab coloured suit in the person of the prose writer we wonder at the change and think there must be some mistake some legerdemain trick played off upon us by which what before appeared so fine now appears to be so worthless 
the deception took place before now it is removed bottom thou art translated might be placed as a motto under most collections of printed speeches that i have had the good fortune to meet with whether originally addressed to the people the senate or the bar burks and wyndham's form an exception mr coleridge's conscience ad populum do not any more than mr thelwall's tribune what we read is the same what we hear and see is different the self-same words but not the self-same tune the orator's vehemence of gesture the loudness of the voice the speaking eye the conscious attitude the inexplicable dumb show and noise all those brave sublunary things that made his raptures clear are no longer there and without these he is nothing his fire and air turn to puddle and ditch water and the god of eloquence and of our idolatry sinks into a common mortal or an image of lead with a few labels nicknames and party watchwords stuck in his mouth the truth is that these always made up the stock of his intellectual wealth but a certain exaggeration and extravagance of manner covered the nakedness and swelled out the emptiness of the matter the sympathy of angry multitudes with an impassioned theatrical declaimer supplied the place of argument or wit while the physical animation and ardor of the speaker evaporated in sound and fury signifying nothing and leaving no trace behind it a popular speaker such as i have been here describing is like a vulgar actor off the stage take away his cue and he has nothing to say for himself or he is so accustomed to the intoxication of popular applause that without that stimulus he has no motive or power of exertion left neither imagination understanding liveliness common sense words or ideas he is fairly cleared out and in the intervals of sober reason is the dullest and most imbecile of all mortals an orator can hardly get beyond commonplaces if he does he gets beyond his hearers the most successful speakers even in the house of commons have not been the best scholars or the finest writers neither those who took the most profound views of their subject nor who adorned it with the most original fancy or the richest combinations of language those speeches that in general told the best at the time are not now readable what were the materials of which they were chiefly composed an imposing detail of passing events a formal display of official documents an appeal to established maxims an echo of popular clamor some worn-out metaphor newly vamped up some hackneyed argument used for the hundredth nay thousandth time to fall in with the interests the passions or prejudices of listening and devoted admirers some truth or falsehood repeated as the shibboleth of party time out of mind which gathers strength from sympathy as it spreads because it is understood or assented to by the million and finds in the increased action of the minds of numbers the weight and force of an instinct a commonplace does not leave the mind sceptical puzzled and undecided in the moment of action it gives a body to opinion and a permanence to fugitive belief it operates mechanically and opens an instantaneous and infallible communication between the hearer and speaker a set of cant phrases arranged in sounding sentences and pronounced with good emphasis and discretion keep the gross and irritable humours of an audience in constant fermentation and levy no tax on the understanding to give a reason for anything is to breed a doubt of it which doubt you may not remove in the sequel either because your reason may not be a good one or because the person to whom it is addressed may not be able to comprehend it or because others may not be able to comprehend it he who offers to go into the grounds of an acknowledged axiom risks the unanimity of the company by most admired disorder as he who digs to the foundation of a building to show its solidity risks its falling but a commonplace is enshrined in its own unquestioned evidence and constitutes its own immortal basis nature it has been said abhors a vacuum and the house of commons it might be said hates everything but a commonplace mr burke did not often shock the prejudices of the house he endeavoured to account for them to lay the flattering unction of philosophy to their souls they could not endure him yet he did not attempt this by dry argument alone he called to his aid the flowers of poetical fiction and strewed the most dazzling colours of language over the standing orders of the house it was a double offence to them an aggravation of the encroachments of his genius 
they would rather hear a cat mew or an axle tree grate than hear a man talk philosophy by the hour not harsh and crabbed as dull fools suppose but musical as apollo's lute and a perpetual feast of nectared sweets where no crude surfeit reigns he was emphatically called the dinner bell they went out by shoals when he began to speak they coughed and shuffled him down while he was uttering some of the finest observations to speak in compass that ever were delivered in that house they walked out not as the beasts came out of the ark by twos and by threes but in droves and companies of tens of dozens and scores oh it is the heaviest stone which melancholy can throw at a man when you are in the middle of a delicate speculation to see a robustious periwig painted fellow deliberately take up his hat and walk out but what effect could burke's finest observations be expected to have on the house of commons in their corporate capacity on the supposition that they were original refined comprehensive his auditors had never heard and assuredly they had never thought of them before how then should they know that they were good or bad till they had time to consider better of it or till they were told what to think in the meantime their effect would be to stop the question they were blanks in the debate they could at best only be laid aside and left ad referendum what does it signify if four or five persons at the utmost felt their full force and fascinating power the instant they were delivered they would be utterly unintelligible to nine-tenths of the persons present and their impression upon any particular individual more knowing than the rest would be involuntarily paralyzed by the torpedo touch of the elbow of a country gentleman or city orator there is a reaction in insensibility as well as in enthusiasm and men in society judge not by their own convictions but by sympathy with others in reading we may go over the page again whenever anything new or questionable gives us pause besides we are by ourselves and it is a word to the wise we are not afraid of understanding too much and being called upon to unriddle in hearing we are saving the mark in the company of fools and time presses was the debate to be suspended while mr fox or mr wyndham took this or that honourable member aside to explain to them that fine observation of mr burke's and to watch over the new birth of their understandings the dawn of this new light if we were to wait till noble lords and honourable gentlemen were inspired with a relish for abstruse thinking and a taste for the loftier flights of fancy the business of this great nation would shortly be at a stand no it is too much to ask that our good things should be duly appreciated by the first person we meet or in the next minute after their disclosure if the world are a little a very little the wiser or better for them a century hence it is full as much as can be modestly expected the impression of anything delivered in a large assembly must be comparatively null and void unless you not only understand and feel its value yourself but are conscious that it is felt and understood by the meanest capacity present till that is the case the speaker is in your power not you in his the eloquence that is effectual and irresistible must stir the inert mass of prejudice and pierce the opaquest shadows of ignorance corporate bodies move slow in the progress of intellect for this reason that they must keep back like convoys for the heaviest sailing vessels under their charge the sinews of the wisest counsels are after all impudence and interest the most enlightened bodies are often but slaves of the weakest intellects they reckon among them and the best intentioned are but tools of the greatest hypocrites and knaves to conclude what i had to say on the character of mr burke's parliamentary style i will just give an instance of what i mean in affirming that it was too recondite for his hearers and it shall be even in so obvious a thing as a quotation speaking of the new-fangled french constitution and in particular of the king louis the sixteenth as the chief power in form and appearance only he repeated the famous lines in milton describing death and concluded with peculiar emphasis what seemed its head the likeness of a kingly crown had on person who heard him make the speech said that if ever a poet's language had been finely applied by an orator to express his thoughts and make out his purpose it was in this instance the passage i believe is not in his reported speeches and i should think in all likelihood it fell stillborn from his lips 
while one of mr canning's well-thumbed quotations out of virgil would electrify the treasury benches and be echoed by all the politicians of his own standing and the tyros of his own school from lord liverpool in the upper down to mr william ward in the lower house mr burke was an author before he was a member of parliament he ascended to that practical eminence from the platform of his literary pursuits he walked out of his study into the house but he never became a thoroughbred debater he was not native to that element nor was he ever subdued to the quality of that motley crew of knights citizens and burgesses the late lord chatham was made for and by it he seemed to vault into his seat there like hotspur with the exclamation in his mouth that roan shall be my throne or he sprang out of the genius of the house of commons like pallas from the head of jupiter completely armed he assumed an ascendancy there from the very port and stature of his mind from his aspiring and fiery temperament he vanquished because he could not yield he controlled the purposes of others because he was strong in his own obdurate self-will he convinced his followers by never doubting himself he did not argue but assert he took what he chose for granted instead of making a question of it he was not a dealer in moot points he seized on some stronghold in the argument and held it fast with a convulsive grasp or wrested the weapons out of his adversary's hands by main force he entered the lists like a gladiator he made political controversy a combat of personal skill and courage he was not for wasting time in long-winded discussions with his opponents but tried to disarm them by a word by a glance of his eye so that they should not dare to contradict or confront him again he did not wheedle or palliate or circumvent or make a studied appeal to the reason or the passions he dictated his opinions to the house of commons he spoke as one having authority and not as the scribes but if he did not produce such an effect either by reason or imagination how did he produce it the principle by which he exerted his influence over others and it is a principle of which some speakers that i might mention seem not to have an idea even in possibility was sympathy he himself evidently had a strong possession of his subject a thorough conviction and intense interest and this communicated itself from his manner from the tones of his voice from his commanding attitudes and eager gestures instinctively and unavoidably to his hearers his will was surcharged with electrical matter like a voltaic battery and all who stood within its reach felt the full force of the shock zeal will do more than knowledge to say the truth there is little knowledge no ingenuity no parade of individual details not much attempt at general argument neither wit nor fancy in his speeches but there are a few plain truths told home whatever he says he does not mince the matter but clenches it in the most unequivocal manner and with the fullest sense of its importance in clear short pithy old english sentences the most obvious things as he puts them read like axioms so that he appears as it were the genius of common sense personified and in turning to his speeches you fancy that you have met with at least one honest statesman lord chatham commenced his career in the intrigues of a camp and the bustle of a mess-room where he probably learnt that the way to govern others is to make your will your warrant and your word a law if he had spent the early part of his life like mr burke in writing a treatise on the sublime and beautiful and in dreaming over the abstract nature and causes of things he would never have taken the lead he did in the british senate End of section thirty one Section thirty two of the Plain Speaker. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Chieco. The Plain Speaker Opinions on Books, Men, and Things by William Hazlitt. Section thirty two On the Difference Between Writing and Speaking. Part two. Both Mr. Fox and Mr. Pitt, though as opposite to each other as possible, were essentially speakers, not authors, in their mode of oratory beyond the moment beyond the occasion beyond the immediate power shown astonishing as that was there was little remarkable or worth preserving in their speeches there is no thought in them that implies a habit of deep and refined reflection more than we are accustomed ordinarily to find in people of education there is no knowledge that does not lie within the reach of obvious and mechanical search 
and as to the powers of language the chief miracle is that a source of words so apt forcible and well arranged so copious and unfailing should have been found constantly open to express their ideas without any previous preparation considered as written style they are not far out of the common course of things and perhaps it is assuming too much and making the wonder greater than it is with a very natural love of indulging our admiration of extraordinary persons when we conceive that parliamentary speeches are in general delivered without any previous preparation they do not it is true allow of preparation at the moment but they have the preparation of the preceding night and of the night before that and of nights weeks months and years of the same endless drudgery and routine in going over the same subjects argued with some paltry difference on the same grounds practice makes perfect he who has got a speech by heart on any particular occasion cannot be much gravelled for lack of matter on any similar occasion in future not only are the topics the same the very same phrases whole batches of them are served up as the order of the day the parliamentary bead-roll of grave impertinence is twanged off in full cadence by the honourable member or his learned and honourable friend and the well-known voluminous calculable periods roll over the drowsy ears of the auditors almost before they are delivered from the vapid tongue that utters them it may appear at first sight that here are a number of persons got together picked out from the whole nation who can speak at all times upon all subjects in the most exemplary manner but the fact is they only repeat the same things over and over on the same subjects and they obtain credit for general capacity and ready wit like chaucer's monk who by having three words of latin always in his mouth passed for a great scholar a few terms could he two or three that he had learned out of some decree no wonder is he heard it all the day try them on any other subject out of doors and see how soon the extempore wit and wisdom will halt for it see how few of those who have distinguished themselves in the house of commons have done anything out of it how few that have shine there read over the collections of old debates twenty forty eighty a hundred years ago they are the same mutatis mutandis as those of yesterday you wonder to see how little has been added you grieve that so little has been lost even in their own favourite topics how much are they to see they still talk gravely of the sinking fund in st stephen's chapel which has been for some time exploded as a juggle by mr place of charing cross and a few of the principles of adam smith which every one else had been acquainted with long since are just now beginning to dawn on the collective understanding of the two houses of parliament instead of an exuberance of sumptuous matter you have the same meagre standing dishes for every day in the year you must serve an apprenticeship to a want of originality to a suspension of thought and feeling you are in a go-cart of prejudices in a regularly constructed machine of pretexts and precedents you are not only to wear the livery of other men's thoughts but there is a house of commons jargon which must be used for everything a man of simplicity and independence of mind cannot easily reconcile himself to all this formality and mummery yet woe to him that shall attempt to discard it you can no more move against the stream of custom than you can make head against a crowd of people the mob of lords and gentlemen will not let you speak or think but as they do you are hemmed in stifled pinioned pressed to death and if you make one false step are trampled under the hooves of a swinish multitude talk of mobs is there any body of people that has this character in a more consummate degree than the house of commons is there any set of men that determines more by acclamation and less by deliberation and individual conviction that is moved more en masse in its aggregate capacity as brute force and physical number that judges with more midas ears blind and sordid without discrimination of right and wrong the greatest test of courage i can conceive is to speak truth in the house of commons i have heard sir francis burdett say things there which i could not enough admire and which he could not have ventured upon saying if besides his honesty he had not been a man of fortune of family of character ay and a very good-looking man into the bargain dr johnson had a wish to try his hand in the house of commons an elephant might as well have been introduced there in all the forms sir william curtis makes a better figure either he or the speaker onslow must have resigned the orbit of his intellect was not the one in which the intellect of the house moved by ancient privilege 
his commonplaces were not their commonplaces even horne took failed with all his tact his self-possession his ready talent and his long practice at the hustings he had weapons of his own with which he wished to make play and did not lay his hand upon the established levers for wielding the house of commons a succession of dry sharp-pointed sayings which come in excellently well in the pauses or quick turns of conversation do not make a speech a series of drops is not a stream besides he had been in the practice of rallying his guests and tampering with his subject and this ironical tone did not suit his new situation he had been used to give his own little senate laws and when he found the resistance of the great one more than he could manage he shrank back from the attempt disheartened and powerless it is nothing that a man can talk the better the worse it is for him unless he can talk in trammels he must be drilled into the regiment he must not run out of the course the worst thing a man can do is to set up for a wit there or rather i should say for a humorist to say odd out of the way things to ape a character to play the clown or the wag in the house this is the very forlorn hope of a parliamentary ambition they may tolerate it till they know what you are at but no longer it may succeed once or twice but the third time you will be sure to break your neck they know nothing of you or your whims nor have they time to look at a puppet show they look only at the stop-watch my lord we have seen a very lively sally of this sort which failed lately the house of commons is the last place where a man will draw admiration by making a jest of his own character but if he has a mind to make a jest of humanity of liberty and of common sense and decency he will succeed well enough the only person who ever hit the house between wind and water in this way who made sport for the members and kept his own dignity in our time at least was mr wyndham he carried on the traffic in parliamentary conundrums and enigmas with great eclat for more than one season he mixed up a vein of characteristic eccentricity with a succession of far-fetched and curious speculations very pleasantly extremes meet and mr wyndham overcame the obstinate attachment of his hearers to fixed opinions by the force of paradoxes he startled his bed-rid audience effectually a paradox was a treat to them on the score of novelty at least the sight of one according to the scotch proverb was good for sore eyes so mr wyndham humoured them in the thing for once he took all sorts of commonly received doctrines and notions with an understood reserve reversed them and set up a fanciful theory of his own instead the changes were like those in a pantomime ask the first old woman you meet her opinion on any subject and you could get at the statesman's for his would be just the contrary he would be wiser than the old woman at any rate if a thing had been thought cruel he would prove that it was humane if barbarous manly if wise foolish if sense nonsense his creed was the antithesis of common sense loyalty accepted economy he could turn into ridicule as a saving of cheese parings and candle ends and total failure was with him negative success he had no occasion in thus setting up for original thinking to inquire into the truth or falsehood of any proposition but to ascertain whether it was currently believed in and then to contradict it point blank he made the vulgar prejudices of others servile ministers to his own solecism it was not easy always to say whether he was in jest or earnest but he contrived to hitch his extravagances into the midst of some grave debate the house had their laugh for nothing the question got into shape again and mr wyndham was allowed to have been more brilliant than ever mr wyndham was i have heard a silent man in company indeed his whole style was an artificial and studied imitation or capricious caricature of burke's bold natural discursive manner this did not imply much spontaneous power or fertility of invention he was an intellectual posture master rather than a man of real elasticity and vigour of mind mr pitt was also i believe somewhat taciturn and reserved there was nothing clearly in the subject matter of his speeches to connect with the ordinary topics of discourse or with any given aspect of human life one would expect him to be quite as much in the clouds as the automaton chess player or the last new opera singer mr fox said little in private and complained that in writing he had no style so to compare great things with small jack davies the unrivalled racket player never said anything at all in company and was what is understood by a modest man 
when the racket was out of his hand his occupation his delight his glory that which he excelled all mankind in was gone so when mr fox had no longer to keep up the ball of debate with the floor of st stephen's for a stage and the world for spectators of the game it is hardly to be wondered at that he felt a little at a loss without his usual train of subjects the same crowd of associations the same spirit of competition or stimulus to extraordinary exertion the excitement of leading in the house of commons which in addition to the immediate attention and applause that follows is a sort of whispering gallery to all europe must act upon the brain like brandy or laudanum upon the stomach and must in most cases produce the same debilitating effects afterwards a man's faculties must be quite exhausted his virtue gone out of him then any one accustomed all his life to the tributary roar of applause from the great council of the nation should think of dieting himself with the prospect of posthumous fame as an author is like offering a confirmed dram-drinker a glass of fair water for his morning's draught charles fox is not to be blamed for having written an indifferent history of james the second but for having written a history at all it was not his business to write a history his business was not to have made any more coalitions but he found writing so dull he thought it better to be a colleague of lord grenville he did not want style to say so is nonsense because the style of his speeches was just and fine he wanted a sounding-board in the ear of posterity to try his periods upon if he had gone to the house of commons in the morning and tried to make a speech fasting when there was nobody to hear him he might have been equally disconcerted at his want of style the habit of speaking is the habit of being heard and of wanting to be heard the habit of writing is the habit of thinking aloud but without the help of an echo the orator sees his subject in the eager looks of his auditors and feels doubly conscious doubly impressed with it in the glow of their sympathy the author can only look for encouragement in a blank piece of paper the orator feels the impulse of popular enthusiasm like proud seas under him the only pegasus the writer has to boast is the hobby-horse of his own thoughts and fancies how is he to get on them from the lash of necessity we accordingly see persons of rank and fortune continually volunteer into the service of oratory and the state but we have few authors who are not paid by the sheet i myself have heard charles fox engaged in familiar conversation it was in the louvre he was describing the pictures to two persons that were with him he spoke rapidly but very unaffectedly i remember his saying all those blues and greens and reds are the guercinos you may know them by the colors he set opie right as to domenichinos st jerome you will find he said though you may not be struck with it at first that there is a great deal of truth and good sense in that picture there was a person at one time a good deal with mr fox who when the opinion of the latter was asked on any subject very frequently interposed to give the answer this sort of tantalizing interruption was ingeniously enough compared by some one to walking up ludgate hill and having the spire of st martin's constantly getting in your way when you wish to see the dome of st paul's burke it is said conversed as he spoke in public and as he wrote he was communicative diffuse magnificent what is the use said mr fox to a friend of sheridan's trying to swell himself out in this manner like the frog in the fable alluding to his speech on warren hastings trial it is very well for burke to express himself in that figurative way it is natural to him he talks so to his wife to his servants to his children but as for sheridan he either never opens his mouth at all or if he does it is to utter some joke it is out of the question for him to affect these orientalisms burke once came into st joshua reynolds painting-room when one of his pupils was sitting for one of the sons of count ugolino this gentleman was personally introduced to him ah then said burke i find that mr northcote has not only a head that would do for titian to paint but is himself a painter at another time he came in when goldsmith was there and poured forth such a torrent of violent personal abuse against the king that they got into high words and goldsmith threatened to leave the room if he did not desist goldsmith bore testimony to his powers of conversation speaking of johnson he said does he wind into a subject like a serpent as burke does with respect to his facility in composition there are contradictory accounts 
it has been stated by some that he wrote out a plain sketch first like a sort of dead colouring and added the ornaments and tropes afterwards i have been assured by a person who had the best means of knowing that the letter to a noble lord the most rapid impetuous glancing and sportive of all his works was printed off and the proof sent to him and that it was returned to the printing office with so many alterations and passages interlined that the compositors refused to correct it as it was took the whole matter in pieces and reset the copy this looks like elaboration and afterthought it was also one of burke's latest compositions a regularly bred speaker would have made up his mind beforehand but burke's mind being as originally constituted and by its first bias that of an author never became set it was in further search and progress it had an internal spring left it was not tied down to the printer's form it could not still project itself into new beauties and explore strange regions from the unwearied impulse of its own delight or curiosity perhaps among the passages interlined in this case were the description of the duke of bedford as the leviathan among all the creatures of the crown the catalogue raisonne of the abbe c s i pigeonholes or the comparison of the english monarchy to the proud keep of windsor with its double belt of kindred and coeval towers were these to be given up if he had had to make his defence of his pension in the house of lords they would not have been ready in time it appears and besides would have been too difficult of execution on the spot a speaker must not set his heart on such forbidden fruit but mr burke was an author and the press did not shut the gates of genius on mankind a set of oratorical flourishes indeed is soon exhausted and is generally all that the extempore speaker can safely aspire to not so with the resources of art or nature which are inexhaustible and which the writer has time to seek out to embody and to fit into shape and use if he has the strength the courage and patience to do so there is then a certain range of thought and expression beyond the regular rhetorical routine on which the author to vindicate his title must trench somewhat freely the proof that this is understood to be so is that what is called an oratorical style is exploded from all good writing that we immediately lay down an article even in a common newspaper in which such phrases occur as the angel of reform the drooping genius of albion and that a very brilliant speech at a loyal dinner party makes a very flimsy insipid pamphlet the orator has to get up for a certain occasion a striking compilation of partial topics which to leave no rubs or botches in the work must be pretty familiar as well as palatable to his hearers and in doing this he may avail himself of all the resources of an artificial memory the writer must be original or he is nothing he is not to take up with ready-made goods for he has time allowed him to create his own materials and to make novel combinations of thought and fancy to contend with unforeseen difficulties of style and execution while we look on and admire the growing work in secret and at leisure there is a degree of finishing as well as of solid strength in writing which is not to be got at every day and we can wait for perfection the author owes a debt to truth and nature which he cannot satisfy at sight but he has pawned his head on redeeming it it is not a string of clap traps to answer a temporary or party purpose violent vulgar and illiberal but general and lasting truth that we require at his hands we go to him as pupils not as partisans we have a right to expect from him profounder views of things finer observations more ingenious illustrations happier and bolder expressions he is to give the choice and picked results of a whole life of study what he has struck out in his most felicitous moods has treasured up with most pride has laboured to bring to light with most anxiety and confidence of success he may turn a period in his head fifty different ways so that it comes out smooth and round at last he may have caught a glimpse of a simile and it may have vanished again let him be on the watch for it as the idle boy watches for the lurking place of the adder we can wait he is not satisfied with a reason he has offered for something let him wait till he finds a better reason there is some word some phrase some idiom that expresses a particular idea better than any other but he cannot for the life of him recollect it let him wait till he does is it strange that among twenty thousand words in the english language the one of all others that he most needs should have escaped him 
there are more things in nature than there are words in the english language and he must not expect to lay rash hands on them all at once learn to write slow all other graces will follow in their proper places you allow a writer a year to think of a subject he should not put you off with a truism at last you allow him a year more to find out words for his thoughts he should not give us an echo of all the fine things that have been said a hundred times all authors however are not so squeamish but take up with words and ideas as they find them delivered down to them happy are they who write latin verses who copy the style of dr johnson who hold up the phrase of ancient pistol they do not trouble themselves with those hair-breadth distinctions of thought or meaning that puzzle nicer heads let us leave them to their repose a person in habits of composition often hesitates in conversation for a particular word it is because he is in search of the best word and that he cannot hit upon in writing he would stop till it came it is not true however that the scholar could avail himself of a more ordinary word if he chose or readily acquire a command of ordinary language for his associations are habitually intense not vague and shallow and words occur to him only as tallies to certain modifications of feeling they are links in the chain of thought his imagination is fastidious and rejects all those that are of no mark or likelihood certain words are in his mind indissolubly wedded to certain things and none are admitted at the levee of his thoughts but those of which the bands have been solemnized with scrupulous propriety again the student finds a stimulus to literary exertion not in the immediate eclat of his undertaking but in the difficulty of his subject and the progressive nature of his task he is not wound up to a sudden and extraordinary effort of presence of mind but is for ever awake to the silent influxes of things and his life is one long labour are there no sweeteners of his toil no reflections in the absence of popular applause or social indulgence to cheer him on his way let the reader judge his pleasure is the counterpart of and borrowed from the same source as the writer's a man does not read out of vanity nor in company but to amuse his own thoughts if the reader from disinterested and merely intellectual motives relishes an author's fancies and good nights the last may be supposed to have relished them no less if he laughs at a joke the inventor chuckled over it to the full as much if he is delighted with a phrase he may be sure the writer jumped at it if he is pleased to cull a straggling flower from the page he may believe that it was plucked with no less fondness from the face of nature does he fasten with gathering brow and looks intent on some difficult speculation he may be convinced that the writer thought it a fine thing to split his brain in solving so curious a problem and to publish his discovery to the world there is some satisfaction in the contemplation of power there is also a little pride in the conscious possession of it with what pleasure do we read books if authors could but feel this or remember what they themselves once felt they would need no other temptation to persevere to conclude this account with what perhaps i ought to have set out with a definition of the character of an author there are persons who in society in public intercourse feel no excitement dull as the lake that slumbers in the storm but who when left alone can lash themselves into a foam they are never less alone than when alone mount them on a dinner-table and they have nothing to say shut them up in a room by themselves and they are inspired they are made fierce with dark keeping in revenge for being tongue-tied a torrent of words flows from their pens and the storm which was so long collecting comes down apace it never rains but it pours is not this strange unaccountable not at all so they have a real interest a real knowledge of the subject and they cannot summon up all that interest or bring all that knowledge to bear while they have anything else to attend to till they can do justice to the feeling they have they can do nothing for this they look into their own minds not in the faces of a gaping multitude what they would say if they could does not lie at the orifices of the mouth ready for delivery but is wrapped in the folds of the heart and registered in the chambers of the brain in the sacred cause of truth that stirs them they would put their whole strength their whole being into requisition and as it implies a greater effort to drag their words and ideas from their lurking places so there is no end when they are once set in motion the whole of a man's thoughts and feelings cannot lie on the surface made up for use 
but the whole must be a greater quantity a mightier power if they could be got at layer under layer and brought into play by the levers of imagination and reflection such a person then sees further and feels deeper than most others he plucks up an argument by the roots he tears out the very heart of his subject he has more pride in conquering the difficulties of a question than vanity in courting the favor of an audience he wishes to satisfy himself before he pretends to enlighten the public he takes an interest in things in the abstract more than by common consent nature is his mistress truth his idol the contemplation of a pure idea is the ruling passion of his breast the intervention of other people's notions the being the immediate object of their censure or their praise puts him out what will tell what will produce an effect he cares little about and therefore he produces the greatest the personal is to him an impertinence so he conceals himself and writes solitude becomes his glittering bride and airy thoughts his children such a one is a true author and not a member of any debating club or dilettante society whatever footnote i have omitted to dwell on some other differences of body and mind that often prevent the same person from shining in both capacities of speaker and writer there are natural impediments to public speaking such as the want of a strong voice and steady nerves a high authority of the present day mr canning has thought this a matter of so much importance that he goes so far as even to let it affect the constitution of parliament and conceives that gentlemen who have not bold foreheads and brazen lungs but modest pretensions and patriotic views should be allowed to creep into the great assembly of the nation through the avenue of closed boroughs and not to be called upon to face the storms of the hustings in this point of view stenter was a man of genius and a noisy jack pudding may cut a considerable figure in the political house that jack built i fancy mr c wynn is the only person in the kingdom who has fully made up his mind that a total defect of voice is the most necessary qualification for a speaker of the house of commons End of section thirty two